Chapter 50 1. Even though Gentle had known the tribe of the South Bank only a few hours, parting from them wasn't easy. He'd felt more secure in their company for that short time than he'd felt with many men and women he'd known for years. They, for their part, were used to loss. It was the theme of almost every life story he'd heard, so there were no histrionics or accusations, just a heavy silence. Only Monday, whose victimization had first stirred the stranger from his passivity, made any attempt to have gentle linger. We've only got a few more walls to paint, he said, and we'll have covered them all. A few days? A week at the most. I wish I had that long, Gentle told him, but I can't postpone the work I came back to do. Monday had, of course, been asleep while Gentle talked with Tay, and had woken much confounded by the respect he got. But the others, especially Benedict, had new words to add to the vocabulary of miracles. So what does a reconciler do? he asked Gentle. If you are going off to the Dominions, man, we want to be coming with you. I'm not leaving Earth, but if and when I do, you'll be the first to know about it. What if we never see you again? Irish said. Then I'll have failed. And you're dead and gone? That's right. He won't fuck up, Carol said. Will you, love? But what do we do with what we know? Irish said, clearly troubled by this burden of mysteries. With you gone, it won't make sense to us. Yes, it will, Gentle said because you'll be telling other people, and that way the stories will stay alive until the door to the Dominions is open. So we shall tell people? Anyone who'll listen? There were murmurs of assent from the assembly. Here at least was a purpose, a connection with the tale they'd heard, and its teller. If you need us for anything, Benedict purred, you know where to find us. Indeed I do, Gentle said and went with Clem to the gate. And what if anybody comes looking for you? Carol called after them. Tell them I was a mad bastard and you kicked me over the bridge. This earned a few grins. That's what we'll say, maestro, Irish said. But I'm telling you, if you don't come back for us one of these days, we're going to come looking for you. The farewell's over. Clem and Gentle headed up onto Waterloo Bridge in search of a cab to take them across the city to Jude's place. It wasn't yet six, and though the flow of northbound traffic was beginning to thicken as the first commuters appeared, there were no taxis to be had, so they started across the bridge on foot in the hope of finding a cab on the strand. Of all the company to have found you in, Clem remarked as they went, that has to be the strangest. You came looking for me there, Gentle pointed out, so you must have had some inkling. I suppose I must. And believe me, I've kept stranger company. A lot stranger. I believe it. I'd like you to tell me about the whole journey one day soon. Will you do that? I'll do my best. But it'll be difficult without a map. I kept telling Pi I'd draw one so that if I ever passed through the Dominions again and got lost... You'd be found. Exactly. And did you make a map? No. There was never time, somehow. There always seemed to be something new to distract me. Tell me as much as, Whoa, I see a cab. Clem stepped out into the street and waved the vehicle down. They both got in and Clem supplied the driver with directions. As he was doing so, the man peered into his mirror. Is that someone you know? They looked back along the bridge to see Monday pelting towards them. Seconds later, the paint-smeared face was at the taxi window, and Monday was begging to join them. You've got to let me come with you, boss. It's not fair if you don't. I gave you my colours, didn't I? Where would you be without my colours? I can't risk you getting hurt, Gentle said. If I get hurt, it's my hurt, and it's my fault. Are we going or what? the driver wanted to know. Let me come, boss, please. Gentle shrugged, then nodded. The grin which had gone from Monday's face during his appeal returned in glory. 
and he clambered into the cab, rattling his tobacco tin of chalks like a juju as he did so. I brought the colours, he said, just in case we need them. You never know when we might have to draw a quick dominion or something, right? Though the journey to Judith's flat was relatively short, there were signs everywhere, mostly small, but so numerous their sum became significant, that the days of venomous heat and uncleansing storm were taking their toll on the city and its occupants. There were vociferous altercations at every other corner, and some in the middle of the street. There were scowls and furrows on every passing face. Tay said there was a void coming, Clem remarked as they waited at an intersection for two furious motorists to be stopped from making nooses of each other's neckties. Is this all part of it? It's bloody madness is what it is, the cabbie chimed in. There's been more murders in the last five days than in all of last year. I read that somewhere. And it's not just murders neither. It's people topping themselves. A mate of mine, a cabbie like, was up the arsenal on Tuesday and this woman just throws herself in front of his cab. Straight under the front wheels. Bloody tragic. The fighters had finally been refereed and were being escorted to opposite pavements. I don't know what the world's coming to, the cabbie said. It's bloody madness. His piece said he turned on the radio as the traffic began moving again and began whistling an out-of-tune accompaniment to the ballad that emerged. Is this something we can help stop? Clem asked, gentle. Or is it just going to get worse? I hope the reconciliation will put an end to it but I can't be certain. This dominion's been sealed up for so long. It's poisoned itself with its own shit. So, we just have to pull down the sodding walls, Monday said, with the glee of a born demolisher. He rattled his tin of colours again. You mark em, he said, and I'll knock em down. Easy. Two. The child, Jude had been told, had more purpose in it than most, and she believed it. But what did that mean beside the risk of its fury if she tried to unhouse it? Would it grow faster than others? Would she be big with it by dusk and her water ready to break before morning? She lay in the bedroom now, the day's heat already weighing on her limbs, and hoped the stories she'd heard from radiant mothers were true, that her body would pour palliatives into her bloodstream to ease the traumas of nurturing and expelling another life. When the doorbell rang, her first instinct was to ignore it, but her visitors, whoever they were, kept on ringing and eventually began to shout up at the window. One called for Judy, the other, more oddly, for Jude. She sat up, and for a moment it was as though her anatomy had shifted. Her heart thumped in her head, and her thoughts had to be dragged up out of her belly to form the intention to leave the room and go down to the door. The voices were still summoning her from below, but they petered out as she headed down the stairs, and she was ready to find the doorstep empty when she got there. Not so. There was an adolescent there, besmirched with colour, who, upon sight of her, turned and hollered to her other visitors who were across the street, peering up at her flat. She's here, he yelled. Boss, she's here. They started back across the road towards the step, and as they came, her heart, still beating in her head, took up a suicidal tempo. She reached out for some support, as the man at Clem's side met her eyes and smiled. This wasn't gentle. At least it wasn't the egg-thief gentle who'd left a couple of hours before, his face flawless. This one hadn't shaved for several days and had a brow of scabs. She backed away from the step, her hand failing to find the door, though she wanted to slam it. Keep away from me, she said. He stopped a yard or two from the threshold, seeing the panic on her face. The youth had turned to him, and the impostor signalled that he should retreat, which he did, leaving the line of vision between them clear. I know I look like shit, the scabby face said, but it's me, Jude. She took two steps back from the blaze in which he stood. How the light liked him. Not like the other, who'd been in shadow every time she'd set eyes on him her sinews fluttering from toes to fingertips, their motion escalating as though a fit was about to seize her. 
She reached for the banister and took hold of it to keep herself from falling over. It can't be, she said. This time the man made no reply. It was his accomplice in this deceit, Clem of all people, who said, Judy, we have to talk to you. Can I come in? Just you, she said. Not them, just you. Just me. He came to the door, approaching her slowly, palms out. What's happened here? he said. That's not gentle, she told him. Gentle's been with me for the last two days. And nights. That's... I don't know who. The impostor heard what she was telling Clem. She could see his face over the other man's shoulder, so shocked the words might have been blows. The more she tried to explain to Clem what had happened, the more she lost faith with what she was saying. This gentle, waiting outside, was the man she'd left on the studio step, standing bewildered in the sun as he was now. And if this was he, then the lover who'd come to her, the egg-licker and fertilizer, was some other. Some terrible other. She saw Gentle make the man's name with his lips. Sartori. Hearing the name and knowing it was true, knowing that the butcher of his Isordorex had found a place in her bed, heart and womb, the convulsions threatened to overtake her completely. But she clung to the solid, sweaty world as best she could, determined that these men, his enemies, should know what he'd done. Come in, she said to Gentle. Come in and close the door. He brought the boy with him, but she didn't have the will to waste on objecting. He also brought a question. Did he harm you? No, she said. She almost wished he had, wished he'd given her a glimpse of his atrocious self. You told me he was changed, gentle, she said. You said he was a monster. He was corrupted, you said. But he was exactly like you. She let her rage simmer in her as she spoke, working its alchemy on the abhorrent she felt and turning it into purer, wiser stuff. Gentle had misled her with his descriptions of his other, creating in her mind's eye a man so tainted by his deeds he was barely human. There'd been no malice in his deception, only the desire to be utterly divided from the man who shared his face. But now he knew his error and was plainly ashamed. He hung back, watching her while the tremors in her body slowed. There was steel in her sinew and it held her up lent her the strength to finish the account. There was no sense in keeping the last part of Sartori's deceit from either Gentle or Clem. It would be apparent soon enough. She laid her hand on her belly. I'm pregnant, she said. His child. Sartori's child. In a more rational world, she might have been able to interpret the expression on Gentle's face as he received the news but its complexity defied her. There was anger in the maze, certainly, and bafflement too. But was there also a little jealousy? He hadn't wanted her company when they'd returned from the Dominions. His mission as reconciler had scourged his libido. But now that she'd been touched by his other, pleasured by him, did he see that guilt somewhere on her face as ineptly buried as his jealousy? He was feeling pangs of possessiveness. As ever with their story, there was no sentiment untainted by paradox. It was Clem, dear comforting Clem, who opened his arms now and said, Any chance of a hug? Oh, God, yes, she said. Every chance. He crossed to her and wrapped his embrace around her. They rocked together. I should have known, Clem, she said, too quietly for gentle or the boy to hear. Hindsight's easy, he said, kissing her hair. I'm just glad you're alive. He never threatened me. He never laid a finger on me that I didn't... Ask for? I didn't need to ask, she said. He knew. The sound of the front door reopening made her raise her head from Clem's shoulder. Gentle was stepping out into the sun again, with the youth following. Once outside, he looked up, cupping his hand over his brow to study the sky at his zenith. 
Seeing him do so, Jude realised who the sky watcher she'd glimpsed in the Boston Bowl had been. It was a small solving, but she wasn't about to spurn the satisfaction it provided. Sartorius Gentle's brother, is that right? Clem said. I'm afraid I'm still hazy on the family relations. They're not brothers, they're twins, she replied. Sartori is his perfect double. How perfect? Clem asked, looking at her with a small, almost mischievous smile on his face. Oh, very perfect. So it wasn't so bad, his being here. She shook her head. It wasn't bad at all, she replied. Then, after a moment, he told me he loved me, Clem. Oh, Lord. And I believed him. How many dozens of men have told you that? Yes, but he was different. Famous last words. She looked at the sun watcher for a few seconds, puzzled by the calm that had come over her. Was the mere memory of his commitment to her enough to assuage every dread? What are you thinking? Clem asked her. That he feels something gentle never did, she replied. Maybe never could. Before you say it, I know the whole thing's repulsive. He's a destroyer. He's wiped out whole countries. How can I be feeling anything for him? You want the clichés? Tell me. You feel what you feel. Some people go for sailors, some people go for men in rubber suits and feather boas. We do what we do. Never explain, never apologize. There. That's all you're getting. Her hands went to his face. She cupped it, then kissed it. You are sublime, she said. We're going to survive, aren't we? Survive and prosper, he said. But I think we'd better find you a bow for everybody's. He stopped as her grip on him tightened. All trace of joy had gone from her face. What's wrong? Celestine. I sent him up to Highgate. To Roxburgh's Tower. I'm sorry, I'm not following this. It's bad news, she said, leaving his embrace and hurrying to the front door. Gentle relinquished his zenith watching at her summons and returned to the step as she repeated what she'd just told Clem. What's up in Highgate? he said. A woman who wanted to see you. Does the name Nisi Nirvana mean anything to you? Gentle puzzled over this for a moment. It's something from a story, he said. No, Gentle. She's real. She's alive. At least she was. 3. It hadn't been sentiment alone that had moved the autark Sartori to have the streets of London depicted in such loving detail on the walls of his palace. Though he'd spent only a little time in this city, no more than weeks between his birth and his departure for the reconciled dominions, Mother London and Father Thames had educated him right royally. Of course, the metropolis visible from the summit of Highgate Hill, where he stood now, was vaster and grimmer than the city he'd wandered then. But there were enough signs remaining to stir some poignant and pungent memories. He'd learned sex in these streets from the professionals around Drury Lane. He'd learned murder at the riverside, watching the bodies washed up in the mud on a Sunday morning after the slaughters of Saturday night. He'd learned law at Lincoln's Inn Field and seen justice done at Tyburn. All fine lessons that had helped to make him the man he was. The only lesson he couldn't remember learning, whether in these streets or any other, was how to be an architect. He must have had a tutor in that, he presumed, at some time. After all, wasn't he the man whose vision had built a palace that would stand in legend, even though its towers were now rubble? Where, in the furnace of his genes or in his history, was the kindling spark of that genius? Perhaps he'd only discover the answer in the raising of his new Azorderex. If he was patient and watchful, the face of his mentor would sooner or later appear in its walls. There would have to be a great demolishing, however, before the foundations were laid, and banalities like the Tabula Rasa's tower, which he now came in sight of, would be the first to be condemned. 
He crossed the forecourt to the front door, whistling as he went, and wondering if the woman Judith had been so insistent he meet, this Celestine could hear his trill. The door stood open, but he doubted any thief, however opportunist, had dared enter. The air around the threshold fairly pricked with power, putting him in mind of his beloved pivot tower. Still whistling, he crossed the foyer to a second door and stepped through it into a room he knew. He'd walked these ancient boards twice in his life. The first time, the day before the reconciliation, when he'd presented himself to Roxborough here, passing himself off as the maestro Sartori for the perverse pleasure of shaking the hands of the reconciler's patrons, before the sabotage he'd planned took them to hell. The second time, the night after the reconciliation, with storms tearing up the skies from Hadrian's War to Land's End. On this occasion, he'd come with Chant, his new familiar, intending to kill Lucius Cobbett, the boy he'd made his unwitting agent in the sabotage. Having searched for him in Gamut Street and found him gone, he'd braved the storm. There were forests uprooted and lifted in the air, and a man struck by lightning burning on Highgate Hill, only to discover that Roxburgh's house was empty. He'd never found Cobbett. Driven from the safety of Gamut Street by his sometime maestro, the youth had probably fallen prey to the storm as so many others had that night. Now the room stood silent, and so did he. The lords who'd built this house, and their children who'd raised the tower above, were dead. It was a welcome hush. In it, there'd be time for dalliance. He wandered over to the mantelpiece and headed down the stairs, descending into a library he'd never known existed until this moment. He might have been tempted to linger, perusing the laden shelves, but the pricking power he'd felt at the front door was stronger than ever and drew him on, more intrigued with every yard. He heard the woman's voice before he set eyes on her, emanating from a place where the restless dust was so thick it was like walking in a delta fog. Barely visible through it, a scene of sheer vandalism. Books, scrolls, and manuscripts reduced to shreds or buried in the wreckage of the shelves they'd been laid upon. And beyond the rubble, a hole in the brick, and from the hole, a call. Is that Sartori? Yes, he said. Come closer. Let me see you. He presented himself at the bottom of the heap of rubble. I thought she'd failed to find you, Celestine said, or else you'd refuse to come. How could I refuse a summons like this, he said softly. Do you think this is some kind of liaison, she replied, some secret tryst? Her voice was raw with the dust and bitter. He liked the sound of it. Women who had anger in them were always so much more interesting than their contented sisters. Come in, maestro, she said to him. Let me put you to rights. He clambered up over the stones and peered into the darkness. The cell was a wretched hole, as sordid as anything beneath his palace, but the woman who'd occupied it was no anchorite. Her flesh hadn't been chastened by incarceration, but looked lush for all the marks upon it. The tendrils that clung to her body extolled her fluency, moving over her thighs and breasts and belly like unctuous snakes. Some clung to her head and paid court at her honey lips. Others lay between her legs in bliss. He felt her tender gaze on him and luxuriated in it. Handsome, she said. He took her compliment as an invitation to approach. But as he did so, she made a murmur of distress, and he stopped in his tracks. "'What's this shadow in you?' she said. "'Nothing to be afraid of,' he told her. Some of the filaments parted, and longer tendrils, these not courtiers but part of her substance, uncurled from behind her, clinging to the rough wall and hauling her up. "'I've heard that before,' she said. When a man tells you there's nothing to be afraid of, he's lying. Even you, Sartori. 
I won't come any closer if it bothers you, he said. It wasn't respect for the woman's unease that moved him to compliance, but the sight of the ribbons that had lifted her. Quesua had sprouted such appendages, he recalled, after her intimacies with the women of the Bastion of the Banu. They were evidence of some facility in the other sex he had no real comprehension of, a remnant of crafts all but banished from the reconciled dominions by Hapeximendios. Perhaps they'd seen a new poisonous flowering in the fifth in the time since he'd left. Until he knew the scope of their authority, he'd be circumspect. I'd like to ask you a question, if I may, he said. Yes. How do you know who I am? First, tell me where you've been all these years. Oh, the temptation he felt to tell her the truth, then, and parade his achievements in the hope of impressing her but he'd come here in the guise of his other, and, as with Judith, he'd have to choose the moment of his unmasking carefully. I've been wondering, he said. It wasn't so untrue. Where? In the Second Dominion, and occasionally the Third. Were you ever in his order, X? Sometimes. And in the desert, outside the city? There, too. Why do you ask? I was there once. Before you were born. I'm older than I look, he told her. I know it doesn't show. I know how long you've lived, Sartori, she replied. To the very day. Her certainty nourished the discomfort bred by the sight of the tendrils. Could she read his thoughts, this woman? If so, if she knew what he was and all he'd done, why wasn't she in awe of him? There was no profit in pretending that he didn't care that she seemed to know so much. Plainly but politely he asked her how, preparing as he spoke a profusion of excuses if she was simply one of the maestro's casual conquests and accused him of forgetting her. But the accusation when it came was of another kind entirely. You've done great harm in your life, haven't you? she said to him. No more than most, he protested mildly. I've been tempted to a few excesses, certainly. But then hasn't everybody? A few excesses, she said. I think you've done more than that. There's evil in you, Sartori. I smell it in your sweat, the way I smelled coitus in the woman. Her mention of Judith, who else could this venereal woman be, reminded him of the prophecy he'd made to her two nights before. They would find darkness in each other, he'd said, and that was a perfectly human condition. The argument had proved potent then. Why not now? It's just the humanity in me you can sense, he said to Celestine. She was clearly unpersuaded. Oh, no, she replied. I'm the humanity in you. He was about to laugh this absurdity off, but her stare hushed him. What part of me are you? he murmured. Don't you know yet? she said. Child, I'm your mother. Gentle led the way as they stepped into the cool of the tower's foyer. There was no sound from anywhere in the building, above or below. Where's Celestine? he asked Jude. She led him to the door into the tabula rasa's meeting room, where he told them all, this is something for me to do, brother to brother. I'm not afraid, Monday piped up. No, but I am, Gentle said with a smile. And I wouldn't want you to see me piss my pants. Stay up here. I'll be out double quick. Make sure you are, Clem said, or we're coming down to get you. With that promise as comfort, Gentle slipped through the door into what remained of Roxborough's house. Though he'd felt nothing in the way of memories as he'd entered the tower, he felt them now. They weren't as material as those that visited him in Gamut Street, where the very boards seemed to have recorded the souls that had trodden them. These were vague recollections of the times he'd drunk and debated around the great oak table. He didn't allow nostalgia to delay him, however, but passed through the room like a man vexed by admirers, arms raised against their blandishments, and headed down into the cellar. He'd had this labyrinth and its contents, 
all spined and skin-bound, whether human or not, described to him by Jude. But the sight still amazed him. All this wisdom buried in darkness. Was it any wonder the imagical life of the fifth had been so anemic in the last two centuries, when all the liquors that might have fortified it had been hidden here? But he hadn't come to browse, glorious as that prospect was. He'd come for Celestine, who trailed, of all things, the name Nisi Nirvana to bring him here. He didn't know why. Though he vaguely remembered the name and knew there was some story to go with it, he could neither remember the tale nor recall whose knee he'd first heard it at. Perhaps she knew the answer. There was a wonderful agitation here. Even the dust would not lie down and die, but moved in giddy constellations, which he divided as he strode. He made no false turns, but the route from the steps to the place where Celestine lay was still a long one and before he'd reached it, he heard a cry. It wasn't a woman's cry, he thought, but the echoes disfigured it, and he couldn't be certain. He picked up his speed, turning corner after corner, knowing as he went that his other had preceded him every step of the way. There were no further cries after the first, but as his destination came in view, it looked like a cave, raggedly dug from the wall, an oracle's home, he heard a different sound, that of bricks grinding their gritty faces together. There were small but constant falls of dried mortar from the ceiling, and a subtle trembling in the ground. He started up over the litter of fallen rock, which was strewn like a battlefield with gutted books to the inviting crack. As he did so, he caught a glimpse of a violent motion inside, which had him to the threshold in a stumbling rush. Brother he said, even before he'd found Sartori in the gloom. What are you doing? Now he saw his other, closing on the woman in the corner of the cave. She was almost naked, but far from defenceless. Ribbons, like the rags of a bridal train, but made of her flesh, were springing from her shoulders and back, their power clearly more substantial than their delicacy implied. Some were clinging to the wall above her head, but the bulk were extended towards Sartori and wrapped around his head like a smothering hood. He clawed at them, working his fingers between them to get a better grip. Fluid ran from the gouged flesh, and cobs of matter came away in his fists. It could only be a matter of time before he released himself, and when he did, he'd do her no little harm. Gentle didn't call to his brother a second time. What was the use? The man was deafened. Instead, he crossed the cave at a stumbling rush and took hold of Sartori from behind, dragging his brother's arms from their maiming work and pinning them to his sides. As he did so, he saw Celestine's gaze go between the two figures in front of her, and either the shock of what she was witnessing or her exhaustion took its toll on her strength. The wounded ribbons loosened and fell in wreaths around Sartori's neck, uncovering the other face and confirming Celestine in her distress. She withdrew the ribbons entirely, gathering them into her lap. With his sight returned, Sartori wrenched his head around to identify his captor. Seeing gentle, he instantly gave up his struggle to free himself and stood in the reconciler's arms, quite pacified. Why do I always find you doing harm, brother? Gentle asked him. Brother, said Sartori, since when was it brother? That's what we are. You tried to kill me in his Isordorex, or have you forgotten? Has something changed? Yes, said Gentle. I have. Oh? I'm ready to accept our kinship. A fine word. In fact, I accept my responsibility for everything I was, am, or will be. I've got your oviate to thank for that. That's good to hear, Sartori said, especially in this company. He looked back at Celestine. She was still standing, though it was plainly the filaments hugging the wall that held her up, not her legs. Her eyes were flickering closed, and there were tremors running through her body. 
Gentle knew she needed aid, but he could do nothing while he was burdened with Sartori, so he turned and pitched his brother towards the cave door. Sartori went from him like a doll, only raising his arms to break his fall at the very last. Help her if you want, he said, staring back at Gentle with slackened features. It's no skin off my nose. Then he lifted himself up. For an instant, Gentle thought he intended some reprisal and drew breath to defend himself. But the other simply said, I'm on my belly, brother. Would you harm me here? As if to prove how low he'd fallen and was willing to stay, he began to slink over the earth like a snake driven from a hearth. You're welcome to her, he said, and disappeared into the brighter murk beyond the door. Celestine's eyes had closed by the time Gentle looked back, her body hanging limply from the tenacious ribbons. He went towards her, but as he approached, her lids flickered open. No, she said. I don't want you near me. Could he blame her? One man with his face had already attempted murder or violation or both. Why should she trust another? Nor was this any time to be pleading his innocence. She needed help, not apology. The question was, from whom? Jude had made it clear on the way up that she'd been sent from this woman's side the same way he was being sent. Perhaps Clem could nurse the woman. I'll send somebody to help you, he said, and headed out into the passageway. Sartori had disappeared, lifted himself off his belly and taken to his heels. Once again, Gentle went in his footsteps back towards the stairs. He'd covered half that distance when Jude, Clem and Monday appeared. Their frowns evaporated when they saw Gentle. We thought he'd murdered you, Jude said. He didn't touch me, but he's hurt Celestine and she won't let me near her. Clem, will you see if you can help, but be careful. She may look sick, but she's strong. Where is she? Jude'll take you. I'm going after Sartori. He's gone up the tower, Monday said. He didn't even look at us, Jude said. She sounded almost offended. He just stumbled out and up the stairs. What the hell did you do to him? Nothing. I never saw an expression like that on his face before. Or yours come to that. Like what? Tragic, said Clem. Maybe we're going to win a quicker victory than I thought, Gentle said, starting past them to the stairs. Wait, Jude said. We can't tend to Celestine here. We need to take her somewhere safer. Agreed. The studio, maybe? No, Gentle said. There's a house I know in Clerkenwell where we'll be safe. He drove me out of it once. But it's mine, and we're going back to it. All of us. Chapter 51 1 the son that met Gentle in the foyer put him in mind of Taylor, whose wisdom, spoken through a sleeping boy, had begun this day. That dawn already seemed an age ago, the hours since then had been so filled with journeys and revelations. It would be this way until the reconciliation he knew. The London he'd wandered in his first years, brimming with possibilities, a city pie had once said hid more angels than God's skirts, was once again a place of presences, and he rejoiced in the fact. It gave heat to his heels as he mounted the stairs, two and three at a time. Strange as it was, he was actually eager to see Sartori's face again, to speak with his other and know his mind. Jude had prepared him for what he'd find on the top floor, bland corridors leading to the tabula rasa's table and the body sprawled there. The scent of Godolphin's undoing was there to meet him as he stepped into the passageway. A sickening reminder, though he scarcely needed one, that Revelation had a grimmer face, and that those last halcyon days, when he'd been the most lauded metaphysician in Europe, had ended in atrocity. It would not happen again, he swore to himself. Last time the ceremonies had been brought to grief by the brother waiting for him at the end of this corridor 
and if he had to commit fratricide to remove the danger of a recurrence, then so be it. Sartori was the spirit of his own imperfections made flesh. To kill him would be a cleansing, and welcome, perhaps, to them both. As he advanced along the corridor, the sickly smell of Godolphin's putrefraction grew stronger. He held his breath against it and came to the door in utter silence. It nevertheless swung open as he approached, his own voice inviting him in. There's no harm in here, brother, not from me, and I don't need you on your belly to prove your good intentions. Gentle stepped inside. All the drapes were drawn against the sun, but even the sturdiest fabric usually let some trace of light through its weave. Not so here. The room was sealed by something more than curtains and brick, and Sartori was sitting in this darkness, his form visible only because the door was ajar. Will you sit? he said. I know this isn't a very wholesome slab. The body of Oscar Godolphin had gone the mess of his blood and rot remaining in pools and smears. But I like the formality. We should negotiate like civilized beings, yes? Gentle acceded to this, walking to the other end of the table and sitting down, content to demonstrate good faith unless or until Sartori showed signs of treachery. Then he'd be swift and calamitous. Where did the body go? he asked. It's here. I'll bury it after we've talked. This is no place for a man to rot. Or maybe it's the perfect place, I don't know. We can vote on it later. Suddenly you're a Democrat. You said you were changing. So am I. Any particular reason? We'll get to that later. First, he glanced towards the door and it swung closed, plunging them both into utter darkness. You don't mind, do you? Sartori said. This isn't a conversation we should have looking at ourselves. The mirror's bad enough. You didn't mind in his order, X? I was incarnate there. Here I feel... immaterial. I was really impressed by what you did in his order, X, by the way. One word from you and it just crumbled away. Your handiwork, not mine. Oh, don't be obtuse. You know what history'll say. It won't give a fuck about the politics. It'll say the reconciler arrived and the walls came tumbling down. And you're not going to argue with that. It feeds the legend. It makes you look messianic. That's what you really want, isn't it? The question is, if you're the reconciler, what am I? We don't have to be enemies. Didn't I say the very same thing in his order, X? And didn't you try and murder me? I had good reason. Name one. You destroyed the first reconciliation. It wasn't the first. There have been three other attempts to my certain knowledge. It was my first. My great work. And you destroyed it. Who did you hear that from? from Lucius Cobbett, Gentle replied. There was a silence then, and in it Gentle thought he heard the darkness move, a sound like silk on silk. But his head was never quite silent these days, and before he could clear a path through the whispers, Sartori had recovered his equilibrium. So Lucius is alive, he said, just in memory, in Gamut Street, that fuckhead little ease let you have quite an education, didn't he? I'll have his guts. He sighed. I miss Rosengarten, you know. He was so very loyal. And Residio and Matalaus. I had some good people in his order, X. People I could trust. People who loved me. It's the face, I think. It inspires devotion. You must have noticed that. Is it the divine in you, or is it just the way we smile? I resist the notion that one's a symptom of the other. Hunchbacks can be saints, and beauty's perfect monsters. Haven't you found that? Certainly. You see how much we agree. We sit here in the dark, and we talk like friends. 
I truly think if we never again stepped out into the light, we could learn to love each other after a time. That can't happen. Why not? Because I've work to do, and I won't let you delay me. You did terrible harm last time, Maestro. Remember that. Put it in your mind's eye. Remember how it looked, seeing the in ovo spilling out. By the sound of Sartori's voice, Gentle guessed that the man had risen to his feet. But again it was difficult to be certain when the darkness was so profound. He stood up himself, his chair tipping over behind him. The in ovo's a filthy place, Sartori was saying. And believe me, I don't want it dirtying up this dominion. But I'm afraid that may be inevitable. Now Gentle was certain there was some duplicity here. Sartori's voice no longer had a single source, but was being subtly disseminated throughout the room as though he was seeping into the darkness. If you leave this room, brother, if you leave me alone, there'll be such horror unleashed on the fifth. I won't make any errors this time. Who's talking about error? Sartori said. I'm talking about what I'll do for righteousness' sake if you desert me. So come with me. What for? To be your disciple? Listen to what you're saying. I've got as much right to be called Messiah as you. Why should I be a piddling acolyte? Do me the courtesy of understanding that at least. So do I have to kill you? You can try. I'm ready to do it, brother, if you force me. So am I. So am I. There was no purpose in further debate, Gentle thought. If he was going to kill the man, as it seemed he must, he wanted to do it swiftly and cleanly. But he needed light for the deed. He moved towards the door, intending to open it, but as he did so, something touched his face. He put his hand up to snatch it away, but it had already gone, flitting towards the ceiling. What defence was this? He'd sensed no living thing when he'd entered the room other than Sartori. The darkness had been inert. Either it had now taken on some illusory life as an extension of Sartori's will, or else his other had used the darkness as a cover for some summoning. But what? There'd been no evocation spoken, no hint of a fate. If he'd managed to call up some defender, it was flimsy and witless. He heard it flapping against the ceiling like a blinded bird. I thought we were alone, he said. Our last conversation needs witnesses, or how would the world know I gave you a chance to save it? Biographers now? Not exactly. What then? Gentle said, his outstretched hand reaching the wall and sliding along it towards the door. Why don't you show me? he said, his palm closing around the handle. Or are you too ashamed? With this, he pulled not one but both doors open. The phenomenon that followed was more startling than dire. The meagre light in the passageway outside was drawn into the room in a rush, as though it were milk, sucked from day's teat to feed what waited inside. It flew past him, dividing as it went, going to a dozen places around the room, high and low. Then the handles were snatched from Gentle's grip, and the door slammed. He turned back to face the room, and as he did so, heard the table being thrown over. Some of the light had been drawn to what lay beneath. There was Godolphin, gutted, his entrails splayed around him, his kidneys laid on his eyes, his heart at his groin, and skittering around his body some of the entities this arrangement had called forth, carrying fragments of the light stolen through the door. None of them made much sense to Gentle's eye. They had no limbs recognisable as such, nor any trace of features, nor, in most cases, heads upon which features might have sat. They were scraps of nonsense, some strung together like the cloggings of a drain, and mindlessly busy, others lying like bloated fruit, splitting and splitting and showing themselves seedless. Gentle looked towards Sartori. 
He hadn't taken any light for himself, but a loop of wormy life hung over his head and cast its baleful brightness down. What have you done? Gentle asked him. There are workings a reconciler would never stoop to know. This is one. These beasts are oviates. Peripateria. You can't raise the weightier beasts with a corpse that's cold. But these things know how to be compliant. And that's all either you or I have ever really asked for from our abettors, isn't it? Or our loved ones come to that. Well, you've shown me them now, Gentle said. You can send them home. Oh, no, brother. I want you to know what they can do. They're the least of the least, but they've got some maddening tricks. Sartori glanced up, and the loop of wretchedness above him went from its cherished place, moving towards Gentle, then to the ground, its target not the living, but the dead. It was around Godolphin's neck in moments, while in the air above it an alliance of its fellows formed, congealing into a peristaltic cloud. The loop tightened like a noose and rose, hauling Godolphin up. The kidneys fell from his eyes. They were open beneath. The heart dropped from his groin. There was a wound where his manhood had been. Then... The remaining innards spilled from his carcass, preserved in a jelly of cold blood. The peripateria overhead offered themselves as a gallows for the ascending noose, and, having it in their midst, rose again, so that the dead man's feet were pulled clear off the ground. This is obscene, Sartori, Gentle said. Stop it. It's not very pretty, is it? But think, brother, think what an army of them could do. You couldn't even heal this single little horror, never mind this a thousandfold. He paused, then said with genuine inquiry in his voice, Or could you? Could you raise poor Oscar? From the dead, I mean. Could you do that? He left his place at the other end of the room and moved towards Gentle, the look on his face, lit by the gallows, one of exhilaration at this possibility. If you could do that, he said, I swear I'd be your perfect disciple. I would. He was past the hanged man now and coming within a yard or two of gentle. I swear, he said again. Let him down. Why? Because it's pointless and pathetic. Maybe that's what I am, Sartori said. Maybe that's what I've been from the beginning, and I never had the wit to realize it. This was a new tack, Gentle thought. Five minutes before, the man had been demanding due respect as an aspirant messiah. Now he was wallowing in self-abnegation. I've had so many dreams, brother. Oh, the cities I've imagined. The empires. But I could never quite remove the niggling doubt, you know? The worm at the back of the skull that keeps saying, It'll come to nothing. It'll come to nothing. And you know what? The worm was right. All I ever attempted was doomed from the beginning because of what we are to each other. Tragic, Clem had said, describing the look on Sartori's face as he'd fled the cellar. And perhaps in his way he was. But what had he learned that had brought him so low? It had to be goaded out of him now or never. I saw your empire, Gentle replied. It didn't fall apart because there was some judgment on it. You built it out of shit. That's why it collapsed. But don't you see, that was the judgment. I was the architect and I was also the judge who found it unworthy. I was set against myself from the beginning and I never realized it. But you realize it now. It couldn't be plainer. Why? Do you see yourself in this filth? Is that it? No, brother, Sartori said. It's when I look at you. At me? Sartori stared at him, tears beginning to fill his eyes. She thought I was you, he murmured. Judith? Celestine? 
She didn't know there were two of us. How could she? So when she saw me, she was pleased. At first, anyway. There was a weight of pain in his speech Gentle hadn't anticipated, and it was no pretense. Sartori was suffering like a damned man. Then she smelled me, he went on. She said I stank of evil and I disgusted her. Why should you care, Gentle said. You wanted to kill her anyway. No, he protested. That wasn't what I wanted at all. I wouldn't have laid a finger on her if she hadn't attacked me. You're suddenly very loving? Of course. I don't see why. Didn't you say we were brothers? Yes. Then she's my mother too. Don't I have some right to be loved by her? Mother? Yes. Mother. She's your mother, gentle. She was raped by the unbeheld, and you're the consequence. Gentle was too shocked to reply. His mind was gathering puzzles from far and wide, all of them solved by this revelation, and the solving filled him to brimming. Sartori wiped his face with the heels of his hands. I was born to be the devil, brother, he said. Hell to your heaven. Do you see? Every plan I ever laid, every ambition I ever had is a mockery, because the part of me that's you wants love and glory and great works, and the part of me that's our father knows it's shite and brings it down. I'm my own destroyer, brother. All I can do is live with destruction until the end of the world. 2. In the foyer six stories below, Celestine's rescuers had, after much coaxing, persuaded the woman out of the labyrinth and into the light. Weak though she'd been when Clem had entered her cell, she resisted his consolations for a good while, telling him that she wanted no part of them. She preferred to remain underground, she said, and perish there. His experience on the streets had given him away with such recalcitrance. He didn't argue with her, nor did he leave. He bided his time at the threshold, telling her she was probably right. There was nothing to be gained from seeing the sun. After a while, she balked at this, telling him that wasn't her opinion at all, and if he had any decency about him, he'd give her some comfort in her distress. Did he want her to die like an animal, she said, locked away in the dark? He then allowed that the fault was his, and if she wanted to be taken up into the outside world, he'd do what he could. With his tactics successful, he sent Monday off to bring Jude's car to the front of the tower and began the business of getting Celestine out. There was a delicate moment at the door of the cell when the woman, setting eyes on Jude, almost recanted her desire to leave, saying she wanted no truck with this tainted creature. Jude kept her silence, and Clem, tact personified, sent her up to fetch blankets from the car while he escorted Celestine to the stairs. It was a slow business, and several times she asked him to stop, holding on to him fiercely and telling him that she wasn't trembling because she was afraid, but because her body was unused to such freedom, and that if anybody, particularly the tainted woman, was to remark on these tremors, he was to hush them. Thus, clinging to Clem one moment, then demanding he not lean on her the next, slowing at times, then rising up with preternatural strength in her sinews the instant after, Roxburgh's captive quit her prison after two centuries of incarceration and went up to meet the day. But the tower's sum of surprises, whether above or below, was not yet exhausted. As Clem escorted her across the foyer, he stopped, his eyes on the door ahead, or rather on the sunlight that poured through it. It was laden with moats pollen and seeds from the trees and plants outside, dust from the road beyond. Though there was scarcely a breeze outside, they were in lively motion. We've got a visitor, he remarked. Here, Jude said, up ahead. She looked at the light. Though she could see nothing that resembled a human form in it, the particles were not moving arbitrarily. There was some organizing principle among them, and Clem, it seemed, knew its name. Taylor, 
he said, his voice thick with feeling. Taylor's here. He glanced across at Monday, who, without being told, stepped in to take Celestine's weight. The woman had been hovering on unconsciousness again, but now she raised her head and watched, as did they all while Clem started to walk towards the light-filled door. It's you, isn't it? he said softly. In reply, the motion in the light became more agitated. I thought so, Clem said, coming to a halt a couple of yards from the edge of the pool. What does he want? Jude said. Can you tell? Clem glanced back at her, his expression both awed and afraid. He wants me to let him in, he replied. He wants to be here. He tapped his chest. Inside me. Jude smiled. The day had brought little in the way of good news, but here was some. The possibility of a union she'd never have believed possible. Still, Clem hesitated, keeping his distance from the light. I don't know if I can do it, he said. He's not going to hurt you, Jude said. I know, Clem said, glancing back at the light. Its gilded dust was more hectic than ever. It's not the hurt. What then? He shook his head. I did it, man, Monday said. Just close your eyes and think of England. This earned a little laugh from Clem, who was still staring at the light when Jude voiced the final persuasion. You loved him, she said. The laugh caught in Clem's throat, and in the utter hush that followed he murmured, I still do. Then be with him. He looked back at her one last time and smiled. Then he stepped into the light. To Jude's eyes, there was nothing so remarkable about the sight. It was just a door and a man stepping through it into sunlight. But there was significance in it now she'd never understood before, and as she stood witness, a warning of Oscar's returned to her head, spoken as they'd prepared to leave Resordorex. She'd come back changed, he said, seeing the world she'd left with clearer eyes. Here was proof of that. Perhaps sunlight had always been numinous, and doorways signs of a greater passage than that of one room to another. But she'd not seen it until now. Clem stood in the beams for perhaps thirty seconds, his hands palm up in front of him. Then he turned back towards her, and she saw that Taylor had come with him. If she'd been asked to name the places where she saw his presence, she couldn't have done so. There was no change in his physiognomy no particular in which they could be seen, unless it was in signs so subtle, the angle of his head, the fixedness of his mouth, that she couldn't distinguish them. But he was there, no doubt of it, and so was an urgency that had not been in Clem a minute before. Take Celestine out of here, he said to Jude on Monday. There's something terrible going on upstairs. He left the doorway, heading for the stairs. Do you want help? Jude said. No, stay with her. She needs you. At this, Celestine uttered her first words since leaving the cell. I don't need her, she said. Clem reeled around on one heel, coming back to the woman and putting his nose an inch from hers. You know, I'm finding you hard to like, madam, he snapped. Jude laughed out loud, hearing Tay's irascible tone so clearly. She'd forgotten how his and Clem's natures had dovetailed before sickness had taken the piss and vinegar out of Tay. We're here because of you, remember that, Tay said, and you'd still be down there picking the fluff from your navel if Judy hadn't brought us. Celestine narrowed her eyes. Put me back then, she said. Just for that, Jude held her breath. He wouldn't, surely. I'm going to give you a big kiss and ask you very politely to stop being a cantankerous old bag. He kissed her on the nose. Now let's get going, he said to Monday. And before Celestine could summon a reply, he headed to the stairs and was up them and out of sight. 3. Exhausted by his outpouring of pain, Sartori turned from gentle and began to wander back to the chair where he'd been sitting at the start of their interview. 
He idled as he went, kicking over those servile scraps that came to dote on him and pausing to look up at Godolphin's gutted body, then setting it in motion with a touch so that its bulk eclipsed and uncovered him by turns as he went to his little throne. There were peripateria gathered around in a sycophantic horde, but Gentle didn't wait for him to order them against him. Sartori was no less dangerous for the despair he'd just expressed. All it did was free him from any last hope of peace between them. It freed Gentle too. This had to end in Sartori's dispatch, or the devil he'd decided to be would undo the great work all over again. Gentle drew breath. As soon as his brother turned, he'd let the Numa fly and be done. What makes you think you can kill me, brother? Sartori said, still not turning. God's in the First Dominion, and Mother's nearly dead downstairs. You're alone. All you have is your breath. Godolphin's body continued to swing between them, but the man kept his back turned. And if you unnip me, what do you do to yourself in the process? Have you thought about that? Kill me, and maybe you kill yourself. Gentle knew Sartori was capable of planting such doubts all night. It was the compliment to his own lost skill with seduction, dropping these possibilities into promising earth. He wouldn't be delayed by them. His new redded, he started after the man, pausing only for the swing of Godolphin's corpse, then stopping on the other side of it. Sartori still refused to show his face, and Gentle had no option but to waste a little of the killing breath with words. Look at me, brother, he said. He read the intention to do so in Sartori's body, a motion beginning in his heels and torso and head. But before his face came in sight, Gentle heard a sound behind him and glanced back to see the third actor here, the dead Godolphin dropping from his gallows. He had time to glimpse the oviates in the carcass, then it was upon him. It should have been easy to stand aside, but the beasts had done more than nest in the corpse. They were busy in Godolphin's rotted muscle, engineering the resurrection Sartori had begged Gentle to perform. The corpse's arms snatched hold of him, and its bulk, all the vaster for the weight of parasites, bore him to his knees. The breath went out of him as harmless air, and before he could take another, his arms were caught and twisted to breaking point behind his back. Never turn your back on a dead man, Sartori said, finally showing his face. There was no triumph on it, though he'd incapacitated his enemy in one swift manoeuvre. He turned his sorrowful eyes up to the host of peripateria that had been Godolphin's gallows, and, with the thumb of his left hand, described a tiny circle. They took their cue instantly, the motion appearing in their cloud. I'm more superstitious than you, brother, Sartori said, reaching behind him and throwing over his chair. It didn't lie where it fell, but rolled on around the room as though the motion overhead had some correspondence below. I'm not going to lay a hand on you, he went on, in case there is some consequence for a man who takes his other's life. He raised his palms. Look, I'm blameless, he said, stepping back towards the draped windows. You're going to die because the world is coming apart. While he spoke, the motion around Gentle increased as the peripateria took their summoner's cue. They were insubstantial as individuals, but en masse they had considerable authority. As their circling speeded up, it generated a current strong enough to lift the chair Sartori had overthrown into the air. The light fixtures were sheared off the walls, taking cobs of plaster with them. The handles were ripped from the doors, and the rest of the chairs snatched up to join the tarantella, smashed to firewood as they collided with each other. Even the table, enormous as it was, began to move. At the eye of this storm, Gentle struggled to free himself from Godolphin's cold embrace. He might have done so given time, but the circle and its freight of shards closed on him too quickly. Unable to protect himself, all he could do was bow his head against the hail of wood, plaster and glass, the breath pummeled from him by the assault. Only once did he lift his eyes to look for Sartori through the storm. His brother stood flat against the wall, his head thrown back as he watched the execution. 
If there was any feeling on his face, it was that of a man offended by what he saw, a lamb obliged to watch helplessly as his companion was pulped. It seemed he didn't hear the voice raised in the corridor outside, but Gentle did. It was Clem, calling the maestro's name and beating on the door. Gentle didn't have the strength left to reply. His body sagged in Godolphin's arms as the fusillade increased, striking his skull and ribcage and thighs. Clem, God love him, didn't need an answering call. He slammed himself against the door repeatedly, and the lock suddenly burst, throwing both doors open at once. There was more light outside than in, of course, and just as before, it was drawn into the darkened room at a rush, sweeping past the astonished Clem. The Peripateria were as desperate as ever to have a sliver of illumination for themselves, and their swirling ranks fell into confusion at the appearance of the light. Gentle felt the hold on him loosen as those oviates who'd quickened Godolphin's corpse left off their labours and went to join the melee. With the energies in the room diverted, the circling wreckage began to lose momentum. But not before a piece of the splintered table struck one of the open doors, shearing it off at the hinges. Clem saw the collision coming and retreated before he too was struck, his shout of alarm stirring Sartori. Gentle looked towards his brother. He'd left off his sham of innocence and was studying the stranger in the hallway with gleaming eyes. He didn't leave his place at the wall, however. A rain of wreckage was falling now, littering the room from end to end, and he clearly had no desire to step into it. Instead, he reached up to snatch a Eurado from his eye, intending to strike Clem down before he could intervene again. Godolphin's bulk was doubling gentle over but he strained to raise himself from beneath it, yelling a warning to Clem, who was back at the threshold now as he did so. Clem heard the shout and saw Sartori snatch at his eye. Though he had no knowledge of what the gesture meant, he was quick to defend himself, ducking behind the surviving door as the killing blow flew his way. In the same instant, Gentle heaved himself to his feet, throwing off Godolphin's body. He glanced in Clem's direction to be certain his friend had survived, and, seeing that he had, started towards Sartori. He had breath in his body now, and might easily have dispatched a Numa at his enemy. But his hands wanted more than air in them. They wanted flesh. They wanted bone. Careless of the trash that was both underfoot and falling from the air, he ran at his brother, who sensed his approach and turned his way. Gentle had time to see the face before him smile a feral welcome. Then he was upon him. His momentum carried them both back against the drapes. The window behind Sartori shattered, and the rail above him broke, bringing the curtain down. This time the light that filled the room was ablaze, and it fell directly on Gentle's face. He was momentarily blinded, but his body still knew its business. He pushed his brother to the sill and hauled him up over it. Sartori reached for a handhold and snatched at the fallen drape, but its folds were of little use. The cloth tore as he tipped backwards, carried over the sill by his brother's arms. Even then he fought to keep himself from falling, but Gentle gave him no quarter. Sartori flailed for a moment, scrabbling at the air. Then he was gone from Gentle's hands, his scream going with him, down and down and down. Gentle didn't see the fall and was glad of it. Only when the cry stopped did he retreat from the window and cover his face, while the circle of the sun blazed blue and green and red behind his lids. When he finally opened his eyes, it was to devastation. The only whole thing in the room was Clem, and even he was the worse for wear. He'd picked himself up and was watching the oviates, who fought so vehemently for a piece of light, withering for excess of it. Their matter was drab slough, their skitters and flights reduced to a wretched crawling retreat from the window. I've seen prettier turds, Clem remarked. Then he started around the room, pulling all the rest of the drapes down, the dust he raised, making the sun solid as it came, and leaving no shadow for the peripateria to retreat to. Taylor's here, he said, when the job was done. In the sun? Better than that, Clem replied. In my head. We think you need guardian angels, maestro. So do I.
said Gentle. Thank you. Both. He turned back to the window and looked down at the wasteland into which Sartori had fallen. He didn't expect to see a body there. Nor did he. Sartori hadn't survived all those years as Autark without finding a hundred fates to protect his flesh. They met Monday, who had heard the window breaking above coming up the stairs as they descended. I thought you was a goner, boss, he said. Almost, came the reply. What do we do about Godolphin? Clem said as the trio headed down together. We don't need to do anything, Gentle said. There's an open window. I don't think he's going to be flying anywhere. No, but the birds can get to him, Gentle said lightly. Better to fatten birds than worms. There's a morbid sense in that, I suppose, Clem said. And how's Celestine? Gentle asked the boy. She's in the car, all wrapped up and not saying very much. I don't think she likes the sun. After two hundred years in the dark, I'm not surprised. We'll make her comfortable once we get to Gamut Street. She's a great lady, gentlemen. She's also my mother. So that's where you get your bloody-mindedness from, Tay remarked. How safe is this house we're going to? Monday asked. If you mean how do we stop Sartori getting in, I don't think we can. They'd reached the foyer, which was as sun-filled as ever. So what do you think the bastard's going to do? Clem wondered. He won't come back here. I'm sure of that, Gentle said. I think he'll wander the city for a while. But sooner or later he'll be driven back to where he belongs. Which is where? Gentle opened his arms. Here, he said. Chapter 52 1 there was surely no more haunted thoroughfare in London that blistering afternoon than Gamut Street. Neither those locations in the city famous for their phantoms nor those anonymous spots, known only to psychics and children where revenants gathered, boasted more souls eager to debate events in the place of their decease as that backwater in Clerkenwell. While few human eyes, even those ready for the marvellous, and the car that turned into Gamut Street at a little past four o'clock contained several such eyes, could see the phantoms as solid entities. Their presence was clear enough, marked by the cold still places in the shimmering haze rising off the road, and by the stray dogs that gathered in such numbers at the corners, drawn by the high whistles some of the dead were wont to make. Thus Gamut Street cooked in a heat of its own, its stew potent with spirits. Gentle had warned them all that there was no comfort to be had at the house. It was without furniture, water, or electricity. But the past was there, he said, and it would be a comfort to them all after their time in the enemy's tower. I remember this house, Jude said as she emerged from the car. We should both be careful, Gentle warned as he climbed the steps. Sartori left one of his oviates inside and it nearly drove me crazy. I want to get rid of it before we all go in. I'm coming with you, Jude said, following him to the door. I don't think that's wise, he said. Let me deal with little ease first. That's Sartori's beast? Yes. Then I'd like to see it. Don't worry, it's not going to hurt me. I've got a little of its maestro right here, remember? She laid her hand upon her belly. I'm safe. Gentle made no objection, but stood aside to let Monday force the door, which he did with the efficiency of a practised thief. Before the boy had even retreated down the steps again, Jude was over the threshold, braving the stale, cold air. Wait up, Gentle said, following her into the hallway. What does this creature look like? she wanted to know. Like an ape? Or a baby? I don't know. It talks a lot. I'm certain of that much. Little ease? That's right. Perfect name for a place like this. She'd reached the bottom of the stairs and was staring up towards the meditation room. Be careful, Gentle said. I heard you the first time. 
I don't think you quite understand how powerful. I was born up there, wasn't I? She said, her tone as chilly as the air. He didn't reply, not until she swung around and asked him again. Wasn't I? Yes. Nodding, she returned to her study of the stairs. You said the past was waiting here, she said. Yes. My past too? I don't know. Probably. I don't feel anything. It's like a bloody graveyard. A few vague recollections, that's all. They'll come. You're very certain. We have to be whole, Jude. What do you mean by that? We have to be reconciled with everything we ever were before we can go on. Suppose I don't want to be reconciled. Suppose I want to invent myself all over again, starting now. You can't do it, he said simply. We have to be whole before we can get home. If that's home, she said, nodding in the direction of the meditation room, you can keep it. I don't mean the cradle. What then? The place before the cradle. Heaven. Fuck heaven. I haven't got earth sorted out yet. You don't need to. Let me be the judge of that. I haven't even had a life I could call my own, and you're ready to slot me into the grand design. Well, I don't think I want to go. I want to be my own design. You can be, as part of part of nothing. I want to be me, a law unto myself. That isn't you talking. It's Sartori. What if it is? You know what he's done, Gentle replied. The atrocities. What are you doing taking lessons from him? When I should be taking them from you, you mean? Since when were you so damn perfect? He made no reply, and she took his silence as further sign of his new high-mindedness. Oh, so you're not going to stoop to mudslinging, is that it? We'll debate it later, he said. Debate it, she mocked. What are you going to give us, maestro, an ethics lesson? I want to know what makes you so damn rare. I'm Celestine's son, he said quietly. She stared at him agog. You're what? Celestine's son. She was taken from the fifth. I know where she was taken. Dowd did it. I thought he'd told me the whole story. Not this part? Not this part. There were kinder ways to tell you. I'm sorry I didn't find one. No, she said. Where better? Her gaze went back up the stairs. When she spoke again, which was not for a little time, it was in a whisper. You're lucky, she said. Home and heaven are the same place. Maybe that's true for us all, he murmured. I doubt it. A long silence followed, punctuated only by Monday's forlorn attempts to whistle on the step outside. At last Jude said, I can see now why you're so desperate to get all this right. You're... How does it go? You're about your father's business. I hadn't thought of it quite like that. But you are. I suppose I am. I just hope I'm equal to it, that's all. One minute I feel it's all possible. The next. He studied her while outside Monday attempted the tune afresh. Tell me what you're thinking, he said. I'm thinking I wish I'd kept your love letters, she replied. There was another aching pause. Then she turned from him and wandered off towards the back of the house. He lingered at the bottom of the stairs, thinking he should probably go with her, in case Sartori's agent was hiding there, but he was afraid to bruise her further with his scrutiny. He glanced back towards the open door and the sunlight on the step. Safety wasn't far from her if she needed it. How's it going? he called to Monday. Hot, came the reply. Clem's gone to fetch some food and beer. Lots of beer. We should have a party, boss. We fucking deserve it, don't we? We do. How's Celestine? She's asleep. 
Is it okay to come in yet? Just a little while longer, Gentle replied. But keep up the whistling, will you? There's a tune in there somewhere. Monday laughed, and the sound, which was utterly commonplace, of course, yet as unlikely as whale song, pleased him. If little Ease was still in the house, Gentle thought, his manners could do no great harm on a day as miraculous as this. Comforted, he set off up the stairs, wondering as he went if perhaps the daylight had shooed all the memories into hiding. But before he was halfway up the flight, he had proof that they hadn't. The phantom form of Lucius Cobbett, conjured in his mind's eye, appeared beside him, snotty, tearful, and desperate for wisdom. Moments later, the sound of his own voice offering the advice he'd given the boy that last terrible night. Study nothing except in the knowledge that you already knew it. Worship nothing. But before he'd completed the second dictum, the phrase was taken up by a mellifluous voice from above. Except in adoration of your true self, and fear nothing. The figment of Lucius Cobbett faded as Gentle continued to climb, but the voice became louder. Except in the certainty that you are your enemy's begetter, and its only hope of healing. And with the voice came the realization that the wisdom he'd bestowed on Lucius had not been his at all. It had originated with the mystiff. The door to the meditation room was open, and Pi was perched on the sill, smiling out of the past. When did you invent that? the maestro asked. I didn't invent it. I learned it, the mystiff replied, from my mother. And she learned it from her mother, or her father. Who knows? Now you can pass it on. And what am I? he asked the mystiff. Your son or your daughter? Pi looked almost abashed. You're my maestro. Is that all? We're still masters and servants here. Don't say that. What should I say? What you feel. Oh, the mystiff smiled. If I told you what I feel, we'd be here all day. The gleam of mischief in its eye was so endearing, and the memory so real it was all Gentle could do to prevent himself crossing the room and embracing the space where his friend had sat. But there was work to be done, his father's business, as Jude had called it, and it was more pressing than indulging his memories. When little Ease had been ousted from the house, then he'd return here and search for a profounder lesson, that of the workings of the reconciliation. He needed that education quickly, and the echoes here were surely rife with exchanges on the subject. I'll be back, he said to the creature on the sill. I'll be waiting, it replied. He glanced back towards it, and the sun, catching the window behind, momentarily ate into its silhouette, showing him not a whole figure, but a fragment. His gut turned, as the image called another back to mind, with appalling force. The erasure, in roiling chaos, and in the air above his head the howling rags of his beloved, returned into the second with some words of warning. Undone! it had said, as it fought the claim of the erasure. We are undone. Had he made some placating reply, snatched from his lips by the storm? He didn't remember. But he heard again the mystiff telling him to find Sartori, instructing him that his other knew something that he, gentle, didn't. And then it had gone, been snatched away into the first dominion and silenced there. His heart racing, Gentle shook this horror from his head and looked back towards the sill. It was empty now, but Pi's exhortation to find Sartori was still in his head. Why had that been so important, he wondered. Even if the mystiff had somehow discovered the truth of Gentle's origins in the First Dominion and had failed to communicate the fact, it must have known that Sartori was as much in ignorance of the secret as his brother. So what was the knowledge the mystiff had believed Sartori possessed, that it had defied the limits of God's kingdom to spur him into pursuit? A shout from below had him give up the enigma. 
Jude was calling out to him. He headed down the stairs at speed, following her voice through the house and into the kitchen, which was large and chilly. Jude was standing close to the window which had gone to ruin many years ago, giving access to the convolvulus from the garden behind, which, having entered, had rotted in a darkness its own abundance had thickened. The sun could only get pencil beams through this snare of foliage and wood, but they were sufficient to illuminate both the woman and the captive whose head she had pinned beneath her foot. It was little ease, his oversized mouth drawn down like a tragic mask, his eyes turned up towards Jude. Is this it? she said. This is it. Little ease set up a round of thin mewling as gentle approached, which it turned into words. I didn't do a thing. You ask her, ask her, please, ask her, did I do a thing? No, I didn't. Just keeping out of harm's way, I was. Sartori's not very happy with you, Gentle said. Well, I didn't have a hope, it protested. Not against the likes of you, not against a reconciler. So you know that much? I do now. We have to be whole, it quoted, catching Gentle's tone perfectly. We have to be reconciled with everything we ever were. You were listening. I can't help it, the creature said. I was born inquisitive. I didn't understand it, though, it hastened to add. I'm not spying, I swear. Liar, Jude said. Then to Gentle, how do we kill it? We don't have to, he said. Are you afraid, little ease? What do you think? Would you swear allegiance to me if you were allowed to live? Where do I sign? Show me the place. You'd let this live, Jude said. Yes. What for? she demanded, grinding her heel upon it. Look at it. Don't, little ease begged. Swear, said Gentle, going down on his haunches beside it. I swear, I swear. Gentle looked up at Jude. Lift your foot he said. You trust it? I don't want death here, he said. Even this. Let it go, Jude. She didn't move. I said, let it go. Reluctance in every sinew, she raised her foot half an inch, and little ease scrabbled free, instantly taking hold of Gentle's hand. I'm yours, Liberatore, it said, touching its clammy brow to Gentle's palm. My head's in your hands, by Hio, by Heretea, by Herpeximendios. I commit my heart to you. Accepted, Gentle said, and stood up. What should I do now, Liberatore? There's a room at the top of the stairs. Wait for me there. Forever and ever. A few minutes will do. It backed off to the door, bowing woozily, then took to its heels. How can you trust a thing like that? Jude said. I don't, not yet. But you're willing to try. You're damned if you can't forgive, Jude. You could forgive Sartori, could you? She said. He's me, he's my brother, and he's my child, Gentle replied. How could I not? 2. With the house made safe, the rest of the company moved in. Monday, Ever the scavenger, went off to scour the neighbouring houses and streets in search of whatever he could find to offer some modicum of comfort. He returned three times with bounty, the third time taking Clem off with him. They returned half an hour later with two mattresses and armfuls of bed linen, all too clean to have been found abandoned. I miss my vocation, Clem said, with Tay's mischief in his features. Burglary is much more fun than banking. At this juncture, Monday requested permission to borrow Jude's car and drive back to the South Bank, there to collect the belongings he'd left behind in his haste to follow Gentle. She told him yes, but urged him to return as fast as possible. Though it was still bright on the street outside, they would need as many strong arms and wills as they could muster to defend the house when night fell. Clem had settled Celestine in what had been the dining room, laying the larger of the two mattresses on the floor and sitting with her until she slept. 
When he emerged, Tay's feisty presence was mellowed, and the man who came to join Jude on the step was serene. Is she asleep? Jude asked him. I don't know if it's sleep or a coma. Where's Gentle? Upstairs, plotting. You've argued. That's nothing new. Everything else changes, but that remains the same. He opened one of the bottles of beer sitting on the step and drank with gusto. You know, I catch myself every now and then wondering if this is all some hallucination. You've probably got a better grasp of it than I have. You've seen the Dominions. You know it's all real. But when I went off with Monday to get the mattresses, there were people just a few streets away walking around in the sun as though it was just another day. And I thought, there's a woman back there who's been buried alive for two hundred years, and her son, whose father's a god I never heard of. So he told you that? Oh, yes. And thinking about it, I wanted to just go home, lock the door, and pretend it wasn't happening. What stopped you? Monday, mostly. He just takes everything in stride. And knowing Tay's inside me. Though that feels so natural, it's like he was always there. Maybe he was, she said. Is there any more beer? Yep. He handed over a bottle and she struck it on the step the way he had. The top flew. The beer foamed. So what made you want to run, she said, when she'd slaked her thirst. I don't know. Clem replied. Fear of what's coming, I suppose. But that's stupid, isn't it? We're here at the beginning of something sublime, just the way Tay promised. Light coming into the world from a place we never even dreamed existed. It's the birth of the unconquered sun, isn't it? Oh, the suns are going to be fine, Jude said. They usually are. But you're not so sure about the daughters? No, I'm not, she said. Apexamendius killed the goddesses throughout the Imagica Clem, or at least tried to. Now I find he's Gentle's father. That doesn't make me feel too comfortable about doing his work. I can understand that. Part of me thinks... She let her voice trail into the silence, the thought unfinished. What? he asked. Tell me. Part of me thinks we're fools to trust either of them, Hapexamendios or his reconciler. If he was such a loving god, why did he do so much harm? And don't tell me he moves in mysterious ways because that's so much horseshit and we both know it. Have you talked to Gentle about this? I've tried, but he's got one thing on his mind. Two, Clem said. The reconciliation's one. Pi O Pa's the other. Oh, yes, the glorious Pi O Pa. Did you know he married it? Yes, he told me. It must have been quite a creature. I'm a little biased, I'm afraid, she said dryly. It tried to kill me. Gentle said that wasn't Pi's nature. No. He told me he ordered it to live its life as an assassin or a whore. It's all his fault, he said. He blames himself for everything. Does he blame himself or does he just take responsibility, she said. There's a difference. I don't know, Clem said, unwilling to be drawn on such niceties. He's certainly lost without pie. She kept her counsel here, wanting to say that she too was lost, that she too pined, but not trusting even Clem with this admission. He told me Pi's spirit is still alive like Tay's, Clem was saying. And when this is all over... He says a lot of things, Jude cut in, weary of hearing Gentle's wisdoms repeated. And you don't believe him? What do I know? She said, flinty now. I don't belong in this gospel. I'm not his lover and I won't be his disciple. A sound behind them and they turned to find Gentle standing in the hallway the brightness bouncing up from the step like footlights. There was sweat on his face, and his shirt was stuck to his chest. Clem rose with guilty speed, his heel catching his bottle. 
It rolled down two steps, spilling frothy beer as it went before Jude caught it. It's hot up there, Gentle said. And it's not getting any cooler, Clem observed. Can I have a word? Jude knew he wanted to speak out of her earshot, but Clem was either too guileless to realize this, which she doubted, or unwilling to play his game. He stayed on the step, obliging Gentle to come to the door. When Monday gets back, he said, I'd like you to go to the estate and bring back the stones in the retreat. I'm going to perform the reconciliation upstairs where I've got my memories to help me. Why are you sending Clem? Jude said, not rising or even turning. I know the way. He doesn't. I know what the stones look like. He doesn't. I think you'd be better off here, Gentle replied. Now she turned. What for? she said. I'm no use to anyone, unless you simply want to keep an eye on me. Not at all. Then let me go, she said. I'll take Monday to help me. Clemente can stay here. They're your angels, aren't they? If that's the way you'd prefer it, he said. I don't mind. I'll come back, don't worry, she said derisively, raising her beer bottle. If it's only to toast the miracle. 3. A little while after this conversation, with the blue tide of dusk rising in the street and lifting the day to the rooftops, Gentle left off his debates with Pye and went to sit with Celestine. Her room was more meditative than the one he'd left, where the memories of Pi had become so easy to conjure it was sometimes hard to believe the mystiff wasn't there in the flesh. Clem had lit candles beside the mattress upon which Celestine was sleeping, and their light showed gentlewoman so deeply asleep that no dreams troubled her. Though she was far from emaciated, her features were stark, as though her flesh was halfway to becoming bone. He studied her for a time, wondering if his own face would one day possess such severity. Then he returned to the wall at the bottom of the bed and sat on his haunches there, listening to the slow cadence of her breath. His mind was reeling with all that he'd learned or recollected in the room above. Like so much of the magic he'd become acquainted with, the working of the reconciliation was not a great ceremonial. Whereas most of the dominant religions of the fifth wallowed in ritual in order to blind their flocks to the paucity of their understanding, the liturgies and requiems, charts and sacraments all created to amplify those tiny grains of comprehension the holy men actually possessed, such theatrics were redundant when the ministers had truth in their grasp, and with the help of memory he might yet become one such minister. The principle of the reconciliation was not very difficult to grasp, he'd discovered. Every two hundred years, it seemed, the in ovo produced a kind of blossom, a five-petaled lotus which floated for a brief time in those lethal waters, immune to either their poison or their inhabitants. This sanctuary was called by a variety of names, but most simply, and most often, the Anna. In it, the maestros would gather, carrying their analogues of the dominions they each represented. Once the pieces were assembled, the process had its own momentum. The analogues would fuse, and, empowered by the Anna, burgeon, driving the in ovo back and opening the way between the reconciled dominions and the fifth. The flow of things is towards success, the mystiff had said, speaking from a better time. It's the natural instinct of every broken thing to make itself whole, and the imagica is broken until it's reconciled. Then why have there been so many failures? Gentle had asked. There haven't been that many, Pi had replied, and they were always destroyed by outside forces. Christos was brought down by politics. Pineo was destroyed by the Vatican. Always people from the outside, destroying the maestro's best intentions. We don't have such enemies. Ironic words, with hindsight. 
Gentle could not afford such complacency again, not with Sartori still alive and the chilling image of Pai's last frantic appearance at the Erasure still in his head. It was no use dwelling on it. He put the sight away as best he could, settling his gaze on Celestine instead. It was difficult to think of her as his mother. Maybe, among the innumerable memories he'd garnered in this house, there was some faint recollection of being a babe in these arms, of putting his toothless mouth to these breasts and being nourished there. But if it was there, it escaped him. Perhaps there were simply too many years and lives and women between now and that cradling. He could find it in him to be grateful for the life she'd given him, but it was hard to feel much more than that. After a time, the vigil began to depress him. She was too like a corpse lying there, and he too much a dutiful but loveless mourner. He got up to go, but before he quit the room, he halted at her bedside and stooped to touch her cheek. He'd not laid his flesh to hers in twenty-three or four decades, and perhaps, after this, he wouldn't do so again. She wasn't chilly, as he'd expected her to be, but warm, and he kept his hand upon her longer than he'd intended. Somewhere in the depths of her slumber she felt his touch and seemed to rise into a dream of him. Her austerity softened, and her pale lips said, Child? He wasn't sure whether to answer, but in the moment of hesitation she spoke again the same question. This time he replied. Yes, Mama, he said. Will you remember what I told you? What now, he wondered. I'm not certain, he told her. I'll try. Shall I tell you again? I want you to remember, child. Yes, Mama, he said. That would be good. Tell me again. She smiled an infinitesimal smile and began to repeat a story she'd apparently told many times. There was a woman once, called Nisi Nirvana. She'd no sooner started, however, than the dream she was having lost its claim on her, and she began to slip back into a deeper place, her voice losing power as she went. Don't stop, Mama, Gentle prompted. I want to hear. There was a woman. Yes? Called Nisi Nirvana. Yes. And she went to a city full of iniquities where no ghost was holy and no flesh was whole. And something there did a great hurt to her. Her voice was getting stronger again, but the smile, even that tiniest hint, had gone. What hurt was this, Mama? You needn't know the hurt, child. You'll learn about it one day, and on that day you'll wish you could forget it. Just understand that it's a hurt only men can do to women. And who did this hurt to her? Gentle asked. I told you, child, a man. But what man? His name doesn't matter. What matters is that she escaped him and came back into her own city and knew she must make a good thing from this bad that had been done to her. And do you know what that good thing was? No, Mama. It was a little baby. A perfect little baby. And she loved it so much it grew big after a time, and she knew it would be leaving her, so she said, I have a story to tell you before you go. And do you know what the story was? I want you to remember, child. Tell me. There was a woman called Nisi Nirvana, and she went into a city of iniquities. That's the same story, Mama. Where no ghost was holy. You haven't finished the first story. You've just begun again. And no flesh was whole. And something there... Stop, Mama. Gentle said, stop, did a great hurt to her. Distressed by this loop, Gentle took his hand from his mother's cheek. She didn't halt her recitation, however, at least not at first. The story went on exactly as it had before. The escape from the city. The good thing made from the bad. The baby. The perfect little baby. 
but with the hand no longer on her cheek, Celestine was sinking back into unthinking slumber, her voice steadily growing more indistinct. Gentle got up and backed away to the door, as the whispered wheel came full circle again. So she said, I have a story to tell you before you go. Gentle reached behind him and opened the door, his eyes fixed on his mother as the words slurred. And you know what the story was, she said. I want you to remember, child. He went on watching her as he slipped out into the hallway. The last sounds he heard would have been nonsense to any ear other than his, but he'd heard this story often enough now to know that she was beginning again as she dropped into dreamlessness. There was a woman once. On that, he closed the door. For some inexplicable reason, he was shaking, and had to stand at the threshold for several seconds before he could control the tremor. When he turned, he found Clem at the bottom of the stairs, sorting through a selection of candles. Is she still asleep? he asked as Gentle approached. Yes. Has she talked to you at all, Clem? Very little. Why? I've just been listening to her tell a story in her sleep. Something about a woman called Nisi Nirvana. Do you know what that means? Nisi Nirvana. Unless heaven. Is that somebody's name? Apparently, and it must mean a lot to her for some reason. That's the name she sent Jude with to fetch me. And what's the story? Damn strange, Gentle said. Maybe you liked it better when you were a kid. Maybe. If I hear her talking again, do you want me to call you down? I don't think so, Gentle said. I've got it by heart already. He started up the stairs. You're going to need some candles up there, Clem said, and matches to light them with. So I am, Gentle said, turning back. Clem handed over half a dozen candles, thick, stubby, and white. Gentle handed one of them back. Five's the magic number, he said. I left some food at the top of the stairs, Clem said as Gentle started to climb again. It's not exactly haute cuisine, but it's sustenance. And if you don't claim it now, it'll be gone as soon as the boy gets back. Gentle called his thanks back down the flight, picked up the bread, strawberries, and a bottle of beer waiting at the top, then returned to the meditation room, closing the door behind him. Perhaps because he was still preoccupied with what he'd heard from his mother's lips, the memories of Pi were not waiting at the threshold. The room was empty, a cell of the present. It wasn't until Gentle had set the candles on the mantelpiece and was lighting one of them that he heard the mistiff speaking softly behind him. Now I've distressed you, it said. Gentle turned into the room and found the mistiff at the window where it so often loitered with a look of deep concern on its face. I shouldn't have asked, Pye went on. It's just idle curiosity. I heard Abe Love asking the boy Lucius a day or two ago, and it made me wonder. What did Lucius say? He said he remembered being suckled. That was the first thing he could recall, the teat at his mouth. Only now did Gentle grasp the subject under debate here. Once again, his memory had found some fragment of conversation between himself and the mistiff pertinent to his present concerns. They talked of childhood memories in this very room, and the maestro had been plunged into the same distress which he felt now, and for the same reason. But to remember a story, Pye was saying, particularly one you didn't like, it wasn't that I didn't like it, the maestro said. At least it didn't frighten me the way a ghost story might have done. It was worse than that. We don't have to talk about this, Pi said, and for a moment Gentle thought the conversation was going to fizzle out there. He wasn't altogether certain he'd have minded if it had, but it seemed to have been one of the unwritten rules of this house that no inquiry was ever fled from, however discomforting. No, I want to explain if I can, the maestro said. 
though what a child fears is sometimes hard to fathom. Unless we can listen with a child's heart, Pi said. That's harder still. We can try, can't we? Tell me the story. Well, it always began the same way. My mother would say, I want you to remember, child, and I'd know right away what was going to follow. There was a woman called Nisi Nirvana, and she went into a city full of iniquities. Now Gentle heard the story again, this time from his own lips, told to the mystiff. The woman, the city, the crime, the child, and then, with a sickening inevitability, the story beginning again with the woman and the city and the crime. Rape isn't a very pretty subject for a nursery tale, Pi observed. She never used that word. But that's what the crime is, isn't it? Yes, he said softly, though he was uncomfortable with the admission. This was his mother's secret, his mother's pain. But yes, of course, Nisi Nirvana was Celestine, and the City of Terrors was the First Dominion. She told her child her own story, encoded in a grim little fable. But more bizarrely than that, she'd folded the listener into the tale, and even the telling of the tale itself, creating a circle impossible to break because all of its constituent elements were trapped inside. Was it that sense of entrapment that had so distressed him as a child? Pi had another theory, however, and was voicing it from across the years. No wonder you were so afraid, the mystiff said, not knowing what the crime was, but knowing it was terrible. I'm sure she meant no harm by it. But your imagination must have run riot. Gentle didn't reply, or rather, couldn't. For the first time in these conversations with Pi, he knew more than history did, and the discontinuity fractured the glass in which he'd been seeing the past. He felt a bitter sense of loss, adding to the distress he'd carried into this room. It was as though the tale of Nisi Nirvana marked the divide between the self who'd occupied these rooms two hundred years before, ignorant of his divinity, and the man he was now, who knew that the story of Nisi Nirvana was his mother's story, and the crime she told him about was the act that had brought him into being. There could be no more dallying in the past after this. He'd learned what he needed to know about the reconciliation, and he couldn't justify further loitering. It was time to leave the comfort of memory and pie with it. He picked up the bottle of beer and struck off the cap. It probably wasn't wise to be drinking alcohol at this juncture, but he wanted to toast the past before it faded from view entirely. There must have been a time, he thought, when he and Pi had raised a glass to the millennium. Could he conjure such a moment now and join his intention with the past one last time? He raised the bottle to his lips, and, as he drank, heard Pi laughing across the room. He looked in the mystiff's direction, and there, fading already, he caught a glimpse of his lover, not with a glass in hand, but a carafe, toasting the future. He lifted the beer bottle to touch the carafe, but the mystiff was fading too fast. Before past and present could share the toast, the vision was gone. It was time to begin. Downstairs, Monday was back, talking excitedly. Setting the bottle down on the mantelpiece, Gentle went out onto the landing to find out what all the furor was about. The boy was at the door, in the middle of describing the state of the city to Clem and Jude. He'd never seen a stranger Saturday night, he said. The streets were practically empty. The only thing that was moving was the traffic lights. At least we'll have an easy trip, Jude said. Are we going somewhere? She told him, and he was well pleased. I like it out in the country, he said. We can do what the fuck we like. Let's just make it back alive, she said. He's relying on us. No problem, Monday said cheerily. Then to Clem, look after the boss man, huh? If things get weird, we can always call on Irish and the rest. Did you tell them where we are, Clem said. 
They're not going to fetch up looking for a bed, don't worry, Monday said. But the way I reckon it, the more friends we got, the better. He turned to Jude. I'm ready when you are, he said, and headed back outside. This shouldn't take more than two or three hours, Jude told Clem. Look after yourself. And him. She glanced up at the stairs as she spoke, but the candles at the bottom threw too frail a light to reach the top, and she failed to see Gentle there. It was only when she'd gone from the step and the car was roaring away down the street that he made his presence known. Monday's come back, Clem said. I heard. Did he disturb you? I'm sorry. No, no. I was finished anyway. The night's so hot, Clem said gazing up at the sky. Why don't you sleep for a while? I can stand guard. Where's that bloody pet of yours? He's called Little Ease, Clem, and he's on the top floor keeping watch. I don't trust him, gentle. He'll do us no harm. Go and lie down. Have you finished with pie? I think I've learned what I can. Now I've got to check on the rest of the synod. How'll you do that? I'll leave my body upstairs and go travelling. That sounds dangerous. I've done it before. But my flesh and blood'll be vulnerable while I'm out of it. As soon as you're ready to go, wake me. I'll watch over you like a hawk. Have an hour's nap first. Clem picked up one of the candles and went to look for a place to lie down, leaving Gentle to take over his post at the front door. He sat on the step with his head laid against the door frame and enjoyed what little breeze the night could supply. There were no lamps working in the street. It was the light of the moon of the stars in array around it that picked out the details in the house opposite and caught the pale undersides of the leaves when the wind lifted them. Lulled, he fell into a doze and missed the shooting stars. 4. Oh, how beautiful, the girl said. She couldn't have been more than sixteen, and when she laughed, which her bow had made her do a lot tonight, she sounded even younger. But she wasn't laughing now. She was standing in the darkness staring up at the meteor shower while Sartori looked on admiringly. He'd found her three hours earlier, wandering through the midsummer fair on Hampstead Heath, and had easily charmed himself into her company. The fair was doing poor business with so few people out and about, so when the rides closed down, which they did at the first sign of dusk, he talked her into coming into the city with him. They'd buy some wine, he said, and wander, find a place to sit and talk and watch the stars. It was a long time since he'd indulged himself in a seduction. Judith had been another kind of challenge entirely, but the tricks of the trade came back readily enough and the satisfaction of watching her resistance crumble, plus the wine he imbibed, did much to assuage the pain of recent defeats. The girl, her name was Monica, was both lovely and compliant. She met his gaze only coyly at first, but that was all part of the game, and it contented him to play it for a while, as a diversion from the coming tragedy. Coy as she was, she didn't reject him when he suggested they take a stroll around the fields of demolished buildings at the back of Shiverick Square, though she made some remark about wanting him to treat her carefully. So he did. They walked together in the darkness until they found a spot where the undergrowth thinned and made a kind of grove. The sky was clear overhead, and she had a fine, swooning sight of the meteor shower. It always makes me feel a little bit afraid, she told him in a charmless cockney. Looking at the stars, I mean. Why's that? Well, we're so small, aren't we? He asked her earlier to tell him about her life, and she'd volunteered scraps of biography. First about a boy called Trevor, who'd said he loved her, but had gone off with her best friend. Then about her mother's collection of china frogs and how much she'd like to live in Spain because everybody was so much happier there. But now, without prompting, she told him she didn't care about Spain or Trevor or the China frogs. 
She was happy, she said, and the sight of the stars, which usually scared her, tonight made her want to fly, to which he said that they could indeed fly together, if she just said the word. At this she looked away from the sky with a resigned sigh. I know what you want, she said. You're all the same. Flying. Is that your fancy word for it, then? He said she'd misunderstood him completely. He hadn't brought her here to fumble and fuss with her. That was beneath them both. What, then? she said. He answered her with his hand, too swiftly to be contradicted. The second primal act after the one she'd thought he'd brought her here to perform. Her struggles were almost as resigned as her sigh, and she was dead on the ground in less than a minute. Overhead, the stars continued to fall in an abundance he remembered from this time two hundred years before. An unseasonal rain of heavenly bodies to presage the business of tomorrow night. He dismembered and disemboweled her with the greatest care, and laid the pieces around the grove in time-honoured fashion. There was no need to hurry. This working was better completed in the bleak moments before dawn, and they were still some hours away. When they came and the working was performed, he had high hopes for it. Godolphin's body had been cold when he'd used it, and its owner scarcely an innocent. The creatures he'd tempted from the Innovo with such unappetizing bait had therefore been primitive. Monica, on the other hand, was warm, and had not lived long enough to be much soiled. Her death would open a deeper crack in the Innovo than Godolphin's, and through it he hoped to draw a particular species of oviate uniquely suited for the work tomorrow would bring. A sleek, bitter-throated kind that would help him prove by tomorrow night what a child born to destruction could do. Chapter 53 After all that Monday had said about the state of the city, Jude had expected to find it completely deserted, but this proved not to be the case. In the time between his returning from the South Bank and their setting out for the estate, the streets of London, which were as devoid of romancing tourists and partiers as Monday had claimed, had become the territory of a third and altogether stranger tribe, that of men and women who had simply got up out of their beds and gone wandering. Almost all of them were alone, as though whatever unease had driven them out into the night was too painful to share with their loved ones. Some were dressed for a day at the office, suits and ties, skirts and sensible shoes. Others were wearing the minimum for decency, many barefoot, many more bare-chested. All wandered with the same languid gait, their eyes turned up to scan the sky. As far as Jude could see, the heavens had nothing untoward to show them. She caught sight of a few shooting stars, but that wasn't so unusual on a clear summer night. She could only assume that these people had in their heads the idea that revelation would come from on high, and, having woken with the irrational suspicion that such revelation was imminent, had gone out to look for it. The scene was not so different when they reached the suburbs. Ordinary men and women in their night clothes, standing at street corners, or on their front lawns, watching the sky. The phenomenon petered out, the farther from the centre of London. From Clerkenwell, perhaps, they travelled, only to reappear when they reached the outskirts of the village of Yoke, where, just a few days before, she and Gentle had stood soaked in the post office. Passing down the lanes they trudged in the rain reminded her of the naive ambition she'd returned into the fifth bearing, the possibility of some reunion between Gentle and herself. Now she was retracing her route with all such hopes dashed, carrying a child that belonged to his enemy. Her two hundred year courtship with Gentle was finally and irredeemably over. The undergrowth around the estate had swelled monstrously, and it took more than the switch Esterbrook had wielded to clear away to the gates. Despite the fact that it was flourishing, the greenery smelled rank, 
as if it was decaying as quickly as it was growing, and its buds would not be blossoms, but rot. Thrashing to left and right with his knife, Monday led the way to the gates and threw the corrugated iron into the park land beyond. Though it was an hour for moths and owls, the park was swarming with all manner of daylight life. Birds circled the air as though misdirected by a change in the poles and blind to their nests. Gnats, bees, dragonflies, and all the mazing species of a summer's day flitted in desperate confusion through the moonlit grass. Like the sky-gazers in the streets they'd passed through, nature sensed imminence and could not rest. Jude's own sense of direction served her well, however. Though the copses scattered ahead of them looked much the same in the blue-gray light, she fixed upon the retreat, and they trudged towards it, slowed by the muddy ground and the thickness of the grass. Monday whistled as he went, with that same blissful indifference to melody that Clem had remarked upon a few hours before. "'Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow?' Jude asked him, almost envious of his strange serenity. "'Yeah, sort of,' he said. "'There's these heavens, see, and the boss is going to let us go there. It's going to be amazing.' "'Aren't you afraid?' she said. "'What of?' Everything's going to change. Good, he said. I'm fucked off with the way things are. Then he picked up the thread of his whistle again and headed on through the grass for another hundred yards, until a sound more insistent than his din silenced him. Listen to that. The activity in the air and grass had steadily increased as they approached the copse. But with the wind blowing in the opposite direction, the din of such an assembly as was gathered there had not been audible until now. Birds and bees, Monday remarked, and a fuck of a lot of them. As they continued their advance, the scale of the parliament ahead steadily became more apparent. Though the moonlight did not pierce the foliage very deeply, it was clear that every branch of every tree around the retreat, to the tiniest twiglet, was occupied with birds. The smell of their massing pricked their nostrils, its din their ears. We're going to get our heads right royally shat on, Monday said. Either that, or we'll get stung to death. The insects were by now a living veil between them and the copse, so thick that they gave up attempting to flail it aside after a few strides and bore the deaths on their brows and cheeks, and the countless flutterings in their hair in order to pick up speed and dash for their destination. There were birds in the grass now, commoners among the parliament, denied a seat on the branches. They rose in a squawking cloud before the runners, and their alarm caused consternation in the trees. A thunderous ascent began the mass of life so vast that the violence of its motion beat the tender leaves down. By the time Jude and Monday reached the corner of the copse, they were running through a double rain, one green and falling, the other rising and feathered. Picking up her pace, Jude overtook Monday and headed around the retreat, the walls of which were black with insects, to the door. At the threshold she halted. There was a small fire burning inside, built close to the edge of the mosaic. Some bugger got here first, Monday remarked. I don't see anyone. He pointed to a bundle lying on the floor beyond the fire. His eyes, more accustomed than hers to seeing life in rags, had found the fire maker. She stepped into the retreat, knowing before he raised his head who this creature was. How could she not? Three times before, once here, once in his Isordorex, and once, most recently, in the Tabula Rasa's tower, this man had made an unexpected arrival, as though to prove what he'd claimed not so long ago, that their lives would be perpetually interwoven, because they were the same. Dowd? He didn't move. Knife, she said to Monday. He passed it over, and, armed, she advanced across the retreat towards the bundle. Dowd's hands were crossed on his chest as though he expected to expire where he lay. His eyes were closed, but they were the only part of his face that was. 
Almost every other inch had been laid open by Celestine's assault, and despite his legendary powers of recuperation, he'd been unable to make good the damage done. He was unmasked to the bone. Yet he breathed, albeit weakly, and moaned to himself now and then, as though dreaming of punishment or revenge. She was half tempted to kill him in his sleep and have this bitter business brought to an end on the spot. But she was curious to know why he was here. Had he attempted to return to his Isordorex and failed, or was he expecting someone to come back this way and meet him here? Either could be significant in these volatile times, and though in her present venomous state she felt perfectly capable of dispatching him, he'd always been an agent in the dealings of greater souls, and might still have some fragment of use as a messenger. She went down on her haunches beside him and spoke his name above the din of birds coming back to roost on the roof. He opened his eyes, only slowly, adding their glisten to the wetness of his features. Look at you, he said. You're radiant, lovey. It was a line from a boulevard comedy, and despite his wretched condition he spoke it with élan. I, of course, look like Ordia. Will you come closer to me? I don't have the energy for volume. She hesitated to comply. Though he was on the verge of extinction, he had boundless capacity for malice in him, and, with the pivot sloughing still fixed in his flesh, the power to do harm. I can hear you perfectly well where I am, she said. I'm good for a hundred words at this volume, he bargained, twice that at a whisper. What have we got left to say to each other? Ah, he said, so much. You think you've heard everybody's stories, don't you? Mine, Sartori's, Godolphin's, even the Reconcilers by now. But you're missing one. Oh, am I? she said, not much caring. Whose is that? Come closer. I'll hear it from here or not at all. He looked at her beadily. You're a bitch, you really are. And you're wasting words. If you've got something to say, say it. Whose story am I missing? He bided his time before replying to squeeze what little drama he could out of this. Finally, he said, The father's. What father? Is there more than one? Hapeximendios, the aboriginal, the unbeheld, he of the first dominion. You don't know that story, she said. He reached up with sudden speed, and his hand was clamped around her arm before she could move out of range. Monday saw the attack and came running, but she halted him before he ploughed into Dowd and sent him back to sit by the fire. It's all right, she told him. He's not going to hurt me. Are you? She studied Dowd. Well, are you? She said again. You can't afford to lose me. I'm the last audience you'll have, and you know it. If you don't tell this story to me, you're not going to tell it to anybody. Not this side of hell. The man quietly conceded her point. True, he said. So tell. Unburden yourself. He drew a laborious breath. Then he began. I saw him once, you know, he said. The father of the Imagica. He came to me in the desert. He appeared in person, did he? She said, her scepticism plain. Not exactly. I heard him speaking out of the first. But I saw hints, you know, in the erasure. And what did he look like? Like a man, from what I could see. Or what you imagined. Maybe I did, Dowd said, but I didn't imagine what he told me. That he'd raise you up, make you his procurer. You've told me all this before, Dowd. Not all of it, he said. When I'd seen him, I came back to the fifth, using fates he'd whispered to me to cross the Innovo 
and I searched the length and breadth of London for a woman to be blessed among women. And you found Celestine? Yes, I found Celestine. At Tyburn, as a matter of fact, watching a hanging. I don't know why I chose her. Perhaps because she laughed so hard when the man kissed the noose, and I thought, she's no sentimentalist, this woman. She won't weep and wail if she's taken into another dominion. She wasn't beautiful even then, but she had a clarity, you know. Some actresses have it. The great ones, anyway. A face that could carry extremes of emotion and not look pathetic. Maybe I was a little infatuated with her, he shivered. I was capable of that when I was younger. So, I made myself known to her and told her I wanted to show her a living dream the like of which she'd never forget. She resisted at first, but I could have talked the face off the moon in those days, and she let me drug her with sways and take her away. It was a hell of a journey. Four months across the dominions. But I got her there eventually, back to the Erasia. And what happened? It opened. And? I saw the city of God. Here at least was something she wanted to know about. What was it like? she said. It was just a glimpse. Having denied him her proximity for so long, she leaned towards him and repeated her question inches from his ravaged face. What was it like? Vast and gleaming and exquisite. Gold, all colours. But it was just a glimpse. Then the wall seemed to burst and something reached for Celestine and took her. Did you see what it was? I've tried to remember. Over and over. Sometimes I think it was like a net, sometimes like a cloud. I don't know. Whatever it was, it took her. You tried to help her, of course, Jude said. No, I shat my pants and crawled away. What could I do? She belonged to God, and in the long run, wasn't she the lucky one? Abducted and raped. Abducted, raped, and made a little divine. Whereas I, who'd done all the work, what was I? A pimp. Yes, a pimp. Anyway, she's had her revenge, he said sourly. Look at me. She's had more than enough. That was true. The life both Oscar and Quesua had failed to extinguish in Dowd, Celestine had virtually put out. So that's the father's tale? Jude said. I've heard most of it before. That's the tale. But what's the moral? You tell me. He shook his head slightly. I don't know whether you're mocking or not. I'm listening, aren't I? Be grateful for small mercies. You could be lying here without an audience. Well, that's part of it, isn't it? I'm not. You could have come here when I was dead. You could maybe not have come here at all. But our lives have collided one last time. That's fate's way of telling me to unburden myself. Of what? I'll tell you. Again, a laboured breath. All these years I've wondered. Why did God pluck a scabby little actor chappy up out of the dirt and send him across three dominions to fetch him a woman? He wanted a reconciler. And he couldn't find a wife in his own city, Dowd said. Isn't that a little odd? Besides, why does he care whether the Imagicas reconciled or not? Now that was a good question, she thought. Here was a god who'd sealed himself away in his own city and showed no desire to lower the wall between his dominion and the rest, yet went to immense lengths to breed a child who would bring all such walls tumbling down. It's certainly strange, she said. I'd say so. Have you got any answers to any of this? Not really. But I think he must have some purpose, don't you, or why go to all this trouble? A plot. Gods don't plot. They create. They protect. They proscribe. So which is he doing? 
That's the nub of it. Maybe you can find out. Maybe the other reconcilers already did. The others? The sons he sent before Sartori. Maybe they realized what he was up to and they defied him. There was a thought. Maybe Christos didn't die saving mortal man from his sins. But from his father? Yes. She thought of the scenes she'd glimpsed in the Boston Bowl, the terrible spectacle of the city and most likely the dominion overwhelmed by a great darkness, and her body, that had been driven to fits and convulsions by the torments visited upon her, grew suddenly still. There was no panic, no frenzy, just a deep, cold dread. What do I do? I don't know, lovey. You're free to do whatever you like, remember? A few hours before, sitting on the step with Clem, her lack of a place in the gospel of reconciliation had depressed her spirits, but now it seemed that fact offered her some frail thread of hope. As Dowd had been so eager to claim at the tower, she belonged to no one. The Godolphins were dead, and so was Quaiswa. Gentle had gone to walk in the footsteps of Christos, and Sartori was either out building his new Isordrex or digging a hole to die in. She was on her own, and in a world in which everyone else was blinded by obsession and obligation, that was a significant condition. Perhaps only she could see this story remotely now and make a judgment unswayed by fealty. This is some choice, she said. Perhaps you'd better forget I even spoke, lovey, Dowd said. His voice was becoming frailer by the phrase, but he preserved as best he could his jaunty tone. It's just gossip from an actor, chappie. If I try and stop the reconciliation, you'll be flying in the face of the Father, the Son, and probably the Holy Ghost as well. And if I don't, you take the responsibility for whatever happens. Why? Because... The power in his voice was now so diminished the sound of the fire he'd built was louder. Because I think only you can stop it. As he spoke, his hand lost its grip on her arm. Well, he said, that's done. His eyes began to flicker closed. One last thing, lovey, he said. Yes, it's maybe asking too much. What is? I wonder, could you forgive me? I know it's absurd, but I don't want to die with you despising me. She thought of the cruel scene he'd played with Quaiswa when her sister had asked for some kindness. While she hesitated, he began whispering again. We were... Just a little the same, you know. At this, she put out her hand to touch him and offer what comfort she could, but before her fingers reached him, his breath stopped and his eyes flickered closed. Jude let out a tiny moan. Against all reason, she felt a pang of loss at Dowd's passing. Is something wrong? Monday said. She stood up. That rather depends on your point of view, she said, borrowing an air of comedic fatalism from the man at her feet. It was a tone worth rehearsing. She might need it quite a bit in the next few hours. Can you spare a cigarette? she asked Monday. Monday fished out his pack and lobbed it over. She took one and threw the pack back as she returned to the fire, stooping to pluck up a burning twig to light the tobacco. What happened to Fella, my lad? He's dead. So what do we do now? What indeed? If ever a road divided, it was here. Should she prevent the reconciliation? It wouldn't be difficult. The stones were at her feet. And let history call her a destroyer for doing so? Or should she let it proceed and risk an end to all histories, and futures too? How long did its light? she asked Monday. 
The watch he was wearing had been part of the booty he'd brought back to Gamut Street on his first trip. He consulted it with a flourish. Two and a half hours, he said. There was so little time to act and littler still to decide on a course. Returning to Clerkenwell with Monday was a cul-de-sac. That at least was certain. Gentle was the unbeheld's agent in this, and he wasn't going to be diverted from his father's business now, especially on the word of a man like Dowd, who'd spent his life a stranger to truth. He'd argued that this confession had been Dowd's revenge on the living, a last desperate attempt to spoil a glory he knew he couldn't share. And maybe that was true. Maybe she'd been duped. Are we going to collect these stones or what? Monday said. I think we have to, she said, still musing. What are they for? They're like stepping stones, she said, her voice losing momentum as a thought distracted her. Indeed, they were stepping stones. They were away back to Isordorex, which suddenly seemed like an open road along which she might yet find some guidance in these last hours to help her make a choice. She threw her cigarette down into the embers. You're going to have to take the stones back to Gamut Street on your own, Monday. Where are you going? To his order, X. Why? It's too complicated to explain. You just have to swear to me that you'll do exactly as I tell you. I'm ready, he said. All right, so listen up. When I'm gone, I want you to take the stones back to Gamut Street and carry a message along with them. It has to go to Gentle personally, you understand? Don't trust anybody else with it, even Clem. I understand, Monday said, beaming with pleasure at this unlooked-for honour. What have I got to tell him? Where I've gone, for one thing. Is order X. That's right. Then tell him. She pondered for a moment. Tell him the reconciliation isn't safe and he mustn't start the working until I contact him again. It isn't safe, and he mustn't start the working until I contact him again. I've got that. Is there any more? That's it, she said. Now all I've got to do is find the circle. She started to scan the mosaic, looking for the subtle differences in tone that marked the stones. From past experience, she knew that once they'd been lifted from their niches, the Exordorexian Express would be underway, so she told Monday to wait outside until she'd gone. He looked worried now, but she told him she'd come to no harm. It's not that, he said. I want to know what the message means. If you're telling the boss it's not safe, does that mean he won't open the Dominions? I don't know. But I want to see Pata Shokwa and Limbi and Isordorex, he said, listing the places like charms. I know that, she said, and believe me, I want the Dominions open just as much as you do. She studied his face in the dying firelight, looking for some clue as to whether he was being placated, but for all his youth he was a master of concealment. She'd have to trust that he'd put his duties as a messenger above his desire to see the Imagica and relay the spirit of her warning, if not its precise text. You've got to make Gentle understand the danger he's in, she said, hoping this tack would make him conscientious. I will, he said, now faintly irritated by her insistence. She let the subject lie and returned to the business of finding the stones. He didn't offer his assistance, but retreated to the door, from which he said, How will you get back? She'd found four of the stones already, and the birds on the roof had set up a fresh cacophony, suggesting that they felt some tremor of change below. I'll deal with that problem when I get to it, she replied. The birds suddenly rose up, and, unnerved, Monday stepped out of the retreat altogether. Jude glanced up at him as she dug out another stone. The fire between them had already been fanned into flame, and now its ashes were stirred up, rising in a smutty cloud to hide the door from view. She scanned the mosaic, checking to see if she'd missed a stone, but the itches and aches she remembered from her first crossing were already creeping through her body, proof that the passing place was about its work. 
Oscar had told her, on this very spot, that the discomforts of passage diminished with repetition, and his words proved correct. She had time, as the walls blurred around her, to glimpse the door through the swirling ash and realise all too late that she should have looked out at the world one last time before leaving it. Then the retreat disappeared, and the in ovo's delirium was oppressing her, its prisoners rising in their legions to claim her. Travelling alone, she went more quickly than she had with Oscar, at least that was her impression, and she was out the other side before the Oviates had time to sniff the heels of her glyph. The walls of the merchant peckable cellar were brighter than she remembered them. The reason? A lamp, which burned on the floor a yard from the circle, and beyond it a figure, its face a blur, which came at her with a bludgeon and laid her unconscious on the floor before she'd uttered a word of explanation. Chapter 54 1. The mantle of night was falling on the Fifth Dominion, and Gentle found Tick Raw near the summit of the Mount of Lippabayak, watching the last dusky colours of day drop from the sky. He was eating while he did so, a bowl each of sausage and pickle between his feet, and a large pot of mustard between these, into which meat and vegetable alike were plunged. Though Gentle had come here as a projection, his body left sitting cross-legged in the meditation room in Gamut Street. He didn't need nose or palate to appreciate the piquancy of Raw's meal. Imagination sufficed. He looked up when Gentle approached, unperturbed by the phantom watching him eat. You're early, aren't you? he remarked, glancing at his pocket watch which hung from his coat on a piece of string. We've got hours yet. I know. I just came to check up on me. Tick Raw said, the sting of pickle in his voice. Well, I'm here. Are you ready in the fifth? We're getting there, Gentle said somewhat queasily. Though he'd travelled this way countless times as the maestro Sartori, his mind empowered by fates carrying his image and his voice across the dominions, and had reacquainted himself with the technique easily enough, the sensation was damn strange. What do I look like? he asked Tick Raw, remembering as he spoke how he'd attempted to describe the mystiff on these very slopes. Insubstantial, Tick Raw replied, squinting up at him, then returning to his meal. Which is fine by me, because there's not enough sausage for two. I'm still getting used to what I'm capable of. Well, don't take too long about it, Tick Raw said. We've got work to do. And I should have realised that you were part of that work when I was first here, but I didn't, and for that I apologise. Accepted, Tick Raw said. You must have thought I was crazy. You certainly... How shall I put this? You certainly confounded me. It took me days to work out why you were so damn obstreperous. Pi talked to me, you know, tried to make me understand but I'd been waiting for somebody to come from the fifth for so long I was only listening with half an ear. I think Pi probably hoped my meeting with you would make me remember who the hell I was. How long did it take? Months? Was it the mischief who hid you from yourself in the first place? Yes, of course. Well, it did too good a job. That'll teach it. Where's your flesh and blood, by the way? Back in the fifth. Take my advice. Don't leave it too long. I find the bowels mutiny, and you come back to find you're sitting in shite. Of course, that could be a personal weakness. He selected another sausage and chewed on it, as he asked Gentle why the hell he'd let the mischief make him forget. I was a coward, Gentle replied. I couldn't face my failure. It's hard, Tick Raw said. I've lived all these years wondering if I could have saved my maestro Utamuski if I'd been quicker-witted. I still miss him. I'm responsible for what happened to him, and I've no excuses. We've all got our frailties, maestro. My bowels, your cowardice. None of us is perfect. But I presume your being here means we're finally going to have another try. That's my intention, yes. Again, Tick Raw looked at his watch, doing a mute calculation as he chewed. Twenty of your fifth dominion hours from now, or thereabouts. That's right. Well, 
You'll find me ready, he said, consuming a sizable pickle in one bite. Do you have anyone to help you? His mouthful, all Tick could manage, was, Aunt Eden. He chewed on, then swallowed. Nobody even knows I'm here, he explained. I'm still wanted by the law, even though I hear his Audrex is in ruins. It's true. I also hear the pivot's quite transformed, Tick Raw said. Is that right? Into what? Nobody can get near enough to find out, he replied. But if you're planning to check on the whole synod... I am. Then maybe you'll see for yourself while you're in the city. There was a Yehetamek representing the second, if I remember. He's dead. So who's there now? I'm hoping Scopeek's found someone. He's in the third, isn't he? At the pivot pit? That's right. And who's at the erasure? A man called Chicka Jackeen. I've never heard of him, Tickraw said. Which is odd. I get to hear about most maestros. Are you sure he's a maestro? Certainly. Tickraw shrugged. I'll meet him in the Arna, then. And don't worry about me, Sartori. I'll be here. I'm glad we've made our peace. I fight over food and women, but never metaphysics, Tickraw said. Besides, we've joined in a great mission. This time tomorrow, you'll be able to walk home from here. Their exchange ended on that optimistic note, and Gentle left Tick to his night watch, heading with a thought towards the Quem, where he hoped to find Scopeek keeping his place beside the site of the pivot. He would have been there in the time it took to think himself over the border between dominions, but he allowed his journey to be diverted by memory. His thoughts turned to Beatrix as he left the Mount of Lipabayak, and it was there rather than the Quem his spirit flew to, arriving on the outskirts of the village. It was night here too, of course. Doeki lowed softly on the dark slopes around him, their neck bells tinkling. Beatrix itself was silent, however, the lamps that had flickered in the groves around the houses gone, and the children who tended them gone too, all extinguished. Distressed by this melancholy sight, Gentle almost fled the village there and then, but that he glimpsed a single light in the distance, and advancing a little way saw a figure he recognised crossing the street, his lamp held high. It was Coaxial Tasco, the hermit of the hill, who'd granted Pie and Gentle the means to dare the joker Lelau. Tasco paused, halfway across the street and raised his lamp, peering out into the darkness. Is somebody there? he asked. Gentle wanted to speak, to make his peace, as he had with Tick Raw, and to talk about the promise of tomorrow, but the expression on Tasco's face forbade him. The hermit wouldn't thank him for apologies, Gentle thought, or for talk of a bright new day. Not when there were so many who'd never see it. If Tasco had some inkling of his visitor, he also judged a meeting pointless. He simply shuddered, lowered his lamp, and moved on about his business. Gentle didn't linger another minute, but turned his face up towards the mountains and thought himself away, not just from Beatrix, but from the Dominion. The village vanished, and the dusty daylight of the Quem appeared around him. Of the four sites where he hoped to find his fellow maestros, the Mount, the Quem, the Yohetemek Kesperate, and the Eurasia, this was the only one he hadn't visited in his travels with Pi, and he'd been prepared to have some difficulty locating the spot. But Scopeek's presence was a beacon in this wasteland. Though the wind raised blinding clouds of dust, he found the man within a few moments of his arrival, squatting in the shelter of a primitive blind, constructed from a few blankets hung on poles which were stuck in the grey earth. Uncomfortable though it was, Scopeek had suffered worse privations in his life as a seditionist, not least his incarceration in the Maison de Sante, and when he rose to meet Gentle it was with the brio of a fit and contented man. He was dressed immaculately in a three-piece suit and bow tie, and his face, despite the peculiarity of his features, the nose that was barely two holes in his head, the popping eyes, was much less pinched than it had been, his cheeks made florid by the gritty wind. Like Tick Raw, he was expecting his visitor. 
Come in, come in, he said. Not that you're feeling the wind much, eh? Though this was true, the wind blew through gentle in the most curious way, eddying around his navel. He joined Scopeek in the lee of his blankets, and there they sat down to talk. As ever, Scopeek had a good deal to say, and poured his tales and observations out in a seamless monologue. He was ready, he said, to represent this dominion in the sacred space of the Arna, though he wondered how the equilibrium of the working would be affected by the absence of the pivot. It had been set at the centre of the five dominions, he reminded Gentle, to be a conduit, and perhaps an interpreter, of power through the Imagica. Now it was gone, and the third was undoubtedly the weaker for its removal. Look, he said, standing up and leading his phantom visitor out to the tip of the pit. I'm left conjuring beside a hole in the ground. And you think that'll affect the working? Who knows? We're all amateurs pretending to be experts. All I can do is cleanse the place of its previous occupant and hope for the best. He directed Gentle's attention away from the pit to the smoking shell of a sizable building which was only occasionally visible through the dust. What was that? Gentle asked. The bastard's palace. And who destroyed it? I did, of course, Scopeek said. I didn't want his handiwork looming over our working. This is going to be a delicate operation as it is, without his filthy influence fucking it up. It looked like a bordello. He turned his back on it. We should have had months to prepare for this, not hours. I realise that. And then there's the problem of the second. You know Pi charged me with finding a replacement. I'd have liked to discuss all of this with you, of course, but when we last met you were in a fugue state and Pi forbade me to acquaint you with who you were, though. May I be honest? Could I stop you? No. I was sorely tempted to slap you out of it. Scopeek looked at Gentle fiercely, as though he might have done so now if Gentle had been material enough. You caused the mischief so much grief, you know, he said and like a damned fool it loved you anyway. I have my reasons, Gentle said softly. But you were talking about this replacement. Ah, yes, Athanasius. Athanasius? He's now our man in his orderex, representing the second. Don't look so appalled. He knows the ceremony, and he's completely committed to it. There's not a sane bone in his body, Scopeek. He thought I was Hapexamendius' agent. Well, of course, that's nonsense. He tried to kill me with Madonnas. He's crazy. We've all had our moments, Sartori. Don't call me that. Athanasius is one of the most holy men I've ever met. How can he believe in the Holy Mother one moment and claim he's Jesus the next? He can believe in his own mother, can't he? Are you seriously saying... That Athanasius is literally the resurrected Christos? No. If we have to have a messiah among us, I vote for you. He sighed. Look, I realise you have difficulties with Athanasius, but I ask you, who else was I to find? There aren't that many maestros left, Sartori. I told you, yes, yes, you don't like the name. Well, forgive me, but for as long as I live, you'll be the maestro Sartori. And if you want to find somebody else to sit here instead of me, who will call you something prettier, find him. Were well, you always this bloody-minded? Gentle replied. No, said Scopeek. It's taken years of practice. Gentle shook his head in despair. Athanasius, it's a nightmare. Don't be so sure he hasn't got the spirit of Jeju in him, by the way, Scopeek said. Stranger things have been known. Any more of this, Gentle said, and I'll be as crazy as he is. Athanasius, this is a disaster. Furious, he left Scopeek at the blind and moved off through the dust, trailing imprecations as he went, the optimism with which he'd set out on his journey severely bruised. Rather than appear in front of Athanasius with his thoughts so chaotic, he found a spot on the Lenten Way to ponder. The situation was far from encouraging. 
Tick Raw was holding his position on the mount as an outlaw, still in danger of arrest. Scopeek was in doubt as to the efficacy of his place now that the pivot had been removed. And now, of all people to join the Synod, Athanasius, a man without the wit to come out of the rain. Oh, God, Pie, gentle murmured to himself, I need you now. The wind blew mournfully along the highway as he loitered, gusting towards the place of passage between the third and second dominions, as if to usher him with it on towards his orderex. But he resisted its coaxing, taking time to examine the options available to him. There were, he decided, three. One, to abandon the reconciliation right away, before the frailties he saw in the system were compounded and brought on another tragedy. Two, to find a maestro who could replace Athanasius. Three, to trust Scopeek's judgment and go into his orderex to make his peace with the man. The first of these options was not to be seriously countenanced. This was his father's business, and he had a sacred duty to perform it. The second, the finding of a replacement for Athanasius, was impractical in the time remaining, which left the third. It was unpalatable, but it seemed to be unavoidable he'd have to accept Athanasius into the Synod. The decision made, he succumbed to the message of the gusts, and at a thought went with them along the straight road, through the gap between the dominions, and across the delta into the city god's entrails. 2. Hoi polloi? Peckable's daughter had put down her bludgeon and was kneeling beside Jude with tears pouring from her crossed eyes. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, she kept saying. I didn't know, I didn't know. Jude sat up. A team of bell ringers was tuning up between her temples, but she was otherwise unharmed. What are you doing here? she asked Hoy Polloi. I thought you'd gone with your father. I did, she explained, fighting the tears. But I lost him at the causeway. There were so many people trying to find a way over. One minute he was beside me, and the next he'd vanished. I stayed there for hours looking for him. Then I thought he'd be bound to come back here to the house, so I came back too. But he wasn't here. No. She started to sob again, and Jude put her arms around her, murmuring condolences. I'm sure he's still alive, Hoy Polloi said. He's just being sensible and staying under cover. It's not safe out there. She cast a nervous glance up towards the cellar roof. If he doesn't come back after a few days, maybe you can take me to the fifth and he can follow. It's no safer there than it is here, believe me. What's happening to the world? Hoy Polloi wanted to know. It's changing, Jude said, and we have to be ready for the changes, however strange they are. I just want things the way they were. Popper and the business and everything in its place. Tulips on the dining room table? Yes. It's not going to be that way for quite a while, Jude said. In fact, I'm not sure it'll ever be that way again. She got to her feet. Where are you going? Hoy Polloi said. You can't leave. I'm afraid I've got to. I came here to work. If you want to come with me, you're welcome, but you'll have to be responsible for yourself. Hoy Polloi sniffed hard. I understand, she said. Will you come? I don't want to be alone, she replied. I'll come. Jude had been prepared for the scenes of devastation awaiting them beyond the door of Peckable's house, but not for the sense of rapture that accompanied them. Though there were sounds of lamentation rising from somewhere nearby, and that grief was doubtless being echoed in innumerable houses across the city, there was another message on the balmy noonday air. What are you smiling at? Hoy Polloi asked her. She hadn't been aware she was doing so until the girl pointed it out. I suppose because it feels like a new day, she said, aware as she spoke that it was also very possibly the last. Perhaps this brightness in the city's air was its acknowledgement of that, the final remission of a sickened soul before decline and collapse. She voiced none of this to Hoy Polloi, of course. The girl was already terrified enough. She walked a step behind Jude as they climbed the street, her fretful murmurs punctuated by hiccups. 
Her distress would have been profounder still if she'd been able to sense the confusion in Jude, who had no clue, now that she was here, as to where to find the instruction she'd come in search of. The city was no longer a labyrinth of enchantments, if indeed it had ever been that. It was a virtual wasteland, its countless fires now guttering out but leaving a pall overhead. The comet's light pierced these grimy skirts in several places, however, and where its beams fell one colour from the air, like fragments of stained glass shimmering in solution above the griefs below. Having no better place to head for, Jude directed them towards the nearest of these spots, which was no more than half a mile away. Long before they'd reached the place, a faint drizzle was carried their way by the breeze, and the sound of running water announced the phenomenon's source. The street had cracked open, and either a burst water main or a spring was bubbling up from the tarmac. The sight had brought a number of spectators from the ruins, though very few were venturing close to the water, their fear not of the uncertain ground, but of something far stranger. The water issuing from the crack was not running away down the hill, but up it, leaping the steps that occasionally broke the slope with a salmon zeal. The only witnesses unafraid of this mystery were the children, several of whom had wrested themselves from their parents' grip and were playing in the law-defying stream, some running in it, others sitting in the water to let it play over their legs. In the little shrieks they uttered, Jude was sure she heard a note of sexual pleasure. What is this? Hoy Polloy said, her tone more offended than astonished, as though the sight had been laid on as a personal affront to her. Why don't we follow it and find out? Jude replied. Those children are going to drown, Hoy Polloy observed, somewhat primly. In two inches of water? Don't be ridiculous. With this, Jude set off leaving Hoy Polloy to follow if she so wished. She apparently did, because she once again fell into step behind Jude, her hiccups now abated, and they climbed in silence until two hundred yards or more from where they'd first encountered the stream, a second appeared, this from another direction entirely and large enough to carry a light freight from the lower slopes. The bulk of the cargo was debris, items of clothing, a few drowned graviolants, some slices of burned bread. But among this trash were objects clearly set upon the stream to be carried wherever it was going. Boat missives of carefully folded paper, small wreaths of woven grass set with tiny flowers, a doll laid on a little flood in a shroud of ribbons. Jude plucked one of the paper boats out of the water and unfolded it. The writing inside was smeared but legible. Tisha Lule, the letter read. My name is Simara Sekeo. I send this prayer for my mother and for my father and for my brother Boem, who is dead. I have seen you in dreams, Tisha Lule, and know you are good. You are in my heart. Please be also in the hearts of my mother and father and give them your comfort. Jude passed the letter over to Hoy Polloy, her gaze following the course of the married streams. Who's Tisha Lule? she asked. Hoy Polloy didn't reply. Jude glanced around at her to find that the girl was staring up the hill. Tisha Lule? Jude said again. She's a goddess, Hoy Polloy replied, her voice lowered although there was nobody within earshot. She dropped the letter onto the ground as she spoke, but Jude stooped to pick it up. We should be careful of people's prayers, she said, refolding the boat and letting it return to its voyage. She'll never get it, Hoy Polloy said. She doesn't exist. Yet you refuse to say her name out loud. We're not supposed to name any of the goddesses. Papa taught us that. It's forbidden. There are others, then? Oh, yes. There's the Sisters of the Delta, and Papa said there's even one called Joker Lelau who lived in the mountains. Where does Tishalule come from? The Cradle of Chisersumit, I think. I'm not sure. The Cradle of what? It's a lake in the Third Dominion. This time Jude knew she was smiling. Rivers, snows, and lakes, she said.
going down on her haunches beside the stream and putting her fingers into it. They've come in the waters, hoi polloi. Who have? The stream was cool and played against Jude's fingers, leaping up against her palm. Don't be obtuse, she said. The goddesses. They're here. That's impossible. Even if they still existed, and Poppy told me they don't, why would they come here? Jude lifted a cupped handful of water to her lips and supped. It tasted sweet. Perhaps somebody called them, she said. She looked at Hoi Polloi, whose face was still registering her distaste at what Jude had just done. Somebody up there, the girl said. Well, it takes a lot of effort to climb a hill, Jude said. Especially for water. It's not heading up there because it likes the view. Somebody's pulling it. And if we go with it, sooner or later... I don't think we should do that, Hoi Polloi replied. It's not just the water that's being called, Jude said. We are, too. Can't you feel it? No, the girl said bluntly. I could turn around now and go back home. Is that what you want to do? Hoi Polloi looked at the river running a yard from her foot. As luck would have it, the water was carrying some of its less lovely cargo past them, a flotilla of chicken heads and the partially incinerated carcass of a small dog. You drank that, Hoi Polloi said. It tasted fine, Jude said, but looked away as the dog went by. The sight had confirmed Hoi Polloi in her unease. I think I will go home, she said. I'm not ready to meet goddesses even if they are up there. I've sinned too much. That's absurd, said Jude. This isn't about sin and forgiveness. That kind of nonsense is for the men. This is... She faltered, uncertain of the vocabulary, then said, This is wiser than that. How do you know? Hoi Polloi replied. Nobody really understands these things. Even Papa. He used to tell me he knew how the comet was made, but he didn't. It's the same with you and these goddesses. Why are you so afraid? If I wasn't, I'd be dead, and don't condescend to me. I know you think I'm ridiculous, but if you were a bit politer, you'd hide it. I don't think you're ridiculous. Yes, you do. No, I just think you loved your papa a little too much. There's no crime in that. Believe me, I've made the same mistake myself over and over again. You trust a man, and the next thing... She sighed, shaking her head. Never mind. Maybe you're right. Maybe you should go home. Who knows? Perhaps he'll be waiting for you. What do I know? They turned their backs on each other without further word, and Jude headed on up the hill, wishing as she went that she'd found a more tactful way of stating her case. She'd climbed fifty yards when she heard the soft pad of Hoi Polloi's step behind her. Then the girl's voice, its rebuking tone gone, saying, Papa's not going to come home, is he? Jude turned back, meeting Hoi Polloi's cross-eyed gaze as best she could. No, she said. I don't think he is. Hoi Polloi looked at the cracked ground beneath her feet. I think I've always known that, she said. But I just haven't been able to admit it. Now she looked up again, and, contrary to Jude's expectation, was dry-eyed. Indeed, she almost looked happy, as though she was lighter for this admission. We're both alone now, aren't we? she said. Yes, we are. So maybe we should go on together, for both our sakes. Thank you for thinking of me, Jude said. We women should stick together, Hoi Polloi replied and came to join Jude as she resumed the climb. 3. To Gentle's eye, Isorderex looked like a fever dream of itself. A dark borealis hung above the palace, but the streets and squares were everywhere visited by wonders. Rivers sprang from the fractured pavements and danced up the mountainside, spitting their climb in gravity's face. A nimbus of colour painted the air over each of the springing places, bright as a flock of parrots. 
It was a spectacle he knew Pi would have reveled in, and he made a mental note of every strangeness along the way, so that he could paint the scene in words when he was back at the mischief's side. But it wasn't all wonders. These prisms and waters rose amid scenes of utter devastation, where keening widows sat, barely distinguishable from the blackened rubble of their houses. Only the Yohetemek Kesperate, at the gates of which he presently stood, seemed to be untouched by the fire raisers. There was no sign of any inhabitant, however, and Gentle wandered for several minutes, silently honing a fresh set of insults for Scopeek, when he caught sight of the man he'd come to find. Athanasius was standing in front of one of the trees that lined the boulevards of the Kesperate, staring up at it admiringly. Though the foliage was still in place, the arrangement of branches it grew upon was visible, and Gentle didn't have to be an aspirant Christos to see how readily a body might be nailed to them. He called Athanasius's name several times as he approached, but the man seemed lost in reverie and didn't look around, even when Gentle was at his shoulder. He did, however, reply. You came not a moment too soon, he said. Auto-crucifixion, Gentle replied. Now that would be a miracle. Athanasius turned to him. His face was sallow and his forehead bloody. He looked at the scabs on Gentle's brow and shook his head. Two of a kind, he said. Then he raised his hands. The palms bore unmistakable marks. Have you got these, too? No. And these, Gentle pointed to his forehead, aren't what you think. Why do you do this to yourself? I didn't do it, Athanasius replied. I woke up with these wounds. Believe me, I don't welcome them. Gentle's face registered his scepticism, and Athanasius responded with vim. I've never wanted any of this, he said. Not the stigmata, not the dreams. So why were you looking at the tree? I'm hungry, came the reply, and I was wondering if I had the strength to climb. The gaze directed Gentle's attention back to the tree. Amid the foliage on the higher branches were clusters of comet-ripened fruit, like zebra tangerines. I can't help you, I'm afraid, Gentle said. I don't have enough substance to catch hold of them. Can't you shake them down? I tried. Never mind, we've got more important business than my belly. Finding you bandages for one. Gentle said, his suspicions chastened out of him by this misunderstanding, at least for the moment. I don't want you bleeding to death before we begin the reconciliation. You mean these? he said, looking at his hands. No, it stops and starts whenever it wants. I'm used to it. Well then, we should at least find you something to eat. Have you tried any of the houses? I'm not a thief. I don't think anybody's coming back, Athanasius. Let's find you some sustenance before you pass out. They went to the nearest house, and after a little encouragement from Gentle, who was surprised to find such moral nicety in his companion, Athanasius kicked open the door. The house had either been looted or vacated in haste, but the kitchen had been left untouched and was well stocked. There, Athanasius daintily prepared himself a sandwich with his wounded hands, bloodying the bread as he did so. I've such a hunger on me, he said. I suppose you've been fasting, have you? No, was I supposed to? Each to their own, Athanasius replied. Everybody walks to heaven by a different road. I knew a man who couldn't pray unless he had his loins in a zazi nest. Gentle winced. That's not religion, it's masochism. A masochism isn't a religion, the other replied. You surprise me. Gentle was startled to find that Athanasius had a capacity for wit and found himself warming to the man as they chatted. Perhaps they could profit from each other's company after all, though any truce would be cosmetic if the subject of the erasure and all that had happened there wasn't broached. I owe you an explanation, he said. Oh? For what happened at the tents? You lost a lot of your people, and it was because of me. I don't see how you could have handled it much differently, Athanasius said. Neither of us knew the forces we were dealing with. I'm not sure I do now. Athanasius made a grim face. Pi O Pa went to a good deal of trouble to come back and haunt you, he said. 
It wasn't a haunting. Whatever it was, it took will to do it. The mischief must have known what the consequences would be for itself and for my people. It hated to cause harm. So what was so important that it caused so much? It wanted to make certain I understood my purpose. That's not reason enough, Athanasius said. It's the only one I've got, Gentle replied, skirting the other part of Pi's message, the part about Sartori. Athanasius had no answers to such puzzles, so why vex him with them? I believe there's something going on we don't understand, Athanasius said. Have you seen the waters? Yes. Don't they perturb you? They do me. There are other powers at work here besides us, gentle. Maybe we should be seeking them out, taking their advice. What do you mean by powers? Other maestros? No, I mean the Holy Mother. I think she may be here in his orderex. But you're not certain. Something's moving the waters. If she was here, wouldn't you know it? You were one of her high priests. I was never that. We worshipped at the Erasia because there was a crime committed there. A woman was taken from that spot into the first. Flockers Dardo had told Gentle this story as they'd driven across the desert. But with so much else to vex and excite him, he'd forgotten the tale. His mother's, of course. Her name was Celestine, wasn't it? How do you know? Because I've met her. She's still alive, back in the fifth. The other man narrowed his eyes as though to sharpen his gaze and prick this if it was a lie. But after a few moments a tiny smile appeared. So you've had dealings with holy women, he said. There's hope for you yet. You can meet her yourself when all this is over. I'd like that. But for now we have to hold to our course. There can be no deviations. Do you understand? We can go looking for the Holy Mother when the reconciliation's done, but not before. I feel so damn naked, Athanasius said. We all do. It's inevitable. But there's something more inevitable still. What's that? The wholeness of things, Gentle said. Things mended. Things healed. That's more certain than sin or death or darkness. Well said, Athanasius replied. Who taught you that? You should know. You married me to it. Ah, he smiled. Then may I remind you why a man marries? So that he can be made whole by a woman. Not this man, Gentle said. Wasn't the mystiff a woman to you? Sometimes. And when it wasn't? It was neither man nor woman. It was bliss. Athanasius looked intensely discomforted by this. That sounds profane to me, he remarked. Gentle had never thought of the bond between himself and the mystiff in such terms before, nor did he welcome the burden of such doubts now. Pi had been his teacher, his friend, and his lover, a selfless champion of the reconciliation from the very beginning. He could not believe that his father would ever have sanctioned such a liaison if it were anything but holy. I think we should let the subject lie, he told Athanasius, or we'll be at each other's throats again, and I, for one, don't want that. Neither do I, Athanasius replied. We'll not discuss it any further. Tell me, where do you go from here? To the Erasia. And who represents the synod there? Chickajackeen. Ah, so you chose him, did you? You know him? Not well. I know he came to the Erasure long before I did. In fact, I don't think anyone quite knew how long he'd been there. He's a strange fellow. If that were a disqualification, we'd both be out of a job, Gentle remarked. True enough. With that, Gentle offered Athanasius his good wishes, and they parted, civilly if not fondly, Gentle turning his thoughts from his Isordrex to the desert beyond. Instantly, the domestic interior flickered and was replaced seconds later by the vast wall of the Erasure, rising from a fog in which he dearly hoped the last member of his synod was awaiting him. 4. The streams kept converging as the women climbed, until they were walking beside a flow that would soon be too wide to leap and too furious to ford. There were no embankments to contain these waters. 
only the gullies and gutters of the street, but the same intentionality that drew them up the hill also limited their lateral spread. That way the river didn't dissipate its energies, but climbed like an animal whose skin was growing at a prodigious rate to accommodate the power it gained every time it assimilated another of its kind. By now, its destination would not be in doubt. There was only one structure on the city's highest peak, the Autarch's Palace, and unless an abyss opened up in the street and swallowed the waters before they reached the gates, it would be there that the trail would deliver them. Jude had mixed memories of the palace. Some, like the pivot tower and the chamber of sluiced prayers beneath it, were terrifying. Others were sweetly erotic, like the hours she'd spent dozing in Quaiswa's bed, while Concupiscentia sang and the lover she'd thought too perfect to be real had covered her with kisses. He was gone, of course, but she would be returning into the labyrinth he'd built, now turned to some new purpose, not only with the scent of him upon her, you smell of coitus, Celestine had said, but with the fruit of that coupling in her womb. Her hope of sharing wisdom with Celestine had undoubtedly been blighted by that fact. Even after Tay's disparagement and Clem's conciliation, the woman had contrived to treat Jude as a pariah. And if she, merely brushed by divinity, had sniffed Sartori on Jude's skin, then surely Tishalule would sniff the same and know the child was there too. If challenged, Jude had decided to tell the truth. She had reasons for doing all that she'd done, and she would not make false apologies, but come to the altars of these goddesses with humility and self-respect in equal measure. The gates were now in view, the river gushing towards them, its flood a white-water roar. Either its assault or some previous violence had thrown both gates off their hinges, and the water surged through the gap ecstatically. How do we get through? Hoi Polloi yelled above the din. It's not that deep, Jude said. We'll be able to wade it if we go together. Here, take my hand. Without giving the girl time to argue or retreat, she took firm hold of Hoi Polloi's wrist and stepped into the river. As she'd said, it wasn't very deep. Its spumy surface only climbed to the middle of their thighs. But there was considerable force in it and they were obliged to proceed with extreme care. Jude couldn't see the ground she was leading them over, the water was too wild, but she could feel through her souls how the river was digging up the paving, eroding in a matter of minutes what the tread of soldiers, slaves, and penitents had not much impressed in two centuries. Nor was this erosion the only threat to their equilibrium. The river's freight of arms, petitions, and trash was very heavy now, gathered as it was from five or six places in the lower Kesperates. Slabs of wood knocked at their hamstrings and shins, swaths of cloth wrapped around their knees. But Jude remained sure-footed and advanced with a steady tread until they were through the gates, glancing back over her shoulder now and then to reassure Hoi Polloi with a look or a smile that, though there was discomfort here, there was no great hazard. The river didn't slow once it was inside the palace walls. Instead, it seemed to find fresh impetus, its spume thrown ever higher as it climbed through the courtyards. The comet's beams were falling here in greater abundance than on the Kesperates below, and their light, striking the water, threw silver filigrees up against the joyless stone. Distracted by the beauty of this, Jude momentarily lost her footing as they cleared the gates, and despite a cry of warning, fell back into the river, taking Hoi Polloi with her. Though they were in no danger of drowning, the water had sufficient momentum to carry them along, and Hoi Polloi, being much the lighter of the two, was swept past Jude at some speed. Their attempts to stand up again were defeated by the eddies and countercurrents its enthusiasm was generating, and it was only by chance that Hoi Polloi, thrown against a dam of detritus that was choking part of the flow, was able to use its accrued bulk to bring herself to a halt and haul herself to her knees. The water broke against her with considerable vehemence as she did so, its will to carry her off undiminished, but she defied it, and by the time Jude was carried to the place, Hoi Polloi was getting to her feet. Give me your hand, she yelled, 
returning the invitation Jude had first offered when they'd stepped into the flood. Jude reached to do so, half turning in the water to stretch for Hoi Polloi's fingers. But the river had other ideas. As their hands came within inches of clasping, the waters conspired to spin her and snatch her away, their hold on her so tight the breath was momentarily squeezed out of her. She couldn't even yell a word of reassurance, but was hauled off by the flood, up through a monolithic archway, and out of sight. Violent as the waters were, pitching her around as it raced through the cloisters and colonnades, she wasn't in fear of them. Quite the opposite. The exhilaration was contagious. She was part of their purpose now, even if they didn't know it, and happy to be delivered to their summoner, who was surely also their source. Whether that summoner, be she Tishalule or Jokale Lao or any other goddess who might be resident here today, judged her to be a petitioner or simply another piece of trash, only the end of this ride would tell. 5. If his Orderex had become a place of glorious particulars, every colour singing, every bubble in its waters crystalline, the erasure had given itself over to ambiguity. There was no breath of wind to stir the heavy mist that hung over the fallen tents and over the dead, shrouded but unburied, who lay in their folds. Nor did the comet have fire enough to pierce a higher fog, the fabric of which left its light dusky and drab. Off to the left of where Gentle's projections stood, the ring of Madonnas that Athanasius and his disciples had sheltered in was visible through the murk. But the man he'd come here to find wasn't in residence there, nor was there any sign of him to the right, though here the fog was so thick it blotted out everything that lay beyond an eight or ten yard range. He nevertheless headed into it, loath to try calling Chicka Jackeen's name, even if his voice had possessed sufficient strength. There was a conspiracy of suppression upon the landscape, and he was unwilling to challenge it. Instead, he advanced in silence, his body barely displacing the mist, his feet making little or no impression on the ground. He felt more like a phantom here than in any of the other meeting places. It was a landscape for such souls, hushed but haunted. He didn't have to walk blindly for long. The mist began to thin out after a time, and through its shreds he caught sight of Chicka Jackeen. He dug a chair and small table from the wreckage and was sitting with his back to the great wall of the First Dominion, playing a solitary game of cards and talking furiously to himself as he did so. We're all crazies, Gentle thought, catching him like this. Tick raw, half mad on mustard. Scopeek, become an amateur arsonist. Athanasius, marking sacramental sandwiches with his pierced hands. And finally, Chicka Jackeen, chattering away to himself like a neurotic monkey. Crazies to a man. And of all of them, he, Gentle, was probably the craziest the lover of a creature that defied the definitions of gender, the maker of a man who had destroyed nations. The only sanity in his life, burning like a clear white light, was that which came from God, the simple purpose of a reconciler. Jackeen! The man looked up from his card somewhat guiltily. Oh, maestro, you're here. Don't say you weren't expecting me. Not so soon. Is it time for us to go to the Anna? Not yet. I came to be sure you were ready. I am, maestro. Truly. Were you winning? I was playing myself. That doesn't mean you can't win. No? No. As you say. Then yes, I was winning. He rose from the table, taking off the spectacles he'd been wearing to study his cards. Has anything come out of the erasure while you've been waiting? No, not come out. In fact, yours is the first voice I've heard since Athanasius left. He's part of the Synod now, Gentle said. Scopeek induced him to join us to represent the second. What happened to the Ahetemek? Not murdered. He died of old age. 
Will Athanasius be equal to the task? Jackine asked. Then, thinking his question overstepped the bounds of protocol, he said, I'm sorry. I've no right to question your judgment in this. You've every right, Gentle said. We've got to have complete faith in each other. If you trust Athanasius, then so do I, Jackine said simply. So we're ready. There is one thing I'd like to report, if I may. What's that? I said nothing's come out of the erasure, and that's true. But something went in. Yes. Last night I was sleeping under the table here. He pointed to his bed of blankets and stone. And I woke chilled to the marrow. I wasn't sure whether I was dreaming at first, so I was slow to get up. But when I did, I saw these figures coming out of the fog. Dozens of them. Who were they? Nalayanax, Jackeen said. Are you familiar with them? Certainly. I counted fifty at least, just within sight of me. Did they threaten you? I don't think they even saw me. They had their eyes on their destination. The first? That's right. But before they'd crossed over, they shed their clothes and made some fires and burned every last thing they wore or brought with them. All of them did this? Every one that I saw. It was extraordinary. Can you show me the fires? Easily, Jackeen said, and led Gentle away from the table, talking as he went. I'd never seen a Nalayanak before, but of course I've heard the stories. They're brutes, Gentle said. I killed one in Vanea a few months ago, and then I met one of its brothers in his Isordorex, and it murdered a child I knew. They like innocence, I've heard. It's meat and drink to them, and they're all related to each other, though nobody's ever seen the female of the species. In fact, some say there isn't one. You seem to know a lot about them. Well, I read a good deal, Jackeen said, glancing at Gentle. But you know what they say. Study nothing except in the knowledge that you already knew it. That's right. Gentle looked at the man with fresh interest, hearing the old saw from his lips. Was it so commonplace a dictum that every student had it by heart, or did Chicka Jackeen know the significance of what he was saying? Gentle stopped walking, and Jackeen stopped beside him, offering a smile that verged on the mischievous. Now it was Gentle who did the studying, his text the other man's face, and reading saw the dictum proved. My God, he said. Lucius? Yes, maestro, it's me. Lucius, Lucius! The years had taken their toll, of course, though not insufferably. While the face in front of him was no longer that of the eager acolyte he had sent from Gamut Street, it was not marked by more than a tenth of the two centuries in between. This is extraordinary, Gentle said. I thought maybe you knew who I was and you were playing a game with me. How could I know? Am I really so different? the other said, clearly a little deflated. It took me twenty-three years to master the fate of holding, but I thought I'd caught the last of my youth before it went entirely. A little vanity. Forgive me. When did you come here? It seems like a lifetime, so it probably is. I wandered back and forth through the dominions first, studying with one evocator after another but I was never content with any of them. I had you to judge them by, you see, so I was always dissatisfied. I was a lousy teacher, Gentle said. Not at all. You taught me the fundamentals, and I've lived by them and prospered. Maybe not in the world's eyes, but in mine. The only lesson I gave you was on the stairs. Remember that last night? Of course I remember. The laws of study, workings, and fear. Wonderful. But they weren't mine, Lucius. The mystic taught them to me. I just passed them along. Isn't that what most teachers do? I think the great ones refine wisdom. They don't simply repeat it. I refined nothing. 
I thought every word I uttered was perfect because it was falling from my lips. So my idol has feet of clay. I'm afraid so. You think I didn't know that? I saw what happened at the retreat. I saw you fail. And it's because of that I waited here. I don't follow. I knew you wouldn't accept failure. You'd wait, and you'd plan, and some day, even if it took a thousand years, you'd come back to try again. One of these days I'll tell you how it really happened, and you won't be so impressed. However it went, you're here, Lucius said, and I have my dream at last. Which is what? To work with you. To join you in the Anna, maestro to maestro, he grinned. God is in his heaven today, he said. If I'm ever happier than this, it'll kill me. Ah, there, maestro. He stopped and pointed to the ground a few yards from them. That's one of the Nalayanax fires. The place was blasted, but there were some remains of the Nalayanax robes among the ashes. Gentle approached. I don't have the wherewithal to sort through them, Lucius. Will you do it for me? Lucius obliged, stooping to turn over the cinders and pluck out what remained of the clothes. There were fragments of suits, robes, and coats in a variety of styles, one finely embroidered after the fashion of Partashokwa, another barely more than sackcloth, a third with medals attached, as if its owner had been a soldier. They must have come from all over the Imagica, Gentle said. Summoned, Lucius replied. That seems like a reasonable assumption. But why? Gentle mused a moment. I think the unbeheld has taken them into his furnace, Lucius. He's burned them away. So he's wiping the Dominions clean? Yes, he is. And the Nalayanax knew it. They threw off their clothes like penitents because they knew that they were going to their judgment. You see, Lucius said, you are wise. When I'm gone, will you burn even these last pieces? Of course. It's his will that we cleanse this place. I'll start right away, and I'll go back to the fifth and finish my preparations. Is the retreat still standing? Yes. But that's not where I'll be. I've returned to Gamut Street. That was a fine house. It's still fine in its way. I saw you there on the stairs only a few nights ago. A spirit there and flesh here. What could be more perfect? Being flesh and spirit in the whole of creation, Gentle said. Yes, that would be finer still. And it'll happen. It's all one, Lucius. I hadn't forgotten that lesson. Good. But if I may ask... Yes? Would you call me Chicka Jackine from now on? I've lost the bloom of youth, so I may as well lose the name. Maestro Jackine it is. Thank you. I'll see you in a few hours, Gentle said, and with that put his thoughts to his return. This time there were no diversions or loiterings, for sentiment's sake or any other. He went, at the speed of his intention, back through his Isordorex and along the Lenten Way, over the cradle and the benighted heights of the Jokalelau, passing across the Mount of Lipabayak and Partashokwa, within whose gates he had yet to step, finally returning into the fifth, to the room he'd left in Gamut Street. Day was at the window and Clem was at the door patiently awaiting the return of his maestro. As soon as he saw a flicker of animation in Gentle's face, he began to speak, his message too urgent to be delayed a second longer than it had to be. Monday's back, he said. Gentle stretched and yawned. His nape and lumbar regions ached, and his bladder was ready to burst, but at least he hadn't returned to discover his bowels had given out, as Tick Raw had predicted. Good, he said. He got to his feet and hobbled to the mantelpiece, clinging to it as he kicked some life back into his deadened legs. Did he get all the stones? Yes, he did. 
but I'm afraid Jude didn't come back with him. Where the hell is she? He won't tell me. He's got a message from her, he says, but he won't trust it to anyone but you. Do you want to speak to him? He's downstairs eating breakfast. Yes, yeah, send him up, will you? And if you can, find me something to eat. Anything but sausages. Clem headed off down the stairs, leaving Gentle to cross to the window and throw it open. The last morning that the fifth would see unreconciled had dawned, and the temperature was already high enough to wilt the leaves on the tree outside. Hearing Monday's feet clattering up the stairs, Gentle turned to greet the messenger, who appeared with a half-eaten hamburger in one hand and a half-smoked cigarette in the other. You've got something to tell me, he said. Yes, boss, from Jude. Where did she go? Isorderex. That's part of what I'm supposed to tell you. She's gone to Isorderex. Did you see her go? Not exactly. She made me stand outside while she went, so that's what I did. And the rest of the message? She told me, he made a great show of concentration now, to tell you where she'd gone, and I've done that. Then she said to tell you that the reconciliation isn't safe and that you weren't to do nothing until she contacted you again. Isn't safe? Those were her words. That's what she said. No kidding. Do you know what she was talking about? Search me, boss. His eyes had gone from gentle to the darkest corner of the room. I didn't know you had a monkey, he said. Did you bring it back with you? Gentle looked to the corner. Little Ease was there, staring up at the maestro fretfully, having presumably crept down into the meditation room sometime during the night. Does it eat hamburgers? Monday said, going down on his haunches. You can try, Gentle said distractedly. Monday, is that all Jude said? It isn't safe. That's it, boss, I swear. She just arrived at the retreat and told you she wasn't coming back. Oh, no, she took her time, Monday said, pulling a face as the creature he'd taken to be an ape skulked from its corner and started towards the proffered hamburger. He made to stand up, but it bared its teeth in a grin of such ferocity he thought better of doing so, and simply extended his arm as far as he could to keep the beast from his face. Little ease slowed as it came within sniffing distance and instead of snatching the meal, claimed it from Monday's hand with the greatest delicacy. Pinky's raised. Will you finish the story? Gentle said. Oh, yeah. Well, there was this fella in the retreat when we got there, and she had a long jaw with him. This was somebody she knew? Oh, yeah. Who? I forget his name, Monday said but seeing Gentle's brow frown, protested, That wasn't part of the message, boss. If it had been, I'd have remembered. Remember anyway, Gentle said, beginning to suspect conspiracy. Who was he? Monday stood up and drew nervously on his cigarette. I don't recall. There were all these birds, you know, and bees and stuff. I wasn't really listening. It was something short, like Cody or... Coward, or... Dowd. Yeah, that's it. It was Dowd. And he was really fucked up, let me tell you. But alive. Oh, yeah, for a while. Like I said, they talked together. And it was after this that she said she was going to his order, X. That's right. She told me to bring the stones back to you and the message with them. Both of which you've done. Thank you. You're the boss, boss, Monday said. Is that all? If you want me, I'm on the step. It's going to be a scorcher. He thundered off downstairs. Shall I leave the door open, Liberatore? Little Ease said, as it nibbled on the hamburger. What are you doing here? I got lonely up there, the creature said. You promised obedience, Gentle reminded it. You don't trust her, do you? Little Ease replied. You think she's gone off to join Sartori? He hadn't until now, but the notion, now that it was floated, didn't seem so improbable. 
Jude had confessed what she felt for Sartori in this very house, and clearly believed that he loved her in return. Perhaps she'd simply slipped away from the retreat while Monday's back was turned and had gone to find the father of her child. If that was the case, it was paradoxical behaviour to seek out the arms of a man whose enemy she'd just helped towards victory. But this was not a day to waste analysing such conundrums. She'd done what she'd done and there was an end to it. Gentle hoisted himself up onto the sill from which perch he'd often planned his itinerary and attempted to push all thoughts of her defection out of his head. This was a bad room in which to try and forget her, however. It was, after all, the womb in which she'd been made. The boards most likely still concealed motes of the sand that had marked her circle and stains deep in their grain of the liquors he'd anointed her nakedness with. Try as he might to keep the thoughts from coming, one led inevitably to another. Imagining her naked, he pictured his hands upon her, slick with oils, then his kisses, then his body. And before a minute had passed, he was sitting on the sill with an erection nuzzling against his underwear. Of all the mornings to be plagued with such distraction, the beguilements of the flesh had no place in the work ahead of him. They'd brought the last reconciliation to tragedy, and he would not allow them to lead him from his sanctified path by a single step. He looked down at his groin, disgusted with himself. Cut it off, little ease advised. If he could have done the deed without making an invalid of himself, he'd have done so there and then, and gladly. He had nothing but contempt for what rose between his legs. It was a hot-headed idiot and he wanted rid of it. I can control it, he replied. Famous last words, the creature said. A blackbird had come into the tree and was singing blithely there. He looked its way and beyond, up through the branches into the burnished blue sky. His thoughts abstracted as he studied it, and by the time he heard Clem coming up the stairs with food and drink, the spasm of carnality had passed and he greeted his angels with a cooling brow. So now we wait, he told Clem. What for? For Jude to come back. And if she doesn't? She will, Gentle replied. This is where she was born. It's her home, even if she wishes it weren't. She'll have to make her way back here eventually. And if she's conspired against us, Clem... If she's working with the enemy, then I swear I'll draw a circle right here, he pointed to the boards, and I'll unmake her so well it'll be as though she never drew breath. Chapter 55 1. The law-defying waters were compassionate. Though they carried Jude through the palace at considerable speed, roaming through corridors their passage had already stripped of tapestries and furnishings, they treated their cargo with care. She wasn't thrown against the walls or the pillars, but was borne up on a ship of surf that neither faltered nor foundered, but hurried, remotely helmed, to its destination. That place could scarcely be in doubt. The mystery at the heart of the Autarch's maze had always been the pivot tower, and though she'd witnessed the beginning of the tower's undoing, it was still surely her place of debarkation. Prayers and petitions had gone there for an age, attracted by the pivot's authority. Whatever force had replaced it, calling these waters, it had set its throne on the rubble of the fallen lord. And now she had proof of that, as the waters carried her out of the naked corridors and into the still severer environs of the tower, slowing to deliver her into a pool so thick with detritus it was almost solid. Out of this wreckage rose a staircase, and she hauled herself from the debris and lay on the lower steps, giddy but exhilarated. The waters continued to surge around the staircase like an eager spring tide, and their clear desire to be up the flight was contagious. She got to her feet after a little time and proceeded to climb. Although there were no lights burning at the top, there was plenty of illumination spilling down the stairs to meet her, and like the light at the springing places it was prismatic, 
suggesting there were more waters ahead that had come into the palace via other routes. Before she was even halfway up the flight, two women appeared and stared down at her. Both were dressed in simple off-white shifts. The fatter of the pair, a woman of gargantuan proportions, unbuttoned to bare her breasts to the baby she was nursing. She looked almost as infantile as her charge, her hair wispy, her face, like her breasts, heavy and sugar-almond pink. The woman beside her was older and slimmer, her skin substantially darker than that of her companion, her grey hair braided and combed out to her shoulders like a cowl. She wore gloves and glasses and regarded Jude with almost professorial detachment. Another soul saved from the flood, she said. Jude had stopped climbing. Though neither woman had made any sign that she was forbidden entry, she wanted to come into this miraculous place as a guest, not a trespasser. Am I welcome? Of course, said the mother. Have you come to meet the goddesses? Yes. Are you from the bastion, then? Before Jude could reply, her companion supplied the answer. Of course not. Look at her. But the waters brought her. The waters'll bring any woman who dares. They brought us, didn't they? Are there many others? Jude asked. Hundreds, came the reply. Maybe thousands by now. Jude wasn't surprised. If someone like herself, a stranger in the Dominions, had come to suspect that the goddesses were still extant, how much more hopeful must the women who lived here have been, living with the legends of Tishalule and Jokalelau? When Jude reached the top of the stairs, the bespectacled woman introduced herself. I'm Lottie Yap. I'm Judith. We're pleased to see you, Judith, the other woman said. I'm Paramarola. And this fellow, she looked down at the baby, is Billow. Yours? Jude asked. Now where would I have found a man to give me the likes of this? Paramarola said. We've been in the annex for nine years, Lottie Yap explained. Guests of the Autark. May his thorn rot and his berries wither, Paramarola added. And where have you come from? Lottie asked. The fifth, Jude said. She was not fully attending to the women now, however. Her interest had been claimed by a window that lay across the puddle-strewn corridor behind them or rather by the vista visible through it, she went to the sill both awed and astonished, and gazed out at an extraordinary spectacle. The flood had cleared a circle half a mile wide or more in the centre of the palace, sweeping walls and pillars and roofs away and drowning the rubble. All that was left, rising from the waters, were islands of rock where the taller towers had stood, and here and there a corner of one of the palace's vast amphitheatres, preserved as if to mock the overweening pretensions of its architect. Even these fragments would not stand for much longer, she suspected. The waters circled this immense basin without violence, but their sheer weight would soon bring these last remnants of Sartori's masterwork down. At the centre of this small sea was an island larger than the rest, its lower shores made up of the half-demolished chambers that had clustered around the pivot tower, its rocks the rubble of that tower's upper half, mingled with vast pieces of its tenant, and its height the remains of the tower itself, a ragged but glittering pyramid of rubble in which a white fire seemed to be burning. Looking at the transformation these waters had wrought, eroding in a matter of days, perhaps hours, what the Autark had taken decades to devise and build, Jude wondered that she'd reached this place intact. The power she'd first encountered on the lower slopes as an innocent, if willful, brook was here revealed as an awesome force for change. Were you here when this happened? she asked Lottie Yap. We saw only the end of it, she replied, but it was quite a sight, let me tell you, seeing the towers fall. We were afraid for our lives, Paramarola said. Speak for yourself, Lottie replied. The waters didn't set us free just to drown us. We were prisoners in the annex, you see. 
Then the floor cracked open and the waters just bubbled up and washed the walls away. We knew the goddesses would come, didn't we? Paramarola said. We always had faith in that. So you never believed they were dead? Of course not. Buried alive, maybe. Sleeping. Even lunatic, but never dead. What she says is right, Lottie observed. We knew this day would come. Unfortunately, it may be a short victory, Jude said. Why do you say that? Lottie replied. The Autark's gone. Yes, but his father hasn't. His father? said Paramarola. I thought he was a bastard. Who's his father, then? said Lottie. Hapexamendios. Paramarola laughed at this, but Lottie Yap nudged in her well-padded ribs. It's not a joke, Rola. It has to be, the other protested. Do you see this woman laughing? Then to Jude. Do you have any evidence for this? No, I don't. Then where do you get such an idea? Jude had guessed it would be difficult to persuade people of Sartori's origins, but she'd optimistically supposed that when the moment came she'd be possessed by a sudden lucidity. Instead, she felt a rage of frustration. If she was obliged to unravel the whole sorry history of her involvement with the Autark Sartori to every soul who stood between her and the goddesses, the worst would be upon them all before she was halfway there. Then, inspiration. The pivot's the proof, she said. How so? said Lottie, who was now studying this woman the flood had brought to their feet with fresh intensity. He could never have moved the pivot without his father's collaboration. But the pivot doesn't belong to the unbeheld, Paramarola said. It never did. Jude looked confounded. What Rola says is true, Lottie told her. He may have used it to control a few weak men, but the pivot was never his. Whose then? Uma, Uma Gamaji was in it. And who's that? The sister of Tishalule and Jokalelao. Half-sisters of the daughters of the Delta. There was a goddess in the pivot? Yes. And the Autark didn't know it? That's right. She hid herself there to escape Hapexamendios when he passed through the Imagica. Jokalela went into the snow and was lost there. Tisha Lule, in the cradle of Chisursumit, Jude said. Yes, indeed, said Lottie, plainly impressed. And Uma Uma Gamaji hid herself in solid rock, Paramarola went on, telling the tale as though to a child, thinking he'd pass over the place not seeing her. But he chose the pivot as the centre of the Imagica and laid his power upon it, sealing her in. This was surely the ultimate irony, Jude thought. The architect of Isorderex had built his fortress, indeed his entire empire, around an imprisoned goddess. Nor was the parallel with Celestine lost on her. It seemed Roxburgh had been unwittingly working in a grim tradition when he'd sealed Celestine up beneath his house. Where are the goddesses now? Jude asked Lottie. On the island. We'll all be allowed into their presence in time, and we'll be blessed by them. But it'll take days. I don't have days, Jude said. How do I get to the island? You'll be called when your time comes. That has to be now, Jude said, or it'll be never. She looked left and right along the passageway. Thank you for the education, she said. Maybe I'll see you again. Choosing right over left, she made to leave, but Lottie took hold of her sleeve. You don't understand, Judith, she said. The goddesses have come to make us safe. Nothing can harm us here, not even the unbeheld. I hope that's true, Jude said. To the bottom of my heart, I hope that's true. But I have to warn them, in case it isn't. Then we'd better come with you, Lottie said. You'll never find your way otherwise. Wait, Paramarola said. Should we be doing this? She may be dangerous. Aren't we all? Lottie replied. That's why they locked us away in the first place, remember? 2. If the atmosphere of the streets outside the palace had suggested some post-apocalyptic carnival, 
the waters dancing, the children laughing, the air pavanine, then that sense was a hundred times stronger in the passageways around the rim of the flood-scoured basin. There were children here, too, their laughter more musical than ever. None was over five or so, but there were both boys and girls in the throng. They turned the corridors into playgrounds, their din echoing off walls that had not heard such joy since they'd been raised. There was also water, of course. Every inch of ground was blessed by a puddle, a rivulet, or a stream. Every arch had a liquid curtain cascading from its keystone. Every chamber was refreshed by burbling springs and roof-grazing fountains. And in every tinkling trickle there was the same sentience that Jude had felt in the tide that had brought her up here. Water as life, filled to the last drop with the purpose of the goddesses. Overhead the comet was at its height and sent its straight white beams through any chink it could find, turning the humblest puddle into an oracular pool and plaiting its light into the gush of every spout. The women in these glittering corridors came in all shapes and sizes. Many, Lottie explained, were like themselves former prisoners of the bastion or its dreaded annex. Others had simply found their way up the hill following their instincts and the streams, leaving their husbands dead or alive below. Are there no men here at all? Only the little ones, said Lottie. They're all little ones, Paramarola observed. There was a captain at the annex who was a brute, Lottie said, and when the waters came he must have been emptying his bladder because his body floated by our cell with his trousers unbuttoned. And you know he was still holding on to his manhood, Paramarola said. He had the choice between that and swimming, and instead of letting go, he drowned, Lottie said. This entertained Paramarola no end, and she laughed so hard the baby's mouth was dislodged from her teat. Milk spurted in the child's face, which brought a further round of merriment. Jude didn't ask how Paramarola came to be so nourishing when she was neither the mother of the child nor presumably pregnant. It was just one of the many enigmas this journey showed her, like the pool that clung to one of the walls, filled to brimming with luminous fish, or the waters that imitated fire, from which some of the women had made crowns, or the immensely long eel she saw carried past, its gaping head on a child's shoulder, its body looped between half a dozen women back and forth across their shoulders ten times or more. If she'd requested an explanation for any one of these sights, she'd have been obliged to inquire about them all, and they'd never have got more than a few yards down the corridor. The journey brought them at last to a place where the waters had carved out a shallow pool at the edge of the main basin, served by several rivulets that climbed through rubble to fill it to brimming, its overflow running into the basin itself. In it and around it were perhaps thirty women and children, some playing, some talking, but most, their clothes shed, waiting silently in the pool, gazing out across the turbulent waters of the basin to Uma Uma Gamage's island. Even as Jude and her guides approached the place, a wave broke against the lip of the pool, and two women, standing there hand in hand, went with it as it withdrew and were carried away towards the island. There was an eroticism about the scene, which, in other circumstances, Jude would certainly have denied she felt. But here, such priggingness seemed redundant, even ludicrous. She allowed her imagination to wonder what it would be like to sink into the midst of this nakedness, where the only scrap of masculinity was between the legs of a suckling infant. To brush breast to breast, and let her fingers be kissed and her neck be caressed, and kiss and caress in her turn. The water in the basin's very deep, Lottie said at her side. It goes all the way down into the mountain. What had happened to the dead? Jude wondered, whose company Dowd had found so educative. Had the waters sluiced them away along with the invocations and entreaties that had dropped into that same darkness from beneath the pivot tower? Or had they been dissolved into a single soup, the sex of dead men forgiven, the pain of dead women healed, and, all mingled with the prayers, become part of this indefatigable flood? She hoped so. 
If the powers here were to have authority against the unbeheld, they would have to reclaim every forsaken strength they could. The walls between Kesperates had already been dragged down, and the plashing streams were making a continuum of city and palace. But the past had to be reclaimed as well, and whatever miracles it had boasted, surely there had been some even here, preserved. This was more than an abstract desire on Jude's part. She was, after all, one of those miracles, made in the image of the woman who'd ruled here with as much ferocity as her husband. Is this the only way of getting to the island? she asked Lottie. There aren't ferries, if that's what you mean. I'd better start swimming, then, Jude said. Her clothes were an encumbrance, but she wasn't yet so easy with herself that she could strip off on the rocks and go into the waters naked. So, with a brief thanks to Lottie and Paramarola, she started to climb down the tumble of blocks that surrounded the pool. I hope you're wrong, Judith, Lottie called after her. So do I. Jude replied. Believe me, so do I. Both this exchange and her ungainly descent drew the puzzled gaze of several of the bathers, but none made any objection to her appearing in their midst. The closer she got to the waters of the basin, the more anxious she became about the crossing, however. It was several years since she'd swum any distance, and she doubted she'd have the strength to resist the currents and eddies if they chose to keep her from her destination. But they wouldn't drown her, surely. They'd borne her all the way up here, after all, sweeping her through the palace unharmed. The only difference between this journey and that, though it was a profound one, to be sure, was the depth of the water. Another wave was approaching the lip of the pool, and there was a woman and child floating forward to take it. Before they could do so, she took a running jump off the boulder she was perched on, clearing the heads of the bathers below by a hair's breadth and plunging into the tide. It wasn't so much a dive as a plummet, and it took her deep. She flailed wildly to right herself, opening her eyes but unable to decide which way was up. The waters knew. They lifted her out of their depths like a cork and threw her up into the spume. She was already twenty yards or more from the rocks and being carried away at speed. She had time to glimpse Lottie searching for her in the surf, then the eddies turned her around and around again, until she no longer knew the direction in which the pool lay. Instead, she fixed her eyes on the island and began to swim as best she could towards it. The waters seemed content to supplement her efforts with energies of their own though they were describing a spiral around the island, and as they carried her closer to its shore, they also swept her in a counterclockwise motion around it. The comet's light fell on the waves all around her, and its glitter kept the depths from sight, which she was glad of. Buoyed up though she was, she didn't want to be reminded of the pit beneath her. She put all her will into the business of swimming, not even allowing herself to enjoy the roiling of the waters against her body. Such luxury, like the question she'd wanted to ask as she'd walked with Lottie and Paramarola, was for another day. The shore was within fifty yards of her now, but her strokes became increasingly irrelevant the closer to the island she came. As the spiral tightened, the tide became more authoritative, and she finally gave up any attempt at self-propulsion and surrendered herself utterly to the hold of the waters. They carried her around the island twice before she felt her feet scraping the steeply inclined rocks beneath the surge, presenting her with a fine, if giddying, view of Uma Umagamaji's temple. Not surprisingly, the waters had been more inspired here than in any other spot she'd seen. They'd worked at the blocks of which the tower was built, monumental though they were, eroding the mortar between them, then, eating at them top and bottom, replacing their severity with the mathematics of undulation. Slabs of stone the height of the masons who'd first carved them were no longer locked together but balanced like acrobats, one corner laid against another, while radiant water ran through the cavities and carried on its work of turning the once impregnable tower into a wedded column of water, stone, and light. The eroded moats had run off in the rivulets and been deposited on the shore as a fine, soft sand, in which Jude lay when she emerged from the basin, 
given a giggling welcome by a quartet of children playing nearby. She allowed herself only a minute to catch her breath. Then she got to her feet and started up the beach towards the temple. Its doorway was as elaborately eroded as the blocks, a veil of bright water concealing the interior from those waiting nearby. There were perhaps a dozen women at the threshold. One, a girl barely past pubescence, was walking on her hands. Somebody else seemed to be singing but the music was so close to the sound of running water that Jude couldn't decide whether a voice was flowing or some stream was aspiring to melody. As at the pool, nobody objected to her sudden appearance, nor remarked on the fact that she was weighed down by waterlogged clothes while they were in various states of undress. A benign languor was on them all, and had it not been for Jude's willpower, she might have let it claim her too. She didn't hesitate, however, but stepped through the water door without so much as a murmur to those waiting at the threshold. Inside, there was no solid sight to greet her. Instead, the air was filled with forms of light, folding and unfolding as though invisible hands were performing a lucid origami. They weren't working towards petty resemblance, but transforming their radiant stuff over and over each new shape on its way to becoming another before it was fixed. She looked down at her arms. They were still visible, but not as flesh and blood. They'd learned the trick of the light already, and were blossoming into a multiplicity of forms in order to join the play. She reached out to touch one of her fellow visitors with her burgeoning fingers, and, brushing her, caught a glimpse of the woman from whom this origami had emerged. She appeared the way a body might if a damp sheet billowed against it, momentarily clinging to the shape of her hip, her cheek, her breast, then billowing again and snatching the glimpse away. But there'd been a smile there, she was certain of that. Reassured that she was neither alone nor unwelcome here, she began to advance into the temple. The promise of eroticism she'd first felt as she gazed into the pool was now realized. She felt the forms of her own body spreading like milk dropped into the fluid air and grazing the bodies of those she was passing between. Musings, most no more than half-formed, mingled with the sensation. Perhaps she would dissolve here and flow out through the walls to join the waters around the islands, or perhaps she was already in that sea and the flesh and blood she thought she'd owned was just a figment of those waters, conjured to comfort the lonely land. Or perhaps, or perhaps, or perhaps. These speculations were not divorced from the brushing of form against form, but were part of the pleasure, her nerves bearing these fruits which in turn made her more tender to the touches of her companions. They were falling away as she advanced, she realized. Her progress was taking her up into the heights of the temple. If there had been solid ground beneath her feet, she'd lost all sense of it as she crossed the threshold and rose without effort, her stuff possessed of the same law-defying genius as had been the waters below. There was another motion ahead and above her more sinuous than the form she'd met at the door, and she rose towards it as if summoned praying that when the moment came she'd have the words and lips to shape the thoughts in her head. The motion was getting clearer, and if she'd had any doubt below as to whether these sights were imagined or seen, she now had such dichotomies swept away. She was both seeing with her imagination and imagining she saw the glyph that hung in the air in front of her, a merbious strip of light haunted water, a steady rhythm passing through its seamless loop and throwing off waves of brilliant colour which shed bright rains around her. Here was the razor of springs. Here was the summoner of rivers. Here was the sublime presence whose strength had brought the palace to rubble and made a home for oceans and children where there'd only been terror before. Here was Uma Umagamaji. Though she studied the goddess's glyph, Jude could see no hint of anything that breathed, sweated, or corrupted in it. But there was such an emanation of tenderness from the form that, faceless as the goddess was, 
It seemed to Jude she could feel her smile, her kiss, her loving gaze. And love it was. Though this power knew her not at all, Jude felt embraced and comforted as only love could embrace and comfort. There had never been a time in her life until now when some part of her had not been afraid. It was the condition of being alive that even bliss was attended by the imminence of its decease. But here such terrors seemed absurd. This face loved her unconditionally and would do so for ever. Sweet Judith, she heard the goddess say, the voice so charged, so resonant, that these few syllables were an aria. Sweet Judith, what's so urgent that you risk your life to come here? As Uma Uma Gamaji spoke, Jude saw her own face appearing in the ripples, brightening, then teased out into a thread of light that was run into the goddess's glyph. She's reading me, Jude thought. She's trying to understand why I'm here, and when she does, she'll take the responsibility away. I'll be able to stay in this glorious place with her, always. So, said the goddess after a time, this is a grim business. It falls to you to choose between stopping this reconciliation or letting it go on and risking some harm from Hapeximendios. Yes, Jude replied, grateful that she'd been relieved of the need to explain herself. I don't know what the unbeheld is planning. Maybe nothing, and maybe the end of the Imagica. Could he do that? Very possibly, said Uma Uma Gamaji. He's done harm to our temples and our sisters many, many times, both in his own person and through his agents. He's a soul in error, and lethal. But would he destroy a whole dominion? I can no more predict him than you can, Umaganaji said. But I'll mourn if the chance to complete the circle is missed. The circle, said Jude. What circle? The circle of the Imagica, the goddess replied. Please understand, sister, the dominions were never meant to be divided this way. That was the work of the first human spirits when they came into their terrestrial life. Nor was there any harm in it at the beginning. It was their way of learning to live in a condition that intimidated them. When they looked up, they saw stars. When they looked down, they saw earth. They couldn't make their mark on what was above, but what was below could be divided and owned and fought over. From that division all others sprang. They lost themselves to territories and nations, all shaped by the other sex, of course, all named by them. They even buried themselves in the earth to have it more utterly, preferring worms to the company of light. They were blinded to the Imagica, and the circle was broken, and Hapeximendios, who was made by the will of these men, grew strong enough to forsake his makers and so passed from the fifth dominion into the first, murdering goddesses as he went. He did harm, yes, but he could have done greater harm still if he'd known the shape of the Imagica. He could have discovered what mystery it circled and gone there instead. What mystery is that? You're going back into a dangerous place, sweet Judith, and the less you know, the safer you'll be. When the time comes, we will unravel these mysteries together as sisters. Until then, take comfort that the error of the son is also the error of the father and in time all errors must undo themselves and pass away. So if they'll solve themselves, Jude said, why do I have to go back to the fifth? Before Uma Uma Gamaji could resume speaking, another voice intruded. Particles rose between Jude and the goddess as this other woman spoke, pricking Jude's flesh where they touched, reminding her of a state that knew ice and fire. Why do you trust this woman? 
the stranger said. Because she came to us open-hearted, Jokalelao, the goddess replied. How open-hearted is a woman who treads dry-eyed in the place where her sister died, Jokalelao said. How open-hearted is a woman who comes into our presence without shame when she has the Autark Sartori's child in her womb? We have no place for shame here, Umagamaji said. You may have no place, Jokalelao said, rising into view now. I have plenty. Like her sister, Jokalelao was here in her essential form a more complex shape than that of Uma Uma Gamaji, and less pleasing to the eye because the motions that ran in it were more hectic, her form not so much rippling as boiling, shedding its pricking darts as it did so. Shame is wholly appropriate for a woman who has lain with one of our enemies, she said. Despite the intimidation Jude felt from the goddess, she spoke out in her own defence. It's not as simple as that, she said her courage fueled by the frustration she felt, having this intruder spoil the congress between herself and Uma Uma Gamaji. I didn't know he was the Autark. Who did you imagine he was, or didn't you care? The exchange might have escalated, but that Uma Uma Gamaji spoke again, her tone as serene as ever. Sweet Judith, she said, let me speak with my sister. She's suffered at the hands of the unbeheld more than either Tishalule or myself, and she'll not readily forgive any flesh touched by him or his children. Please understand her pain, as I hope to make her understand yours. She spoke with such a delicacy that Jude now felt the shame Jokalelao had accused her of lacking, not for the child, but for her rage. I'm sorry, she said. That was inappropriate. If you'll wait on the shore, said Uma Uma Gamaji, we'll speak together again in a little while. From the moment that the goddess had talked of Jude's returning to the fifth, she'd known this parting would come. But she hadn't prepared herself to leave the goddess's embrace so soon, and now that she felt gravity claiming her again, it was an agony. There was no help for it, however. If Uma Uma Gamaji knew what she suffered, and how could she not, she did nothing to ameliorate the hurt, but folded her glyph back into the matrix, leaving Jude to fall like a petal from a blossom tree, lightly enough, but with a sense of separation worse than any bruising. The forms of the women she'd passed through were still unfolding and folding below, as exquisite as ever, and the water music at the door was as soothing but they could not salve the loss. The melody that had sounded so joyous when she'd entered was now elegiac, like a hymn for harvest home, thankful for the gifts bestowed, but touched by fears for a colder season to come. It was waiting on the other side of the curtain, that season. Though the children still laughed on the shore and the basin was still a glorious spectacle of light and motion, she had gone from the presence of a loving spirit and couldn't help but mourn. Her tears astonished the women at the threshold, and several rose to console her, but she shook her head as they approached, and they quietly parted to let her go her way alone, down to the water. There she sat, not daring to glance back at the temple where her fate was being decided, but gazing out over the basin. What now? she wondered. If she was called back into the presence of the goddesses to be told she wasn't fit to make any decision concerning the reconciliation, she'd be quite happy with the judgment. She'd leave the problem in surer hands than hers and return to the corridors around the basin, where she might after a time reinvent herself and come back into this temple as a novice, ready to learn the way to fold light. If, on the other hand, she was simply shunned, as Jokalelao clearly wanted, if she was driven from this miraculous place back into the wilderness outside, what would she do? Without anyone to guide her, what knowledge did she possess to help choose between the ways ahead? None. Her tears dried after a time, but what came in their place was worse. 
a sense of desolation that could only be hell itself, or some neighbouring province, divided from the main by infernal jailers, made to punish women who had loved immoderately and who had lost perfection, for want of a little shame. Chapter 56 1. In his last letter to his son, written the night before he boarded a ship bound for France, his mission to spread the gospel of the tabula rasa across Europe, Roxburgh, the scourge of maestros, had set down the substance of a nightmare from which he'd just woken. I dreamed that I drove in my coach through the damnable streets of Clerkenwell, he wrote. I need not name my destination. You know it, and you know too what infamies were planned there. As is the way in dreams, I was bereft of self-government, for though I called out many times to the driver, begging him for my soul's sake not to take me back to that house, my words had no power to persuade him. As the coach turned the corner, however, and the maestro Sartori's house came in sight, Bellamare reared up, affrighted, and would go no further. She was ever my favourite bay, and I felt such a flood of gratitude towards her for refusing to carry me to that unholy step that I climbed from the coach to speak my thanks into her ear. And lo, as my foot touched the ground, the cobbles spoke up like living things, their voices stony but raised in a hideous lamentation, and at the sound of their anguish the very bricks of the houses in that street and the roofs and railings and chimneys all made similar cry. Their voices joined in sorrowful testament to heaven. I never heard a din its like, but I could not stop my ears against it. For was their pain not in some part of my making? And I heard them say, Lord, we are but unbaptized things and have no hopes to come into your kingdom but we beseech you to bring some storm down upon us and grind us into dust with your righteous thunder that we may be scoured and destroyed and not suffer complicity with the deeds performed in our sight. My son, I marveled at their clamour and wept too and was ashamed, hearing them make this appeal to the Almighty, knowing that I was a thousand times more accountable than they. Oh, how I wished my feet might carry me away to some less odious place! I swear at that moment I would have judged the heart of a fiery furnace an agreeable place, and lain my head there with hosannas rather than be where these deeds had been done. But I could not retreat. On the contrary, my mutinous limbs carried me to the very doorstep of that house. There was foamy blood upon the threshold as though the martyrs had that night marked the place so that the angel of destruction might find it, and cause the earth to gape neath it, and commit it to the abyss. And from within was a sound of idle chatter as the men I had known debated their profane philosophies. I went down on my knees in the blood, calling to those within to come out and join me in begging forgiveness of the Almighty. But they scorned me with much laughter and called me coward and fool, and told me to go on my way. This I presently did with much haste, and did escape the street with the cobbles telling me I should go about my crusade without fear of God's retribution, for I had turned my back on the sin of that house. That was my dream. I am setting it down straightway and will have this letter sent post-haste, that you may be warned what harm there is in that place, and not be tempted to enter Clerkenwell, or even stray south of Islington while I am gone from you. For my dream instructs me that the street will be forfeit in due course, for the crimes it has entertained, and I would not wish one hair of your sweet head harmed for the deeds I, in my delirium, committed against the edicts of our Lord. Though the Almighty did offer his only begotten Son to suffer and die for our sins, I know that he would not ask that same sacrifice of me, knowing that I am his humblest servant, and pray only to be made his instrument until I quit this veil and go to judgment.
May the Lord keep you in his care until I embrace you again. The ship Roxburgh boarded a few hours after finishing this letter went down a mile out of Dover Harbour in a squall that troubled no other vessel in the vicinity but overturned the purger's ship and sank it in less than a minute. All hands were lost. The day after the letter arrived, the recipient, still tearful with the news, went to seek solace at the stables of his father's bay, Bellamare. The horse had been jittery since her master's departure, and though she knew Roxburgh's son well, kicked out at his approach, striking him in the abdomen. The blow was not instantly fatal, but with stomach and spleen split wide, the youth was dead in six days. Thus, he preceded his father, whose body was not washed up for another week, to the family grave. 2. Pai Opa had recounted this sorry story to gentle as they travelled from Limby to the cradle of Gisursamit in search of Scopeek. It was one of many tales the mystiff had told on that journey, offering them not as biographical details, though of course many of them were precisely that, but as entertainment, comedic, absurd, or melancholy, that usually opened with, I heard about this fellow once. Sometimes the stories were told within a few minutes, but Pye had lingered over this one, repeating word for word the text of Roxburgh's letter, though to this day Gentle didn't know how the mischief had come by it. He understood why it had committed the prophecy to memory, however, and why it had taken such trouble to repeat it for gentle. It had half believed there was some significance in Roxburgh's dream, and just as it had educated gentle on other matters pertaining to his concealed self, so it had told this tale to warn the maestro of dangers the future might bring. That future was now. As the hours since Monday's return crept on, and Jude still didn't return, Gentle was reduced to picking his recollections of Roxburgh's letter apart, looking for some clue in the purger's words as to what threat might be coming to the doorstep. He even wondered if the man who'd written the letter was numbered among the revenants who by mid-morning could be glimpsed in the heat haze. Had Roxburgh come back to watch the demise of the street he'd called damnable? If he had... If he listened at the step the way he had in his dream, he was most likely as frustrated as the occupants, wishing they'd get on with the work he hoped would invite calamity. But however many doubts Gentle harboured concerning Jude, he could not believe she would conspire against the great work. If she said it was unsafe, she had good reason for so saying, and though every sinew in Gentle's body raged at inactivity, he refused to go downstairs and bring the stones up into the meditation room, for fear their very presence might tempt him into warming the circle. Instead, he waited, and waited, and waited, while the heat outside rose and the air in the meditation room grew sour with his frustration. As Scopeek had said, a working like this required months of preparation, not hours and now even those hours were being steadily whittled away. How late could he afford to postpone the ceremony before he gave up on Jude and began? Until six? Until nightfall? It was an imponderable. There were signs of unease outside the house as well as in. Scarcely a minute went by without a new siren being added to the chorus of whoops and wails from every compass point. Several times through the morning bells began chiming from steeples in the vicinity, their peals neither summons nor celebration but alarm. There were even cries occasionally, shouts and screams from distant streets carried to the open windows on air now hot enough to make the dead sweat. And then, just after one in the afternoon, Clem came up the stairs, his eyes wide. It was Taylor who spoke, and there was excitement in his voice. Somebody's coming to the house, gentle. Who? A spirit of some kind. From the Dominions. She's downstairs. Is it Jude? No. This is a real power. Can't you smell her? I know you've given up women, but your nose still works, doesn't it? He led gentle out onto the landing. 
The house lay quiet below. Gentle sensed nothing. Where is she? Clem looked puzzled. She was here a moment ago, I swear. Gentle went to the top of the stairs, but Clem held him back. Angels first, he said, but Gentle was already beginning his descent, relieved that the torpor of the last few hours was over, and eager to meet this visitor. Perhaps she carried a message from Jude. The front door stood open. There was a pool of beer glinting on the step, but no sign of Monday. Where's the boy? Gentle asked. He's outside, sky-watching. He says he saw a flying saucer. Gentle threw his companion a quizzical look. Clem didn't reply, but laid his hand on Gentle's shoulder, his eyes going to the door of the dining room. From inside came the barely audible sound of sobbing. Mama, Gentle said, and gave up any caution, hurrying down the rest of the flight with Clem in pursuit. By the time he reached Celestine's room, the sound of her sobs had already disappeared. Gentle drew a defensive breath, took hold of the handle, and put his shoulder to the door. It wasn't locked, but swung open smoothly, delivering him inside. The room was ill-lit, the drooping mildewed curtain still heavy enough to keep the sun to a few dusty beams. They fell on the empty mattress in the middle of the floor. Its sometime occupant, whom Gentle had not expected to see standing again, was at the other end of the room, her tears subsided to whimpers. She had brought one of the sheets from her bed with her, and, seeing her son enter, drew it up to her breastbone. Then she turned her attention back towards the wall she was standing close to and studied it. A pipe had burst somewhere behind the brick, Gentle supposed. He could hear water running freely. It's all right, Mama, he said. Nothing's going to hurt you. Celestine didn't reply. She raised her left hand in front of her face and was looking at the palm, as if into a mirror. It's still here, Clem said. Where? Gentle asked him. He nodded in the direction of Celestine, and Gentle instantly left his side, opening his arms as he went to offer the haunted air a fresh target. Come on, he said. Wherever you are, come on. Halfway between the door and his mother, he felt a cool drizzle strike his face, so fine it was invisible. Its touch was not unpleasant. In fact, it was refreshing, and he let out an appreciative gasp. It's raining in here, he said. It's the goddess, Celestine replied. She looked up from studying her hand, which Gentle now saw was running with water as though a spring had appeared in her palm. What goddess? Gentle asked her. Uma, Uma Gamaji, his mother replied. Why were you crying, Mama? I thought I was dying. I thought she'd come to take me. But she hasn't. I'm still here, child. Then what does she want? Celestine extended her arm to Gentle. She wants us to make peace, she said. Join me in the waters, child. Gentle took hold of his mother's hand, and she drew him towards her, turning her face up to the rain as she did so. The last traces of her tears were being washed away, and a look of ecstasy appeared where there had been grief. Gentle felt it too. His eyes wanted to flicker closed. His body wanted to swoon. But he resisted the rain's blandishments, tempting as they were. If it carried some message for him, he needed to know it quickly and end these delays before they cost the reconciliation dearly. Tell me, he said, as he came to his mother's side, whether you're here to stay. Tell me. But the rain made no reply, at least none that he could grasp. Perhaps his mother heard more than he did, however, because there were smiles on her glistening face and her grip on Gentle's hand became more possessive. She let the sheet she'd held to her bosom drop so that the reins could stroke her breasts and belly, and Gentle's gaze took full account of her nakedness. 
The wounds she'd sustained in her struggles with Dowd and Sartori still marked her body, but they only served to prove her perfection, and although he knew the felony here, he couldn't stem his feelings. She put her free hand up to her face and, with thumb and forefingers, emptied the shallow pools of her sockets, then once again opened her eyes. They found gentle too quickly for him to conceal himself, and he felt a shock as their looks met, not just because she read his desire, but because he found the same in her face. He rested his hand from hers and backed away, his tongue fumbling with denials. She was far less abashed than he. Her eyes remained fixed on him, and she called him back into the rain with words of invitation so soft they were barely more than sighs. When he continued to retreat, she turned to more specific exhortations. The goddess wants to know you, she said. She needs to understand your purpose. My father's business, Gentle replied. The words as much defense as explanation, shielding him from this seduction with the weight of his purpose. But the goddess, if that was what this rain really was, wouldn't be shaken off so easily. He saw a look of distress cross his mother's face as the vapors deserted her to move in pursuit of him. They passed through a spear of sun as they came and threw out rainbows. Don't be afraid of her, Gentle heard Clem say behind him. You've got nothing to hide. Perhaps this was true, but he kept on retreating nevertheless, as much from his mother as from the vapor, until he felt the comfort of his angels at his back. Guard me, he told them, his voice tremulous. Clem wrapped his arms around gentle shoulders. It's a woman, maestro, he murmured. Since when were you afraid of women? Since always, gentle replied. Hold on, for Christ's sake. Then the rain broke against their faces, and Clem let out a sigh of pleasure as its languor enclosed them. Gentle seized hard hold of his protector's arms, his fingers digging deep, but if the rain had the sinew to detach him from Clem's embrace, it didn't attempt to do so. It lingered around their heads for no more than thirty seconds, then simply passed away through the open door. As soon as it had gone, Gentle turned to Clem. Nothing to hide, eh? he said. I don't think she believed you. Are you hurt? No, she just got inside my head. Why does every damn thing want to get inside my head? It must be the view, Tay remarked, grinning with his lover's lips. She only wanted to know if your purpose was pure, child, Celestine said. Pure? Gentle said, staring at his mother venomously. What right has she got to judge me? What you call your father's business is the business of every soul in the Imagica. She had not yet claimed her modesty from the floor, and as she approached him he averted his eyes. Cover yourself, mother, he said. For God's sake, cover yourself. Then he turned and headed out into the hallway, calling after the intruder as he went. Wherever you are, he yelled. I want you out of this house. Clem, look downstairs. I'll go up. He pelted up the flight, his fury mounting at the thought of this spirit invading the meditation room. The door stood open. Little Ease was cowering in the corner when he entered. Where is she? Gentle demanded. Is she here? Is who here? Gentle didn't reply, but went from wall to wall like a prisoner, beating his palms against them. There was no sound of running water from the brick, however, nor any drizzle, however fine in the air. Content that the room was free of the visitor's taint, he returned to the door. If it starts raining in here, he said to Little Ease, yell blue murder. Any colour you like, Liberatore? Gentle slammed the door and headed along the landing, searching all the rooms in the same manner. Finding them empty, he climbed the last flight and went through the rooms above. Their air was bone dry. But as he started back down the stairs, he heard laughter from the street. 
It was Monday, though the sound he was making was lighter than Gentle had ever heard from his lips before. Suspicious of this music, he picked up the speed of his descent, meeting Clem at the bottom of the stairs, and telling him the rooms were empty below, then racing across the hallway to the front door. Monday had been busy with his chalks since Gentle had last crossed the threshold. The pavement at the bottom of the steps was covered with his designs. Not copies of glamour girls this time, but elaborate abstractions that spilled over the curb and onto the sun-softened tarmac. The artist had left off his work, however, and was now standing in the middle of the street. Gentle recognised the language of his body instantly. Head thrown back, eyes closed, he was bathing in the air. Monday! But the boy didn't hear. He continued to luxuriate in this unction, the water running over his close-cropped skull like rippling fingers, and he might have gone on bathing until he drowned in it had Gentle's approach not driven the goddess off. The rain went from the air in a heartbeat, and Monday's eyes opened. He squinted against the sky, his laughter faltering. Where'd the rain go? he said. There was no rain. What do you call this, boss? Monday said, proffering arms from which the last of the waters still ran. Take it from me, it wasn't rain. Whatever it was, it was fine by me, Monday said. He hauled his sodden T-shirt up over his head and used it as a mop to wipe his face. Are you all right, boss? Gentle was scanning the street, looking for some sign of the goddess. I will be, he said. You go back to work, huh? You haven't decorated the door yet. What do you want on it? You're the artist, Gentle said, distracted from the conversation by the state of the street. He hadn't realized until now how full of presences it had become. The revenants not simply occupying the pavement, but hovering in the wilted foliage like hanged men or keeping their vigils on the eaves. They were benign enough, he thought. They had good reason to wish him well in this endeavour. Half a year ago, on the night he and Pye had left on their travels, the mischief had given Gentle a grim lesson in the pain that the spirits of this and every other dominion suffered. No spirit is happy, Pye had said. They haunt the doors, waiting to leave, but there's nowhere for them to go. But hadn't there been some hope mooted then? that at the end of the journey ahead lay a solution to the anguish of the dead? Pye had known that solution even then, and must have longed to call Gentle Reconciler, to tell him that the wit lay somewhere in his head to open the doors at which the dead stood waiting and let them into heaven. Be patient, he murmured, knowing the revenants heard. It'll be soon, I swear. It'll be soon. The sun was drying the goddess's rain from his face, and, happy to stay out in the heat until he was dry, he wandered away from the house, while Monday resumed his whistling on the step. What a place this had become, gentle thought. Angels in the house behind him, lascivious rains in the street, ghosts in the trees, and he, the maestro, wandering among them, ready to do the deed that would change their worlds forever. There would never be such a day again. His optimistic mood darkened, however, as he approached the end of the street, for other than the sound of his footsteps and the shrill noise of Monday's whistle, the world was absolutely quiet. The alarms that had raised such a din earlier in the day were now hushed. No bell rang, no voice cried out. It was as if all life beyond this thoroughfare had taken a vow of silence. He picked up his pace. Either his agitation was contagious, or else the revenants that lingered at the end of the street were more jittery than those closer to the house. They milled around, their numbers, and perhaps their unease, sufficient to disturb the baked dust in the gutter. They made no attempt to impede his progress, but parted like a cold curtain, allowing him to step over the invisible boundary of Gamut Street. He looked in both directions. 
The dogs that had gathered here for a time had gone. The birds had fled every eave and telephone wire. He held his breath and listened through the wine in his head for some evidence of life. An engine. A siren. A shout. But there was nothing. His unease now profound, he glanced back into Gamut Street. Loath though he was to leave it, he supposed it would be safe while the revenants remained at the perimeter. Though they were too insubstantial to protect the street from attackers, it was doubtful that anyone would dare enter while they milled and churned at the corner. Taking that small comfort, he headed towards Gray's Inn Road, his walk becoming a run as he went. The heat was less welcome now. It made his legs heavy and his lungs burn. But he didn't slacken his pace until he reached the intersection. Gray's Inn Road and High Holborn were two of the city's major conduits. Had he stood at this corner on the coldest December midnight, there would have been some traffic upon one or the other. But there was nothing now, nor was there a murmur from any street, square, alleyway, or circus within earshot. The sphere of influence that had left Gamut Street untrammeled for two centuries had apparently spread and if the citizens of London were still in residence, they were keeping clear of this harrowed terrain. And yet, despite the silence, the air was not unfreighted. There was something else upon it, which kept Gentle from turning on his heel and wandering back to Gamut Street. A smell so subtle that the tang of cooking asphalt almost overwhelmed it, but so unmistakable he could not ignore even the traces that came his way. He lingered at the corner, waiting for another gust of wind. It came after a time, confirming his suspicions. There was only one source for this sickly perfume, and only one man in this city, no, in this dominion, who had access to that source. The Inn Ovo had been opened again and this time the beasts that had been called forth were not the nonsense stuff he'd encountered at the tower. These were of another magnitude entirely. He'd seen and smelled their like only once, two hundred years before, and they'd done incalculable mischief. Given that the breeze was so languid, their scent could not be coming all the way from Highgate. Sartori and his legion were considerably closer than that, perhaps ten streets away perhaps two, perhaps about to turn the corner of Gray's Inn Road and come in sight. There was no time left for prevarication. Whatever danger Jude had discovered or believed she'd discovered, it was notional. This scent, on the other hand, and the entities that oozed it, were not. He could not afford to delay his final preparations any longer. He forsook his watching place and started back towards the house as though these hordes were already on his heels. The revenants scattered as he rounded the corner and raced down the street. Monday was working on the door, but he dropped his colours as he heard the maestro's summons. It's time, boy! Gentle yelled, mounting the steps in a single bound. Start bringing the stones upstairs! We're starting? We're starting. Monday grinned, whooped, and ducked into the house, leaving Gentle to pause and admire what now adorned the door. It was just a sketch as yet, but the boy's draftsmanship was sufficient for his purpose. He'd drawn an enormous eye, with beams of light emanating from it in all directions. Gentle stepped into the house, pleased at the thought that this burning gaze would greet anyone, friend or foe, who came to the threshold. Then he closed the door and bolted it. When I next step out, he thought, the work of my father will be done. Chapter 57 Whatever debates and quarrels went on in Uma Uma Gamage's temple while Jude waited on the shore, they brought the procession of postulants to a halt. The tide carried no more women or children to the shore and after a time the waters became subdued and finally becalmed, as if their inspiring forces were so preoccupied that all other matters had become inconsequential. Without a watch, Jude could only guess at how long a time passed while she waited, 
but occasional glances up at the comet showed her that it was to be measured in hours rather than minutes. Did the goddesses fully comprehend how urgent a business this was, she wondered, or had the ages they'd spent in captivity and exile so slowed their sensibilities that their debate might last days and they not realize how much time had passed? She blamed herself for not making the urgency of this more plain to them. The day would be creeping on in the fifth, and even if Gentle had been persuaded to postpone his preparations for a time, he would not do so indefinitely. Nor could she blame him. All he had was a message, brought by a less than reliable courier, that things were not safe. That wouldn't be enough to make him put the reconciliation in jeopardy. He hadn't seen the horrors she'd seen in the Boston Bowl, so he had no real comprehension of what was at stake here. He was, in her own words, about his father's business, and the possibility that such business might mark the end of the Imagica was surely very far from his mind. She was twice distracted from these melancholy thoughts. The first time when a young girl came down to the shore to offer her something to eat and drink, which she gratefully accepted. The second, when nature called and she was obliged to scout around the island for a sheltered place to squat and empty her bladder. To be shy about passing water in this place was of course absurd and she knew it, but she was still a woman of the fifth, however many miracles she'd seen. Maybe she'd learned to become blithe about such functions eventually, but it would take time. As she returned from the place she'd found among the rocks, lighter by a bladderful, the song at the temple door, which had dropped away to a murmur and disappeared a long time before, began again. Instead of going back to her place of vigil, she headed around the temple to the door, her stride lent spring by the sight of the waters in the basin, which were stirring from their inertia and once again breaking against the shore. It seemed the goddesses had made their decision. She wanted to hear the news as soon as possible, of course, but she couldn't help but feel a little like an accused woman returning into a courtroom. There was an air of expectancy among those at the door. Some of the women were smiling. Others looked grim. If they had any knowledge of the judgment, they were interpreting it in radically different ways. Should I go in? Jude asked the woman who'd brought her food. The other nodded vigorously though Jude suspected she simply wanted to expedite a process which had delayed them all. Jude stepped back through the water curtain and into the temple. It had changed. Though the sense that her inner and outer sights were here united was as strong as ever, what they perceived was far less reassuring than it had been. There was no sign of the origami light, nor of the bodies these forms had been derived from. She was, it seemed, the sole representative of the fleshy here, and scrutinized by an incandescence far less tender than Uma Uma Gamage's gaze had been. She squinted against it, but her lids and lashes could do little to mellow a light that burned in her head rather than her corneas. Its blaze intimidated her and she wanted to retreat before it, but the thought that Uma Uma Gamage's consolation lay somewhere in its midst kept her from doing so. Goddess, she ventured. We're here together, came the reply, Jokalelao, Tishulule, and myself. As the roll was called, Jude began to distinguish shapes within the brilliance. They were not the inexhaustible glyphs she'd last seen in this place. What she saw suggested not abstractions but sinuous human forms hovering in the air above her. This was a strange turnabout, she thought. Why, when she'd previously been able to share the essential natures of Jokalelao and Uma Uma Gamaji, was she now being presented with lowlier faces? It didn't augur well for the exchange ahead. Had they clothed themselves in trivial matter because they'd decided she wasn't worthy to lay eyes on the truth of them? She concentrated hard to grasp the details of their appearance, but either her sight wasn't sophisticated enough or they were resisting her. Whichever, she could hold only impressions in her head. 
that they were naked, that their eyes were incandescent, that their bodies ran with water. Do you see us? Jude heard a voice she didn't recognize. Tisha Lule's, she presumed. Ask. Yes, of course, she said, but not, not completely. Didn't I tell you? Uma Uma Gamaji said. Tell me what? Jude wanted to know, then realized the remark wasn't directed at her, but at the other goddesses. It's extraordinary, said Tisha Lule. The pliancy of her voice was seductive, and as Jude attended to it, her nebulous form became more particular, the syllables bringing sight along with them. Her face was oriental in cast and without a trace of colour in cheek or lip or lash. Yet what should have been bland was instead exquisitely subtle, its symmetry and its curves delineated by the light that flickered in her eyes. Below its calm, her body was another matter entirely. Her entire length was covered by what Jude at first took to be tattoos of some kind, following the sweep of her anatomy. But the more she studied the goddess, and she did so without embarrassment, the more she saw movement in these marks. They weren't on her, but in her. Thousands of tiny flaps opening and closing rhythmically. There were several shoals of them she saw, each swept by independent waves of motion. One rose up from her groin, where the inspiration of them all had its place. Others swept down her limbs, out to her fingertips and toes, the motion of each shoal converging every ten or fifteen seconds, at which point a second substance seemed to spring from these slits, forming the goddess afresh in front of Jude's astonished eyes. I think you should know that I've met your gentle, Tisha Lule said. I embraced him in the cradle. He's not mine any longer, Jude replied. Do you care, Judith? Of course she doesn't care, came Jokalelau's response. She's got his brother to keep her bed warm, the Autark, the butcher of his Isordorex. Jude turned her gaze towards the goddess of the high snows. The particulars of her form were more elusive than Tishalule's had been, but Jude was determined to know what she looked like and fixed her gaze on the spiral of cold flame that burned in her core, watching until it spat bright arcs out against the limits of Jokalelau's body. The light of this collision was brief, but by it Jude got her glimpse. An imperious negress, her blazing eyes heavy-lidden, hovered there, her hands crossed at the wrist, then turned back on themselves to knit their fingers. She was not... After all, such a terrifying sight. But sensing that her face had been found, the goddess responded with a sudden transformation. Her lush features were mummified in a heartbeat, the eyes sinking away, the lips withering and retracting. Worms devoured the tongue that poked between her teeth. Jude let out a cry of revulsion and the eyes reignited in Jokalelau's sockets, the wormy mouth gaping as hard laughter rose from her throat and echoed around the temple. She's not so remarkable, sister, Jokalelau said. Look at her shake. Let her alone, Uma Uma Gamaji replied. Why must you always be testing people? We've endured because we've faced the worst and survived, Jokalelau replied. This one would have died in the snow. I doubt that, Uma Gamaji said. Sweet Judith. Still shaking, Jude took a moment to respond. I'm not afraid of death, she said to Joker Lelau, or cheap tricks. Again, Uma Gamaji spoke. Judith, she said, look at me. I just want her to understand. Sweet Judith. I'm not going to be bullied. Look at me. Now Jude did so, and this time there was no need to pierce the ambiguities. 
the goddess appeared to Jude without challenge or labor, and the sight was a paradox. Uma Umagamaji was an ancient, her body so withered it was almost sexless, her hairless skull subtly elongated, her tiny eyes so wreathed in creases they were barely more than gleams. But the beauty of her glyph was here in this flesh, its ripples, its flickers, its ceaseless, effortless motion. Do you see now? Uma Uma Gamaji said. Yes, I see. We haven't forgotten the flesh we had, she said to Jude. We've known the frailties of your condition. We remember its pains and discomforts. We know what it is to be wounded in the heart, in the head, in the womb. I see that, Jude said. Nor would we have trusted you with knowledge of our frailty unless we believed that you might one day be among us. Among you? Some divinities arise from the collective will of peoples. Some are made in the heat of stars. Some are abstractions. But some, dare we say the finest, the most loving, are the higher minds of living souls. We are such divinities, sister, and our memories of the lives we lived and the deaths we died are still sharp. We understand you, sweet Judith, and we don't accuse you. Not even Jokalelau, Jude said. The goddess of the high snows made herself apparent to her length and breadth, showing Jude her entire form in a single glance. There was a paleness moving beneath her skin, and her eyes that had been so luminous were dark. But they were fixed on Jude. She felt the stare like a stab. I want you to see, she said, what the father of the father of the child in you did to my devotees. Jude recognized the paleness now. It was a blizzard driven through the goddess's form by pain and pricking every part of her. Its drifts were mountainous, but at Jokalelau's behest they moved and uncovered the site of an atrocity. The bodies of women lay frozen where they'd fallen, their eyes carved out, their breasts taken off. Some lay close to smaller bodies, violated children, dismembered babes. This is a little part of a little part of what he did, Jokalelau said. Appalling as the sight was, Jude didn't flinch this time, but stared on at the horror until Jokalelau drew a cold shroud back over it. What are you asking me to do? Jude said. Are you telling me I should add another body to the heap? Another child? She laid her hand on her belly. This child? She hadn't realized until now how covetous she felt of the soul she was nurturing. It belongs to the butcher, Jokalelau said. No, Jude quietly replied. It belongs to me. You'll be responsible for its works. Of course, she said, strangely exhilarated by this promise. Bad can be made from good, goddess. Whole things from broken. She wondered as she spoke if they knew where these sentiments originated whether they understood that she was turning the reconciler's philosophies to her own maternal ends. If they did, they seemed not to think less of her for it. Then our spirits go with you, sister, Tishalule said. Are you sending me away again? Jude asked. You came here looking for an answer, and we can provide it. We understand the urgency of this. Uma Uma Gamaji said, and we haven't held you here without cause. I've been across the dominions while you waited, looking for some clue to this puzzle. There are maestros waiting in every dominion to undertake the reconciliation. Then Gentle didn't begin? No, he's waiting for your word. And what should I tell him? I've searched their hearts looking for some plot. 
Did you find any? No. They're not pure, of course. Who is? But all of them want the Imagica whole. All of them believe the working they're ready to perform can succeed. Do you believe it too? Yes, we do, said Tishalule. Of course they don't realize they're completing the circle. If they did, perhaps they'd think again. Why? Because the circle belongs to our sex, not to theirs, Jokalelau put in. Not true, Umagamaji said. It belongs to any mind that cares to conceive it. Men are incapable of conceiving, sister, Jokalelau replied, or hadn't you heard? Umagamaji smiled. Even that may change if we can coax them from their terrors. Her words begged many questions, and she knew it. Her eyes fixed on Jude, and she said, We'll have time for these works when you come back. But now I know you need to be fleet. Tell gentle to be a reconciler, Tisha Lule said, but share nothing that we've said with him. Do I have to be the one to tell him? Jude said to Uma Gamaji. If you've been there once, can't you go again and give him the news? I want to stay here. We understand. But he's in no mood to trust us, believe me. The message must come from you, in the flesh. I see, Jude said. There was no room for persuasion, it seemed. She had the plain answer she'd come here hoping to find. Now she had to return to the fifth with it, unpalatable as that journey would be. May I ask one question before I go? she said. Ask it, said Umagamaji. Why did you show yourselves to me this way? It was Tishalule who replied. So that you'll know us when we come to sit at your table or walk beside you in the street, she said. Will you come to the fifth? Perhaps in time. We'll have work there when the reconciliation's achieved. Jude imagined the transformation she'd seen outside wrought in London. Mother Thames climbing her banks, depositing the filth she'd been choked by in Whitehall and the Mall, then sweeping through the city, making its squares into swimming pools and its cathedrals into playgrounds. The thought made her light. I'll be waiting for you, she said, and, thanking them, made her departure. When she got outside, the waters were waiting for her, the surf lush as pillows. She didn't delay, but went straight down the beach and threw herself into its comfort. This time there was no need to swim. The tide knew its business. It picked her up and carried her across the basin like a foamy chariot, delivering her back to the rocks from which she'd first taken her plunge. Lottie Yap and Paramarola had gone, but finding her way out of the palace would be easier now than when she'd first arrived. The waters had been at work on many of the corridors and chambers that ran around the basin and on the courtyards beyond, opening up vistas of glittering pools and fountains that stretched to the rubble of the palace gates. The air was clearer than it had been, and she could see the Kesperates spread below. She could even see the harbour, and the sea at its walls, its own tide longing, no doubt, to share this enchantment. She made her way back to the staircase to find that the waters that had carried her here had receded from the bottom, leaving heaps of flotsam and jetsam behind. Picking through it, like a beachcomber granted her paradise, was Lottie Yap, and sitting on the lower steps, chatting to Paramarola, Hoi Polloi Peckable. After they'd greeted each other, Hoi Polloi explained how she'd prevaricated before committing herself to the river that had separated her from Jude. Once she jumped in, however, it had carried her safely through the palace and delivered her to this spot. Minutes later, it had been called to other duties and disappeared. We'd pretty much given up on you, said Lottie Yap. She was busy plucking the petitions and prayers from among the trash, unfolding them, scanning them, then pocketing them. Did you get to see the goddesses? 
Yes, I did. Are they beautiful? Paramarola asked, in a way. Tell us every detail. I haven't time. I have to get back to the fifth. You got your answer then, Lottie said. I did, and we've got nothing to fear. Didn't I tell you, she replied, everything's well with the world. As Jude started to pick her way through the debris, Hoi Polloi said, Can two of us go? I thought you were going to wait with us, Paramarola said. I'll come back and see the goddesses, Hoi Polloi replied. I'd like to see the fifth before everything changes. It is going to change, isn't it? Yes, it is, Jude said. Do you want something to read on your travels? Lottie asked them, proffering a fistful of petitions. It's amazing what people write. All those should go to the island, Jude said. Take them with you. Leave them at the temple door. But the goddesses can't answer every prayer, Lottie said. Lost lovers, crippled children. Don't be so sure, Jude told her. It's going to be a new day. Then, with Hoi Polloi at her side, she made the hour's second round of farewells and headed away in the general direction of the gate. Do you really believe what you said to Lottie? Hoi Polloi asked her when they'd left the staircase far behind. Is tomorrow going to be so different from today? One way or another, Jude said. The reply was more ambiguous than she'd intended, but then perhaps her tongue was wiser than it knew. Though she was going from this holy place with the word of powers far more discerning than she, their reassurance could not quite erase the memory of the bowl in Oscar's treasure room and the prophecy of dust it had shown her. She silently admonished herself for her lack of faith. Where did this seam of arrogance come from that she could doubt the wisdom of Uma Uma Gamaji herself? From now on, she would put such ambivalence away. Maybe tomorrow, or some blissful day after, she'd meet the goddesses on the streets of the Fifth and tell them that even after their comforts she still nursed some ridiculous nub of doubt. But for today she'd bow to their wisdoms and return to the Reconciler as a bearer of good news. Chapter 58 1. Gentle wasn't the only occupant of the house in Gamut Street who'd smelled the in ovo on the late afternoon breeze. So had one who'd once been a prisoner in that hell between dominions, Little Ease. When Gentle returned to the meditation room, having set Monday the task of bringing the stones up the stairs and sent Clem around the house securing it, he found his sometime tormentor up at the window. There were tears on its cheeks, and its teeth were chattering uncontrollably. He's coming, isn't he? it said. Did you see him, Liberatore? Yes, he is, and no, I didn't, Gentle said. Don't look so terrified, Easy. I'm not going to let him lay a finger on you. The creature put on its wretched grin, but with its teeth in such motion, the effect was grotesque. You sound like my mother, it said. Every night she used to tell me, Nothing's going to hurt you. Nothing's going to hurt you. I remind you of your mother. Give or take a tit, little Ease replied. She was no beauty, it has to be said. But all my fathers loved her. There was a din from downstairs, and the creature jumped. It's all right, Gentle said. It's just Clem closing the shutters. I want to be of some use. What can I do? You can do what you're doing. Watch the street. If you see anything out there, I know. Scream blue murder. With the window shuttered below, the house was thrown into a sudden dusk, in which Clem, Monday, and Gentle laboured without word or pause. By the time all the stones had been fetched upstairs, the day outside had also dwindled into twilight, and Gentle found little Ease leaning out of the window, stripping fistfuls of leaves from the tree outside, and flinging them back into the room. When he asked it what it was up to, it explained that with evening fallen, the street was invisible through the foliage, so it was clearing it away. When I begin the reconciliation, maybe you should keep watch from the floor above, Gentle suggested. 
Whatever you suggest, Liberatore, little Ease said. It slid down from the sill and stared up at him. But before I go, if you don't mind, I have a little request, it said. Yes? It's delicate. Don't be afraid. Ask it. I know you're about to start the working, and I think this may be the last time I have the honour of your company. When the reconciliation's achieved, you'll be a great man. I don't mean to say you're not one already, it added hurriedly. You are, of course. But after tonight, everyone will know you're the reconciler, and you did what Christos himself couldn't do. You'll be made Pope, and you'll write your memoirs, Gentle laughed, and I'll never see you again. And that's as it should be. That's right and proper. But before you become hopelessly famous and fated, I wondered, would you bless me? Bless you? Little Ease raised its long-fingered hands to ward off the rejection it thought was coming. I understand, I understand, it said. You've already been kind to me beyond measure. It's not that, said Gentle, going down on his haunches in front of the creature the way he had when its head had been beneath Jude's heel. I'd do it if I could. But ease I don't know how. I'm not a messiah. I've never had a ministry. I've never preached a gospel or raised the dead. You've got your disciples, little ease said. No. I've had some friends who've endured me and some mistresses who've humoured me but I've never had the power to inspire. I've frittered it away on seductions. I don't have the right to bless anybody. I'm sorry, the creature said. I won't mention it again. Then it did again what it had done when Gentle had set it free, took his hand and laid its brow upon his palm. I'm ready to die for you, Liberatore. I'm hoping that won't be necessary. Little Ease looked up. Between us, it said, so am I. Its oath made, it returned to gathering up the leaves it had deposited on the floor, putting plugs of them up its nose to stop the stench. But Gentle told it to let the rest lie. The scent of the sap was sweeter than the smell that would permeate the house if, or rather when, Sartori arrived. At the mention of the enemy, Little Ease hoisted itself back up onto the sill. Any sign? Gentle asked it. Not that I see. But what do you feel? Ah, it said, looking up through the canopy of leaves. It's such a beautiful night, Liberatore. But he's going to try and spoil it. I think you're right. Stay here a while longer, will you? I want to go around the house with Clem. If you see anything, they'll hear me in Limby, Ease promised. The beast was as good as its word. Gentle hadn't reached the bottom of the stairs when it set up a din so loud it brought dust from the rafters. Yelling for Monday and Clem to make sure all the doors were bolted, Gentle started up the stairs again, reaching the summit in time to see the door of the meditation room flung open and little ease backing through it at speed, shrieking. Whatever warning the creature was trying to offer, it was incomprehensible. Gentle didn't try and interpret it, but raced towards the room, drawing his breath in readiness to drive Sartori's invaders out. The window was empty when he entered, but the circle was not. Within the ring of stones, two forms were unknotting themselves. He'd never seen the phenomenon of passage from this perspective before, and he stood as much aghast as awed. There were too many raw surfaces in this process for comfortable viewing, but he studied the forms with mounting excitement, certain long before they were reconstituted that one of the travellers was Jude. The other, when she appeared, was a cross-eyed girl of seventeen or so, who fell to her knees sobbing with terror and relief the moment her muscles were her own again. Even Jude, who'd made this journey four times now, was shaking violently, and would have fallen when she stepped from the circle had Gentle not caught her up. The in ovo, she gasped, almost had us. Her leg had been gouged from knee to ankle. Felt teeth in me. You're all right, 
Gentle said. You've still got two legs. Clem? Clem! He was already at the door with Monday in pursuit. Have we got something to bind this up? Of course. I'll go. No, said Jude. Take me down. This is no floor to bleed on. Monday was left to comfort Hoy Polloy while Clem and Gentle carried Jude to the door. I've never seen the Innovo like that before, she said. Crazy. Sartori's been in, Gentle said, finding himself an army. He certainly stirred them up. We were about to give up on you, Clem said. Jude raised her head. Her skin was waxen with shock, and her smile too tentative to be joyful but it was there at least. Never give up on the messenger, she said, especially if she's got good news. It was three hours and four minutes to midnight, and there wasn't time for a lengthy exchange, but Gentle wanted some explanation, however brief, of what had taken Jude to his orderex. So she was made comfortable in the front room, which Monday's scavengings had furnished with pillows, foodstuffs, and even magazines. And there, while Clem bound her leg and foot, she did her best to encapsulate all that had happened to her since she'd left the retreat. It didn't make easy telling, and there were a couple of occasions when she attempted to describe scenes in his orderex and simply gave up, saying that she knew no words to describe what she'd witnessed and felt. Gentle listened without once interrupting her though his expression grew grimmer when she told of how Umu Umagamaji had passed through the dominions, seeking out the synod to be certain their motives were pure. When she was finished, he said, I was in his order X too. It's changed quite a bit. For the better, Jude said. I don't like ruin, however picturesque it is, Gentle replied. Jude eyed him strangely at this, but she said nothing. Are we safe here? Hoi Polloi said, addressing nobody in particular. It's so dark. Course we're safe, Monday said, putting his arm around the girl's shoulders. We got the whole fucking place sealed up. He's not going to get in, is he, boss? Who? Jude asked. Sartori, said Monday. Is he somewhere in the vicinity? Gentle silence was reply enough. And you think a few locks are going to keep him out? Won't they? said Hoy Polloi. Not if he wants to get in, Jude said. He won't, Gentle replied. When the reconciliation begins, there's going to be a flow of power through this house. My father's power. The thought was as distasteful to Jude as Gentle assumed it would be to Sartori, but her response was subtler than revulsion. He's your brother she reminded him. Don't be so sure he won't want a taste of what's in here, and if he does, he'll come and get it. He stared hard at her. Are we talking about power here or you? Jude took a moment before replying. Then she said, Both. Gentle shrugged. If that happens, you'll make your decision, he said. You've made them before and you've been wrong. Maybe it's time to have a little faith, Jude he stood up. Share what the rest of us already know, he said. And what's that? That in a few hours we'll be standing in a legendary place. Monday softly said, yeah, and gentle smiled. Take care down here, all of you, he said, and headed to the door. Jude reached for Clem, and with his help hauled herself to her feet. By the time she reached the door, Gentle was already on the stairs. She didn't say his name. He simply stopped for a moment and, without turning, said, I don't want to hear. Then he continued his ascent, and she knew by the slope of his shoulders and the weight of his tread that for all his prophetic talk there was a little worm of doubt in him just as there was in her, and he was afraid that if he turned and saw her, it would fatten on their look and choke him. The scent of sap was waiting for him on the threshold, and as he'd hoped it masked the sour smell from the darkened streets outside. Otherwise, his room, in which he'd lounged and laughed and debated the conundrums of the cosmos, offered no solace. It suddenly seemed to him a stagnant place, 
too well fated and swayed for its own good, the last place on earth to perform his work. But then, hadn't he berated Jude just moments ago for not having sufficient faith? There was no great power in geography. It was all rooted in the maestro's faith in the miraculous, and in the will that sprang from that faith. In preparation for the work ahead, he undressed. Once naked, he crossed to the mantelpiece, intending to fetch the candles off it and set them around the circle. But the sight of their flames in flickering array made him think instead of worship, and he dropped to his knees in front of the empty grate to pray. The Lord's Prayer came most readily to his lips, and he recited it aloud. Its sentiments had never been apter, of course, but after tonight it would be a museum piece, a relic of a time before the Lord's kingdom had come and his will been done on earth and in heaven. A touch on the back of his neck brought this recitation to a halt. He opened his eyes, raised his head, turned. The room was empty, but his nape still tingled where the touch had come. This wasn't memory he knew. It was something more delicate than that, a reminder of the other prize that lay at the end of this night's work. Not glory, not the gratitude of the dominions. Pi o pa. He looked up at the stained wall above the mantelpiece and seemed for a moment to see the mystiff's face there, changing with each flicker of the candlelight. Athanasius had called the love he felt for the mystiff profane. He hadn't believed it then, and he didn't now. The purpose that was in him as reconciler and the desire he felt for reunion were part of the same plan. The prayer was gone from his tongue. No matter, he thought. I'm its executor now. He got up, took one of the candles from the mantelpiece, and smiling stepped over the perimeters of the circle, not as a simple traveller, but as a maestro, ready to use its engine to miraculous end. 2. Lying on the cushions in the lounge below, Jude felt the flow of energies start. They ached in her chest and belly like mild dyspepsia. She rubbed her stomach in the hope of soothing the discomfort, but it did little good, so she got to her feet and hobbled out, leaving Monday to entertain Hoy Polloi with his chatter and his handiwork. He'd taken to drawing on the walls with the smoke from one of the candles, enhancing the marks with his chalks. Hoy Polloi was much impressed, and her laughter, the first Jude had ever heard from the girl, followed her out into the hallway, where she found Clem standing guard beside the locked front door. They stared at each other in the candlelight for several seconds before she said, Do you feel it too? Yep. It's not very pleasant, is it? I thought it was only me, she said. Why only you? I don't know. Some kind of punishment? You still think he's got some secret agenda, don't you? No, Jude said, glancing up the stairs. I think he's doing what he believes is best. In fact, I know it. Uma Uma Gamaji got inside his head. God, he hated that. She gave him a good report, whether he hated it or not. So? So there's still a conspiracy somewhere. Sartori? No, it's something to do with their father and this damn reconciliation. She winced as the discomfort in her belly became more severe. I'm not afraid of Sartori. It's what's going on in this house, she gritted her teeth as another wave of pain passed through her system, that I can't quite trust. She looked back at Clem and knew that, as ever, he'd listen as a loving friend, but she could expect no support from him. He and Tay were the angels of the reconciliation, and if she pressed them to decide between her welfare and that of the working, she'd be the loser. The sound of Hoy Polloi's laughter came again, not as feathery as before, but with an undertow of mischief Jude knew was sexual. She turned her back on the sound and on Clem, and her gaze came to rest on the door of the one room in this house she'd never entered. It stood a little ajar, and she could see that candles were burning inside. 
Of all the company to seek out when she was in need of comfort, Celestine's was the least promising, but all other avenues were closed to her. She crossed to the door and pushed it open. The mattress was empty, and the candle beside it was burning low. The room was too large to be illuminated by such a fitful flame, and she had to study the darkness until she found its occupant. Celestine was standing against the far wall. I'm surprised you came back, she said. Jude had heard many exquisite speakers since she'd last heard Celestine, but there was still something extraordinary in the way the woman mingled voices, one running beneath the other, as though the part of her touched by divinity had never entirely married with a baser self. Why surprised? Because I thought you'd stay with the goddesses. I was tempted, Jude replied. But finally you had to come back. For him. I was a messenger, that's all. I've got no claims on gentle now. I didn't mean gentle. I see. I meant... I know who you meant. Can't you bear to have his name spoken? Celestine had been staring at the candle flame, but now she looked up at Jude. What will you do when he's dead? she asked. He will die, you realize that. He has to. Gentle will want to be magnanimous the way victors are supposed to be. He'll want to forgive all his brother's trespasses. But there'll be too many demands for his head. Until now Jude hadn't contemplated the possibility of Sartori's demise. Even in the tower, knowing Gentle had gone in pursuit of his brother intending to stop his malice, she'd never believed he'd die. But what Celestine said was undoubtedly true. There were countless claims upon his head, both secular and divine. Even if Gentle was forgiving, Jokalela wouldn't be. Nor would the unbeheld. You're very alike, you know, you and he, Celestine said. Both copies of a finer original. You never knew Quesua, Jude replied. You don't know whether she was finer or not. Copies are always coarser. It's their nature. But at least your instinct's good. You and he belong together. That's what you're pining for, isn't it? Why don't you admit it? Why should I pour out my heart to you? Isn't that what you came in here to do? You won't get any sympathy out there. Listening by the door now. I've heard everything that's gone on in this house since I was brought here, and what I haven't heard, I've felt, and what I haven't felt, I've predicted. Like what? Well, for one thing, that child, Monday, will end up coupling with the little virgin you brought back from his Isordorex. That scarcely takes an oracle. And the Oviate isn't long for this world. The Oviate? It calls itself Little Ease, the beast you had under your heel. It asked the maestro to bless it a little while ago. It'll murder itself before daybreak. Why would it do that? It knows when Sartori perishes it'll be forfeit too, however much allegiance it's sworn to the winning side. It's sensible. It wants to choose its moment. Am I supposed to find some lesson in that? I don't think you're capable of suicide, Celestine said. You're right. I've got too much to live for. Motherhood and the future. There's going to be a change in this city. I've seen it in his order X already. The waters will rise, and the great sisterhood will dispense love from on high. Why not? Clem told me what happened when the goddess came. You were in ecstasy, so don't try and deny it. Maybe I was, but do you imagine that's going to make you and me sisters? What have we got in common besides our sex? The question was meant to sting, but its plainness made Jude see the questioner with fresh eyes. Why was Celestine so eager to deny any other link between them but womanhood? Because another such link existed and it was at the very heart of their enmity. Nor, now that Celestine's contempt had freed Jude from reverence, was it difficult to see where their stories intersected. 
From the beginning, Celestine had marked Jude out as a woman who stank of coitus. Why? Because she too stank of coitus. And this business with the child which came up again and again, that had the same root. Celestine had also borne a baby for this dynasty of gods and demigods. She too had been used and had never quite come to terms with the fact. When she raged against Jude, the tainted woman who would not concede her error in being sexual, in being fecund, she was raging against some fault in herself. And the nature of that fault? It wasn't difficult to guess or to put words to. Celestine had asked a plain question. Now it was Jude's turn. Was it really rape? she said. Celestine glanced up, her look venomous. The denial that followed, however, was measured. I'm afraid I don't know what you mean, she said. Well now, Jude replied, how else can I put it? She paused. Did Sartori's father take you against your will? The other woman now put on a show of comprehension, followed by one of shock. Of course he did, she said. How could you ask such a thing? But you knew where you were going, didn't you? I realized Dowd drugged you at the start, but you weren't in a coma all the way across the Dominions. You knew something extraordinary was waiting at the end of the trip. I don't. Remember, yes you do. You remember every mile of it. And I don't think Dowd kept his mouth shut all those weeks. He was pimping for God and he was proud of it, wasn't he? Celestine offered no repost. She simply stared at Jude, daring her to go on, which Jude was happy to do. So he told you what lay ahead, didn't he? He said that you were going to the holy city and you were going to see the unbeheld himself, not just see him, but be loved by him. And you were flattered. It wasn't like that. How was it then? Did he have his angels hold you down while he did the deed? No, I don't think so. You lay there and you let him do what the hell he wanted because it was going to make you into the bride of God and the mother of Christ. Stop! If I'm wrong, tell me how it was. Tell me you screamed and fought and tried to tear out his eyes. Celestine continued to stare but said nothing. That's why you despise me, isn't it? Jude went on. That's why I'm the woman who stinks of coitus, because I lay down with a piece of the same God that you did, and you don't like to be reminded of the fact. Don't judge me, woman! Celestine suddenly shouted. Then don't you judge me, woman! I did what I wanted with the man I wanted, and I'm carrying the consequences. You did the same. I'm not ashamed of it. You are. That's why we're not sisters, Celestine. She'd said her piece, and she wasn't much interested in a further round of insults and denials, so she turned her back and had her hand on the door when Celestine spoke. There were no denials. She spoke softly, half lost to memory. It was a city of iniquities, she said. But how was I to know that? I thought I was blessed among women to have been chosen, to be God's bride, Jude said, turning back from the door. That's a kind word, Celestine said. Yes, bride. She drew a deep breath. I never even saw my husband. What did you see? Nobody. The city was full. I know it was full. I saw shadows at the window. I saw them close up the doors when I passed, but nobody showed their faces. Were you afraid? No, it was too beautiful. The stones were full of light, and the houses were so high you could barely see the sky. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. And I walked, and I walked and I kept thinking he'll send an angel for me soon, and I'll be carried to his palace. But there were no angels. There was just the city going on and on in every direction, and I got tired after a time. I sat down, 
just to rest for a few minutes, and I fell asleep. You fell asleep? Yes, imagine. I was in the city of God, and I fell asleep. And I dreamed I was back at Tyburn, where Dowd had found me. I was watching a man being hanged, and I dug through the crowd until I was standing under the gallows. She raised her head. I remember looking up at him, kicking at the end of his rope. His breeches were unbuttoned, and his rod was poking out. The look on her face was all disgust, but she drove herself on to finish the story. And I lay down under him. I lay down in the dirt in front of all these people with him kicking and his rod getting redder and redder. And as he died, he spilled his seed. I wanted to get up before it touched me, but my legs were open and it was too late. Down it came. Not much, just a few spurts. But I felt every drop inside me like a little fire and I wanted to cry out. But I didn't because that was when I heard the voice. What voice? It was in the ground underneath me, whispering. What did it say? The same thing over and over again. Nisi Nirvana. Nisi Nirvana. Nisi Nirvana. In the process of repeating the words, tears began to flow copiously. She made no attempt to stem them, but the repetition faltered. Was it Hepeximendius talking to you? Jude asked. Celestine shook her head. Why should he speak to me? He had what he needed. I'd lain down and dreamed while he dropped his seed. He was already gone, back to his angels. So who was it? I don't know. I've thought about it over and over. I even made it into a story to tell the child so that when I'd gone he'd have the mystery for himself. But I don't think I ever really wanted to know. I was afraid my heart would burst if I ever knew the answer. I was afraid the heart of the world would burst. She looked up at Jude. So now you know my shame she said. I know your story, said Jude, but I don't see any reason for shame. Her own tears, which she'd been holding back since Celestine had begun to share this horror with her, fell now, flowing a little for the pain she felt and a little for the doubt that still churned in her, but mostly for the smile that came onto Celestine's face when she heard Jude's reply and for the sight of the other woman opening her arms and crossing the room to embrace her like a loved one who'd been lost and found again before some final fire. Chapter 59 1. If coming to the moment of reconciliation had been for gentle a series of rememberings, leading him back to himself, then the greatest of those rememberings, and the one he was least prepared for, was the reconciliation itself. Though he'd performed the working before, the circumstances had been radically different. For one, there'd been all the hoopla of a grand event. He'd gone into the circle like a prize fighter with an air of congratulation hanging around his head before he'd even worked up a sweat, his patrons and admirers a cheering throng at the sidelines. This time he was alone. For another, he'd had his eyes on what the world would shower on him when the work was done, what women would fall to him, what wealth and glory would come. This time, the prize in sight was a different thing entirely and wouldn't be counted in stained sheets and coinage. He was the instrument of a higher and wiser power. That fact took the fear away. When he opened his mind to the process, he felt a calm come upon him, subduing the unease he'd felt climbing the stairs. He'd told Jude and Clem that forces would run through the house the likes of which its bricks had never known and it was true. He felt them fuel his weakening mind, ushering his thoughts out of his head to gather the dominion to the circle. 
that gleaning began with the place he was sitting in. His mind spread to all compass points, and up and down to have the sum of the room. It was an easy space to grasp. Generations of prison poets had made the analogies for him, and he borrowed them freely. The walls were his body's limits, the door his mouth, the windows his eyes. Commonplace similitudes taxing his power of comparison not a jot. He dissolved the boards, the plaster, the glass, and all the thousand tiny details in the same lyric of confinement, and, having made them part of him, broke their bounds to stray farther afield. As his imagination headed down the stairs and up onto the roof, he felt the beginnings of momentum. His intellect, dogged by literalism, was already lagging behind a sensibility more mercurial, which was delivering back to him similitudes for the whole house before his logical faculties had even reached the hallway. Once again, his body was the measure of all things. The cellar, his bowels. The roof, his scalp. The stairs, his spine. Their proofs delivered, his thoughts flew out of the house, rising up over the slates and spreading through the streets. He gave passing consideration to Sartori as he went, knowing his other was out here in the night somewhere, skulking. But his mind was quicksilver and too exhilarated by its speed and capacity to go searching in the shadows for an enemy already defeated. With speed came ease. The streets were no more difficult to claim than the house he'd already devoured. His body had its conduits and its intersections, had its places of excrement and its fine dandified facades, had its rivers moving from a springing place and its parliament and its holy seat. The whole city he began to see could be analogized to his flesh, bone, and blood. And why should that be so surprising? When an architect turned his mind to the building of a city, where would he look for inspiration? To the flesh where he'd lived since birth. It was the first model for any creator. It was a school, and an eating house, and an abattoir, and a church. It could be a prison, and a brothel, and bedlam. There wasn't an edifice in any street in London that hadn't begun somewhere in the private city of an architect's anatomy, and all Gentle had to do was open his mind to that fact, and the districts were his, running back to swell the assembly in his head. He flew north through Highbury and Finsbury Park to Palmer's Green and Cockfosters. He went east with the river past Greenwich, where the clock that marked the coming of midnight stood, and on towards Tilbury. West took him through Marylebone and Hammersmith, south through Lambeth and Streatham, where he'd first met Pi Opar long ago. But the names soon became irrelevant. Like the ground seen from a rising plain, the particulars of a street or a district became part of another pattern, even more appetizing to his ambitious spirit. He saw the wash glittering to the east, and the channel to the south, becalmed on this humid night. Here was a fine new challenge. Was his body, which had proved the equal of a city, also the measure of this vaster geography? Why not? Water flowed by the same laws everywhere, whether the conduit was a groove in his brow or a rift between the continents. And were his hands not like two countries laid side by side in his lap, their peninsulas almost touching, their landscapes scarred and grooved? There was nothing outside his substance that was not mirrored within. No sea, no city, no street, no roof, no room. He was in the fifth, and the fifth in him, gathering to be carried into the Arna as a proof and a map and a poem written in praise of all things being one. In the other dominions the same pursuit of similitude was underway. From his circle on the Mount of Lipabayak, Tick Raw had already drawn into his net of dissolution both the city of Patashokwa and the highway that ran from its gates towards the mountains. In the third, Scopeek, his fears that the absence of the pivot would invalidate his working allayed, was spreading his grasp across the quem towards the dust bowls around Mai K. In Limbi, where he was soon to arrive, there were celebrants gathering at the temples, 
their hopes raised by prophetics who'd appeared from hiding the night before to spread the word that the reconciliation was imminent. No less inspired, Athanasius was presently travelling back along the Lenten Way to the borders of the Third and skimming the ocean to the islands, while a self more tender trod the changed streets of Isorderex. He found challenges there unknown to Scopeek, Tick Raw, or even Gentle. There were slippery wonders loose on the streets that defied easy analogy. But in inviting Athanasius to join the Synod, Scopeek had chosen better than he knew. The man's obsession with Christos, the bleeding god, gave him a grasp of what the goddesses had wrought that a man less preoccupied by death and resurrection would never have owned. In his Orderex's ravaged streets, he saw a reflection of his own physical ravagement, and in the music of the iconoclastic waters, an echo of the blood that ran from his wounds, transformed, by love of the Holy Mother he had worshipped, into a sublime and healing liquor. Only Chicka Jackeen, at the borders of the First Dominion, had to work with abstractions, for there was nothing of a physical nature he could win similitudes from. All he had was the blank wall of the erasure to set his mind on. Of the dominion that lay beyond, which it fell to him to encapsulate and carry into the armour, he had no knowledge. He hadn't spent so many years studying the mystery without finding some means to tussle with it, however. Although his body offered no analogy for the enigma that lay on the other side of the divide, there was a place in him just as sealed from sight and just as open to the inquiries made by dreaming explorers like himself. He let mind, the unbeheld process that empowered every meaningful action, that made the very devotion that kept him in his circle, be his similitude. The blank wall of the erasure was the white bone of his skull, scoured of every scrap of meat and hair. The force inside, incapable of impartial self-study, was both the god of the first and the thoughts of Chicka Jackeen, bonded by mutual scrutiny. After tonight, both would be free of the curse of invisibility. The erasure would drop and the Godhead come back into view to walk the Imagica. When that happened, when the same Godhead who'd taken the Nalayan axe into his furnace and burned their malice away was no longer divided from his dominions, there would be a revelation such as had never been known before. The dead, trapped in their condition and unable to find the door, would have a light to lead the way. And the living, no longer afraid to show their minds, would step from their houses like divinities, carrying their private heavens upon their heads for all to see. About his own work, Gentle had little grasp of what his fellow maestros were achieving, but the absence of alarm from the other dominions reassured him that all was well. All the pains and humiliations he'd endured to reach this place had been repaid in the little hours since he'd stepped into the circle. An ecstasy he'd only known for the duration of a heartbeat suffused him, confounding the conviction he'd had that such feelings only came in glimpses, because to know them for longer would burst the heart. It wasn't so. The ecstasy went on and on, and he was surviving it. More than surviving, burgeoning, his authority over the working stronger with every city and sea he retrieved into the circle where he sat. The fifth was almost there with him now, sharing the space, teaching him with its coming where the true power of a reconciler lay. It wasn't a skill with fates and sways, nor was it numers, nor resurrections, nor the driving out of demons. It was the strength to call the myriad wonders of an entire dominion by the names of his body and not be broken by the simile. To allow that he was in the world to its smallest degree and the world in him and not be driven to insanity by the intricacies he contained, or else so enamoured of the panoramas he was spread through that he lost all memory of the man he'd been. There was such pleasure in this process that laughter began to shake him as he sat in the circle. His good humour wasn't a distraction from his purpose, but instead made it easier still. 
his laugh lightened thoughts running from the circle out to regions both bright and benighted, and coming back with their prizes like runners sent with poems to a promised land, and returning with it on their backs, flowering as it came. 2. In the room above, little Ease heard the laughter and capered in sympathy with the liberatore's joy. What else could such a sound mean but that the deed was close to being done? Even if it didn't see the consequences of this triumph, it thought, its last night in the living world had been immeasurably sweetened by all it had been a party to. And should there be an afterlife for such creatures as itself, although of this it was by no means certain, then its account of this night would be a fine tale to tell when it went into the company of its ancestors. Anxious not to disturb the reconciler, it gave up its dance of celebration and was about to return to the window and its duties as night watchman when it heard a sound its paddings had concealed. Its gaze went from the sill to the ceiling. The wind had got up in the last little while and was skittering across the roof, rattling the slates as it went. Also ease thought until it realized the tree outside was as still as the quem at Equinox. Little Ease didn't come from a tribe of heroes, quite the reverse. The legends of its people concerned famous apologists, humblers, deserters, and cowards. Its instinct, hearing the sound from above, was to be away downstairs as fast as its bandy legs knew how. But it fought what came naturally for the reconciler's sake, and cautiously approached the window in the hope of gaining a glimpse of what was happening above. It climbed up onto the sill, and, belly up, slid itself out a little way, peering up at the eaves. A mist dirted the starlight, and the roof was dark. It leaned a little farther out, the sill hard beneath its bony back. From the window below the sound of the reconciler's laughter floated up, its music reassuring. Little Ease had time to smile, hearing it. Then, something as dark as the roof, and as dirty as the fog that covered the stars reached down and stopped its mouth. The attack came so suddenly, Little Ease lost its grip on the window frame and toppled backwards, but its smotherer had too tight a hold on it to let it drop, and hauled it up onto the roof. Seeing the assembly there, Ease knew its errors instantly. One, it had stopped its nostrils and so failed to smell this congregation. Two, it had believed too much in a theology which taught that evil came from below. Not so. Not so. While it had watched the street for Sartori and his legion, it had neglected the route along the roofs, which was just as secure for creatures as nimble as these. There were no more than six of them, but then there didn't need to be. The Gek are Gek were feared among the feared. Oviates that only the most overweening of maestros would have called into the dominions. As massive as tigers and as sleek, they had hands the size of a man's head and heads as flat as a man's hand. Their flanks were translucent in some lights, but here they had made a pact with darkness, and they lay all but the smotherer at the apex of the roof their silhouettes concealing the maestro until he rose and murmured that the captive be brought to his feet. Now, little ease, he said, the words too soft to be heard in the rooms below, but loud enough to make the creature evacuate its bowels in terror. I want you to spill more than your shite for me. 3. It gave Sartori no satisfaction to watch little Ease's life go out. The sense of exhilaration he'd felt at dawn when, having summoned the Gekka Gek, he'd contemplated the confrontation that lay a few hours off, had been all but sweated out of him by the heat of the intervening day. The Gekka Gek were powerful beasts and might well have survived the journey from Shiverick Square to Gamut Street, but no oviate was fond of the light from any heaven and rather than risk their debilitation, he'd stayed beneath the trees with his pride, counting off the hours. Only once had he ventured from their company and had found the streets deserted. The sight should have heartened him, 
With the area deserted, he and the creatures would be unwitnessed when they moved on the enemy. But sitting in the silent bower with his dozing legion, undistracted by even the sound of a fly, his mind had been preyed upon by fears he'd always put away until now, fears fueled by the sight of these empty streets. Was it possible that his revisionist purposes were about to be overwhelmed by some still greater revision? He realized his dreams of a new Azorderex were valueless. He'd said as much to his brother in the tower. But even if he wasn't to be an empire builder here, he still had something to live for. She was in the house in Gamut Street, yearning for him, he hoped, as he yearned for her. He wanted continuance, even if it was as hell to gentle's heaven. But the desertion of this city made him wonder if even that was a pipe dream. As the afternoon had crept on, he'd begun to look forward to reaching Gamut Street simply for the signs of life it would provide. But he'd arrived to find precious little comfort here. The phantoms that lingered at the perimeters only reminded him of how uncharitable death really was, and the sounds that issued from the house itself, a girl's giggling from one of the lower rooms, and later full-throated laughter, his brother's from the meditation room, only seemed to him signs of an idiot optimism. He wished he could scour these thoughts from his head, but there was no escape from them except, possibly, in the arms of his Judith. She was in the house, that he knew, but with the currents unleashed inside so strong, he dared not enter. What he wanted, and what he finally got from little ease, was intelligence as to her state and whereabouts. He'd assumed wrongly as it turned out that Judith was with the Reconciler. She'd taken herself off to his orderex, little Ease said, and come back with fabulous tales. But the Reconciler had not been much impressed by them. There'd been a fracas, and he'd begun his working alone. Why had she gone in the first place, he inquired. But the creature claimed it didn't know and could not be persuaded to supply an answer even though its limbs were half twisted off and its brain pan opened to the Gekar Gek's tongue. It had died protesting its ignorance, and Sartori had left the pride to toy with the carcass, taking himself off along the roof to turn over what he'd learned. Oh, for a wad of Creorchi to subdue his impatience, or else make him brave enough to beat on the door and tell her to come out and make love among the phantoms. But he was too tender to face the currents. There'd come a time, very soon, when the Reconciler, his gathering completed, would retire to the Arna. At that juncture, the Circle, its power no longer needed as a conduit to carry the analogues back into its reservoir, would turn off those currents and turn its attention to conveying the reconciler through the in ovo. There, in that window between the reconciler's removal to the Arna and the completion of the working, he would act. He'd enter the house and let a Gekar Gek take gentle, and any who rose to protect him, while he claimed Judith. Thinking of her and of the Creorchi he yearned for, he brought the blue egg out of his pocket and put it to his lips. He'd kissed its cool a thousand times in the last few hours, licked it, sucked it, but he wanted it deeper inside him, locked up in his belly, as she would be when they'd mated again. He put it in his mouth, threw back his head, and swallowed. It went down easily and granted him a few minutes of calm while he waited for the hour of his deliverance. Had Clem's head not had two tenants, he might well have forsaken his place at the front door during the hours in which the reconciler worked above. The currents which that process had unleashed had made his belly ache at the outset, but after a time their effect mellowed, suffusing his system with a serenity so persuasive he'd wanted to find a place to lie down and dream. But Tay had policed such dereliction of duty severely, and whenever Clem's attention strayed, he felt his lover's presence, which was so subtly wed and interwoven with his thoughts it only became apparent when there was a conflict of interests, rousing him to fresh vigilance. 
so he kept his post, though by now it was surely an academic exercise. The candle he had set beside the door was drowning in its own wax, and he had just stooped to wick the lip and let the excess flow off when he heard something hitting the step outside, the sound like that of a fish being slapped on a slab. He gave up his candle work and put his ear to the door. There was no further sound. Had a fruit fallen from the tree outside the house, he wondered, or was there some stranger rain tonight? He went from the door through to the room where Monday had been entertaining Hoi Polloi. They'd left it for some more private place, taking two of the cushions with them. The thought that there were lovers in the house tonight pleased him, and he silently wished them well as he crossed to the window. It was darker outside than he'd expected, and though he had a view of the step, he couldn't distinguish between objects lying upon it and the designs that Monday had drawn there. Perplexed rather than anxious, he went back to the front door and listened again. There were no further sounds, and he was tempted to let the matter alone. But he half hoped some visionary rain had indeed begun to fall, and he was too curious to ignore the mystery. He moved the candle from the door, the wax snuffing the flame as he did so. No matter. There were other candles burning at the bottom of the stairs, and he had sufficient light to find the bolts and slide them back. In Celestine's room, Jude woke and raised her head from the mattress where she'd laid it an hour before. The conversation between the women had continued for some while after their peacemaking, but Jude's exhaustion had finally caught up with her, and Celestine had suggested she rest for a while, which, reassured by Celestine's presence, she'd gladly done. Now she stirred to find that Celestine had also succumbed, her head on the mattress, her body on the floor. She was snoring softly, undisturbed by whatever had woken Jude. The door was slightly ajar, and a perfume was coming through it, stirring a faint nausea in Jude's system. She sat up and rubbed at the crick in her neck, then got to her feet. She'd slipped off her shoes before she lay down, but rather than search for them in the darkened room, she went out into the hallway barefoot. The smell was much stronger now. It was coming from the street outside, its root plain. The front door was open and the angels who'd been guarding it were gone. Calling Clem's name, she crossed the hallway, her steps slowing as she approached the open door. The candles at the stairs were bright enough to shed some light upon the step. There was something glistening there. She picked up her speed again, asking for the goddesses to be with her and with Clem. Don't let this be him, she murmured seeing that it was tissue glistening and blood in a pool around it. Please don't let this be him. It wasn't. Now that she was almost at the threshold, she saw the remnants of a face there and knew it. Sartori's agent, Little Ease. Its eyes had been scooped out, and its mouth, which had spewed pleas and flattery in such abundance, was tongueless. But there was no doubting its identity. Only a creature of the in ovo could still twitch as this did, refusing to give up the semblance of life, even if the fact of it had gone. She looked beyond the trophy into the murk of the street, calling Clem's name again. There was no answer at first. Then she heard him, his shout half smothered. Go back inside! For God's sake, go back! Clem? She stepped out of the house, bringing new cries of alarm from the darkness. Don't! Don't! I'm not going back without you, she said, avoiding the oviate's head as she advanced. She heard something let out a soft sound as she did so, like a creature growling with its maw full of bees. Who's there? she said. There was no reply at first, but she knew it would come if she waited, and whose voice it would be when it did. She did not anticipate the nature of the reply, however, or its falling note. It wasn't supposed to happen this way, Sartori said. If you've hurt Clem, I've no wish to hurt anybody. She knew that was a lie, but she also knew he'd do Clem no harm as long as he needed a hostage. Let Clem go, she said. 
Will you come to me if I do? She left a decent pause before replying so as not to seem too eager. Yes, she said. I'll come. No, Judy, Clem said. Don't. He's not alone. She could see that now as her eyes became more accustomed to the darkness. Sleek, ugly beasts prowled back and forth. One was up on its back legs, sharpening its claws on the tree. Another was in the gutter, close enough for her to see its innards through its translucent skin. Their ugliness didn't distress her. Around the fringes of any drama, such detritus was bound to accrue. Scraps of discarded characters, soiled costumes, cracked masks. They were irrelevances, and her lover had taken them for company because he felt a kinship with them. She pitied them, but him, who'd been most high, she pitied more. I want to see Clem here on the step before I make a move, she said. There was a pause, then Sartori said, I'm going to trust you. His words were followed by further sounds from the oviates that paced in the murk, and Jude saw two of them slope out of the shadows with Clem between them, his arms in their throats. They came close enough to the pavement for her to see the foam of appetite that rose from their lips. Then they literally spat their prisoner free. Clem fell face down on the road, his hands and arms covered in their muck. She wanted to go to his aid there and then, but though the captors had retreated, the tree gouger had turned and lowered its shovel head, its eyes, black as a shark's, flickering back and forth in their bulbous sockets, hungry to have the frail meat on the road. If she moved, she feared it would pounce, so she kept her place on the step while Clem hauled himself to his feet. His arms were blistered by the oviate spittle, but he was otherwise intact. I'm all right, Judy, he murmured. Go back inside. She stayed put, however, waiting until he was up and staggering across the pavement before she started down the steps. Go back, he told her again. She put her arms around him and whispered, Clem, I don't want you to argue with this. Go into the house and lock the door. I'm not coming with you. He started to speak, but she hushed him. No argument, I said. I want to see him, Clem. I want to be with him. Now please, if you love me, go inside and close the door. She felt reluctance in his every sinew, but he knew too much about the business of love, especially love that defied orthodoxy, to attempt to reason with her. Just remember what he's done, he said, as he let her go. That's all part of it, Clem, she said, and slipped past him. It was easy to leave the light behind. The ache which the currents had woken in her marrow diminished with every yard she put between herself and the house, and the thought of the embrace ahead quickened her step. This was what she wanted, and what he wanted too. Though the first causes of this passion were gone, one to dust, one to divinity, she and the man in the darkness were its embodiments and could not be denied each other. She glanced back towards the house once only to see that Clem was lingering on the step. She didn't waste time trying to persuade him to go inside, but simply turned back to the shadows. Where are you? she said. Here, her lover replied and stepped from the folds of his legion. A single strand of luminescent matter came with him, fine enough to have been woven by oviate spiders, but clotted here and there with beads like pearls, which swelled and dropped from the filaments, running down his arms and face and mottling the ground where he walked. The light flattered him, but she was too hungry for the truth of his face to be deceived, and piercing the glamour with her stare found him much reduced. The shining dandy she'd first met in Klein's plastic garden had gone. Now his eyes were heavy with despair, his mouth drawn down at the corners, his hair awry. 
Perhaps he'd always looked like this, and he'd simply used some piffling sway to mask the fact. But she doubted it. He was changed on the outside because something had changed within. Though she stood before him defenceless, he made no move to touch her, but hung back like a penitent in need of invitation before he approached the altar. She liked this new fastidiousness. I didn't hurt the angels, he said softly. You shouldn't even have touched them. It wasn't supposed to happen like this, he said again. The Gekar Gek were clumsy. They dropped some meat from the roof. I saw. I was going to wait until the power subsided and come for you in style. He paused, then asked. Would you have let me take you? Yes. I wasn't certain. I was a little afraid you'd reject me and then I'd become cruel. You're my sanity now. I can't go on without you. You went on all those years in his order, X. I had you there, he said, only by a different name. And you were still cruel. Imagine how much crueler I would have been, he said, as if amazed at the possibility, if I hadn't had your face to mellow me. Is that all I am to you? A face? You know better than that, he said, his voice dropping to a whisper. Tell me, she said, inviting his affections. He glanced back over his shoulder towards the Legion. If he spoke to them, she didn't hear it. They simply retreated, cowed by his glance. When they were gone, he put his hands to her face, his little fingers just beneath the line of her jaw, his thumbs laid lightly at the corners of her mouth. Despite the heat that was still rising from the cooked asphalt, his skin was chilly. One way or another, he said, we don't have very long, so I'll keep this simple. There's no future for us now. Maybe there was yesterday, but tonight. I thought you were going to build a new Azorderex. I was. I have the perfect model for it here. His thumbs went from the corners of her mouth to the middle of her lips and stroked them. A city made in your image, built in place of these miserable streets. But now? We don't have the time, love. My brother's about his work up there, and when he's finished, he sighed, his voice dropping lower still. When he's finished. What? she said. There was something he wanted to share, but he was forbidding himself. I hear you went back to his order, X, he said. She wanted to press him to complete his earlier explanation, but she knew better than to push too hard. So she answered him, knowing his earlier doubts could surface again if she was patient. Yes, she said. She had indeed been to his order, X, and she'd found the palace much changed. This sparked his interest. Who's taken it over? Not Rosengarten. No. The Durthers. That damn priest Athanasius. None of those. Who then? Goddesses. The web of luminescence fluttered around his head, shaken by his distress. They were always there, she told him. Or at least one was. A goddess called Uma Uma Gamaji. Have you ever heard of her? Legends. She was in the pivot. That's impossible, he said. The pivot belongs to the unbeheld. The whole of the Imagica belongs to the unbeheld. She'd never heard of a breath of subservience in him before, but she heard it now. Does he own us too? she asked him. We may escape that, he said. But it'll be hard, love. He's the father of us all. He expects to be obeyed even to the very end. Again an aching pause, but this time a request on its heels. Will you embrace me? he asked her. She answered with her arms, 
His hand slid from her face and through her hair to clasp behind her. I used to think it was a godlike thing to build cities, he murmured, and if I built one fine enough it would stand forever, and so would I. But everything passes away sooner or later, doesn't it? She heard in his words a despair that was the inverse of Gentle's visionary zeal, as though in the time she'd known them they'd exchanged their lives. Gentle the faithless lover had become a dealer in heavens, while Sartori, the sometime maker of hells, was here holding out love as his last salvation. What is God's work? she asked him quietly, if it's not the building of cities. I don't know, he said. Well, maybe it's none of our business, she said, pretending a lover's indifference to matters of moment. We'll forget about the unbeheld. We've got each other. We've got the child. We can be together for as long as we like. There was enough truth in these sentiments, enough hope in her that this vision might come true, that using it for manipulative purpose sickened her. But having turned her back on the house and all it contained, she could hear in her lover's whispers echoes of the same doubts that had made her an outcast, and if she had to use the feelings between them as a way to finally solve the enigma, so be it. Her queasiness at her deceit wasn't soothed by its effectiveness. When Sartori let out a tiny sob, as he did now, she wanted to confess her motives. But she fought the desire and let him suffer, hoping that he'd finally purge himself of all he knew, even though she suspected he'd never dared even shape these thoughts before, much less speak them. There'll be no child, he said, no being together. Why not? she said, still striving to keep her tone optimistic. We can leave now if you want. We can go anywhere and hide away. There are no hiding places left, he said. We'll find one. No, there are none. He drew away from her. She was glad of his tears. They were a veil between his gaze and her duplicity. I told the reconciler I was my own destroyer, he said. I said I saw my works and I conspired against them. But then I asked myself whose eyes am I seeing with? And you know what the answer is? My father's eyes, Judith. My father's eyes. Of all the voices to return into Jude's head as he spoke, it was Claire Alicia's she heard. Man the destroyer, willfully undoing the world. And what more perfect manhood was there than the god of the first dominion? If I see my works with these eyes and want to destroy them, Sartori murmured, what does he see? What does he want? Reconciliation, she said. Yes, but why? It's not a beginning, Judith. It's the end. When the Amaticus whole, he'll turn it into a wasteland. She drew away from him. How do you know? I think I've always known. And you said nothing? All your talk about the future? I didn't dare admit it to myself. I didn't want to believe I was anything but my own man. You understand that? I've seen you fight to see with your own eyes. I did the same. I couldn't admit he had any part of me until now. Why now? Because I see you with my eyes. I love you with my heart. I love you, Judith, and that means I'm free of him. I can admit what I know. He dissolved in grief, but his hands kept hold of her as he shook. There's nowhere to hide, love, he said. We've got a few minutes together, you and I. A few sweet moments. Then it's over. She heard everything he said, but her thoughts were as much with what was going on in the house behind her. Despite all she'd heard from Uma Uma Gamaji, despite the zeal of the maestro, despite all the calamities that would come with her interference, the reconciliation had to be halted. We can still stop him, she said to Sartori. It's too late, he replied. Let him have his victory. We can defy him a better way, a purer way. How? 
we can die together. That's not defying him. It's defeat. I don't want to live with his presence in me. I want to lie down with you and die. It won't hurt, love. He opened his jacket. There were two blades at his belt. They glittered by the light of the floating threads, but his eyes glittered more dangerously still. His tears had dried. He looked almost happy. It's the only way, he said. I can't. If you love me, you will. She drew her arm from his grasp. I want to live, she said, backing away from him. Don't desert me, he replied. There was warning in his voice as well as appeal. Don't leave me to my father. Please. If you love me, don't leave me to my father. Judith. He drew the knives out of his belt and came after her, offering the handle of one as he came like a merchant selling suicide. She swiped at the proffered blade and it went from his grasp. As it flew, she turned, hoping to the goddess that Clem had left the door open. He had, and lit every candle he could find to judge by the spill of light onto the step. She picked up her pace, hearing Sartori's voice behind her as she went. He only spoke her name, but the threat in it was unmistakable. She didn't reply. Her flight from him was answer enough, but when she reached the pavement she glanced back at him. He was picking up the dropped knife and rising. Again he said, Judith! But this time it was a warning of a different order. Off to her left a motion drew her glance. One of the Gekar Gek, the sharpener, was coming at her its flat head now wide as a manhole and toothed to its gut. Sartori yelled an order, but the thing was rogue and came on at her unchecked. She raced for the step and as she did so heard a whoop from the door. Monday was there, naked but for his grimy underwear. In his hand a homemade bludgeon which he swung around his head like a man possessed. She ducked beneath its sweep as she made the step. Clem was behind him, ready to haul her in, but she turned to call Monday to retreat, in time to see the Gekar Gek mounting the step in pursuit. Her defender didn't retreat, but brought the weapon down in a whistling arc, striking the Gekar Gek's gaping head. The bludgeon shattered, but the blow sheared off one of the beast's bulbous eyes. Though wounded, its mass was still sufficient to carry it forward, and one of its freshly honed claws found Monday's back as he turned to dodge it. The boy shrieked and might have fallen beneath the Oviate's attack if Clem hadn't grabbed his arms and all but thrown him into the house. The half-blinded beast was a yard from Jude's feet, its head thrown back as it raged in pain. But it wasn't the moor she was watching. It was Sartori. He was once again walking towards the house, a knife in each hand and a Gekar Gek at each heel. His eyes were fixed on her. They shone with sorrow. In! Clem yelled, and she relinquished both sight and step to pitch herself back over the threshold. The one-eyed Oviate came after her as she did so, but Clem was fast. The heavy door swung closed and Hoi Polloi was there to fling the bolts across, leaving the wounded beast and its still more wounded master out in the darkness. On the floor above, Gentle heard nothing of this. He had finally passed via the circle's good offices through the Innovo and into what Pi had called the mansion of the Nexus, the Arna, where he and the other maestros would undertake the penultimate phase of the working. The conventional life of the senses was redundant in this place, and for gentle being here was like a dream in which he was knowing but unknown, potent but unfixed. He didn't mourn the body he'd left in Gamut Street. If he never inhabited it again, it would be no loss, he thought. He had a far finer condition here, like a figure in some exquisite equation that could neither be removed nor reduced, but was all it had to be, no more, no less to change the sum of things. He knew the others were with him, and though he had no sight to see them with, his mind's eye had never owned so vast a palette as it did now, nor had his invention ever been finer. There was no need for cribbing and forgery here. He had earned with his metempsychosis access to a visionary grasp he'd never dreamt of possessing, and his imagination brimmed with correlatives for the company he kept. 
he invented Tick Raw, dressed in the motley he'd first seen the man wear in Van Eyff, but fashioned now from the wonders of the fourth. A suit of mountains, dusted in Joker Lelorian snow, a shirt of Partashokwa, belted by its walls, a shimmering halo of green and gold, casting its light down on a face as busy as the highway. Scopeek was a less gaudy sight, the grey dust of the quem billowing around him like a shredded coat, its particles etching the glories of the third in its folds. The cradle was there. So were the temples at Limbi. So was the Lenten Way. There was even a glimpse of the railroad track, the smoke of its locomotive rising to add its murk to the storm. Then Athanasius, dressed in a clout of dirty cloth and carrying in his bleeding hands a perfect representation of his Isordorex, from the causeway to the desert, from the harbour to Ips. The ocean ran from his wounded flank, and the crown of thorns he wore was blossoming, throwing petals of rainbow light down upon all he bore. Finally, there was Chicka Jackeen, here in lightning, the way he'd looked two hundred midsummers before. He'd been weeping then, and waxen with fright. But now the storm was his possession, not his scourge, and the arcs of fire that leapt between his fingers were a geometry, austere and beautiful, that solved the mystery of the first, and in unveiling it made perfection the new enigma. Inventing them this way, Gentle wondered if they in turn were inventing him, or whether his painter's hunger to see was an irrelevancy to them, and what they imagined, knowing he was with them, was a body subtler than any sight. It would be better that way, he supposed, and with time he'd learn to rise out of his literalisms, just as he'd shrug off the self that wore his name. He had no attachment to this gentle left, nor to the tale that hung behind. It was a tragedy, that self. Any self. It was a marriage made with loss, and had he not wanted one last glimpse of Pi O oh, Pa, he might have prayed that his reward for reconciliation would be this state in perpetuity. He knew that wasn't plausible, of course. The Arna's sanctuary existed for only a brief time, and while it did so, it had more ecumenical business than nurturing a single soul. The maestros had served their purpose in bringing the dominions into this sacred space, and would soon be redundant. They would return to their circles, leaving dominion to meld with dominion, and in so doing drive the in ovo back like a malignant sea. What would happen then was a matter of conjecture. He doubted there'd be an instant of revelation, all the nations of the fifth waking to their unfettered state in the same moment. It would most likely be slow, the work of years. Rumours at first, that bridges wreathed in fogs could be found by those eager enough to look. Then the rumours becoming certainties, and the bridges becoming causeways, and the fogs great clouds, until, in a generation or two, children were born who knew without being taught that the species had five dominions to explore and would one day discover its own godhood in its wanderings. But the time it took to reach that blessed day was unimportant. The moment the first bridge, however small, was forged, the Imagica was whole, and at that moment every soul in the dominion from cradle to deathbed would be healed in some tiny part and take their next breath lighter for the fact. Jude waited in the hall long enough to be sure that Monday wasn't dead, then she headed towards the stairs. The currents which had induced such discomforts were no longer circling in the system of the house. Sure sign that some new phase of the working, possibly its last, was underway above. Clem joined her at the bottom of the stairs, armed with another two of Monday's homemade bludgeons. How many of these creatures are there out there? he demanded. Maybe half a dozen? You'll have to watch the back door, then, he said, thrusting one of the weapons at Jude. You use it, she said, pressing past him. Keep them out for as long as you can. Where are you going? To stop Gentle. Stop him? In God's name, why? Because Dowd was right. If he completes the reconciliation, we're dead. He cast the bludgeons aside and took hold of her. No, Judy, he said. 
You know I can't let you do that. It wasn't just Clem speaking, but Tay as well. Two voices and a single utterance. It was more distressing than anything she'd heard or seen outside to have this command issue from a face she loved. But she kept her calm. Let go of me, she said, reaching for the banister to haul herself up the stairs. He's twisted your mind, Judy, the angel said. You don't know what you're doing. I know damn well, she said, and fought to wrest herself free. But Clem's arms, despite their blistering, were unyielding. She looked for some help from Monday, but he and Hoy Polloi had their backs to the door against which the Gekka Gek were beating their massive limbs. Stout as the timbers were, they'd splinter soon. She had to get to gentle before the beasts got in or it was all over. And then above the din of assault came a voice she'd only heard raised once before. Let her go! Celestine had emerged from her bedroom draped in a sheet. The candlelight shook all around her, but she was steady, her gaze mesmeric. The angels looked around at her, Clem's hands still holding Jude fast. She wants to... I know what she wants to do, Celestine said. If you're our guardians, guard us now. Let her go. Jude felt doubt loosen the hold on her. She didn't give the angels time to change their mind, but dragged herself free and started up the stairs again. Halfway up, she heard a shout and glanced down to see both Hoy Polloi and Monday thrown forward as the door's middle panel broke and a prodigious limb reached through to snatch at the air. Go on! Celestine yelled up to her, and Jude returned to her ascent as the woman stepped onto the bottom stair to guard the way. Though there was far less light above than below, the details of the physical world became more insistent as she climbed. The flight beneath her bare feet was suddenly a wonderland of grains and knotholes, its geography entrancing. Nor was it simply her sight that filled to brimming. The banister beneath her hand was more alluring than silk. The scent of sap and the taste of dust begged to be sniffed and savoured. Defying these distractions, she fixed her attention on the door ahead, holding her breath and removing her hand from the banister to minimise the sources of sensation. Even so, she was assailed. The creaks of the stairs were rich enough to be orchestrated. The shadows around the door had nuances to parade and called for her devotion. But she had a rod at her back, the commotion from below. It was getting louder all the time, and now, cutting through the shouts and roars, came the sound of Sartori's voice. Where are you going, love? he asked her. You can't leave me. I won't let you. Look, love, look, I've brought the knives. She didn't turn to see, but closed her eyes and stopped her ears with her hands, stumbling up the rest of the stairs blind and deaf. Only when her toes were no longer stubbed and she knew she was at the top did she dare the sight again. The seductions began again instantly. Every nick in every nail of the door said, Stop and study me. The dust rising around her was a constellation she could have lost herself in forever. She pitched herself through it with her gaze glued to the door handle and clasped it so hard the discomfort cancelled the beguilings long enough for her to turn it and throw the door open. Behind her, Sartori was calling again, but this time his voice was slurred as though he was distracted by profusion. In front of her was his mirror image, naked at the centre of the stones. He sat in the universal posture of the meditator, legs crossed, eyes closed, hands laid palms out in his lap to catch whatever blessings were bestowed. Though there was much in the room to call her attention, mantelpiece, window, boards, and rafters, their sum of enticements, vast as it was, could not compete with the glory of human nakedness, and this nakedness that she'd loved and lain beside more than any other. Neither the blandishments of the walls, their stained plaster like a map of some unknown country, nor the persuasions of the crushed leaves at the sill could distract her now. 
Her senses were fixed on the reconciler, and she crossed the room to him in a few short strides, calling his name as she went. He didn't move. Wherever his mind wandered, it was too far from this place, or rather, this place was too small a part of his arena, for him to be claimed by any voices here, however desperate. She halted at the edge of the circle. Though there was nothing to suggest that what lay inside was in flux, she'd seen the harm done to both Dowd and his voider when the bounds had been injudiciously breached. From down below she heard Celestine raise a cry of warning. There was no time for equivocation. What the circle would do it would do, and she'd have to take the consequences. Stealing herself, she stepped over the perimeter. Instantly, the myriad discomforts that attended passage afflicted her, itches, pangs, and spasms, and for a moment she thought the circle intended to dispatch her across the inn ovo. But the work it was about had overruled such functions, and the pains simply mounted and mounted, driving her to her knees in front of gentle. Tears spilled from her knitted lids and the ripest curses from her lips. The circle hadn't killed her but another minute of its persecutions, and it might. She had to be quick. She forced open her streaming eyes and set her gaze on gentle. Shouts hadn't roused him, nor had curses, so she didn't waste her breath with more. Instead, she seized his shoulders and began to shake him. His muscles were lax, and he lolled in her grasp, but either her touch or the fact of her trespass in this charmed circle won a response. He gasped as though he'd been drawn up from some airless deep. Now she began to talk. Gentle. Gentle. Open your eyes. Gentle. I said, open your fucking eyes. She was causing him pain, she knew. The tempo and volume of his gasps increased and his face, which had been beatifically placid, was knotted with frowns and grimaces. She liked the sight. He'd been so smug in his messianic mode. Now there had to be an end to that complacency, and if it hurt a little it was his own damn fault for being too much his father's child. Can you hear me? she yelled at him. You've got to stop the working. Gentle, you've got to stop it. His eyes started to flicker open. Good, good, she said, talking at his face like a schoolmarm trying to coax a delinquent pupil. You can do it. You can open your eyes. Go on. Do it. If you won't, I'll do it for you. I'm warning you. She was as good as her word, lifting her right hand to his left eye and thumbing back the lid. His eyeball was rolled back into its socket. Wherever he was, it was still a long way off, and she wasn't sure her body had the strength to resist its harrowment while she coaxed him home. Then, from the landing behind her, Sartori's voice. It's too late, love, he said. Can't you feel it? It's too late. She didn't need to look back at him. She could picture him well enough with the knives in his hands and elegy on his face. Nor did she reply. She needed every last ounce of will and wit to stir the man in front of her. And then inspiration. Her hand went from his face to his groin, from his eyelid to his testicles. Surely there was enough of the old gentle left in the reconciler to value his manhood. The flesh of his scrotum was loose in the warmth of the room. His balls were heavy in her hand, heavy and vulnerable. She held them hard. Open your eyes, she said, or so help me I'm going to hurt you. He remained impassive. She tightened her grip. Wake up, she said. Still nothing. She squeezed harder, then twisted. Wake up! His breath quickened. She twisted again, and his eyes suddenly opened, his gasps becoming a yell which didn't stop until there was no breath left in his lungs to loose it on. As he inhaled, his arms rose to take hold of Jude at the neck. She lost her grip on his balls, but it didn't matter. He was awake and raging. He started to rise, and, as he did so, pitched her out of the circle. She landed clumsily, but began harassing him before she'd even raised her head. You've got to stop the working! Crazy woman! he growled. I mean it! You've got to stop the working! It's all a plot! She hauled herself up. 
Dowd was right, gentle. It's got to be stopped. You're not going to spoil it now, he said. You're too late. Find a way, she said. There's got to be a way. If you come near me again, I'll kill you, he warned. He scanned the circle to be certain it was still intact. It was. Where's Clem? he yelled. Clem! Only now did he look beyond Judith to the door and beyond the door to the shadowy figure on the landing. His frown deepened into a scowl of revulsion, and she knew any hope of persuading him was lost. He saw conspiracy here. There, love, said Sartori. Didn't I tell you it was too late? The two Gekar Gek formed at his feet. The knives gleamed in his fists. This time he didn't offer the handle of either one. He'd come to take her life if she refused to take her own. Dearest one, he said, it's over. He took a step and crossed the threshold. We can do it here, he said, looking down at her. Where we were made. What better place? She didn't need to look back at Gentle to know he was hearing this. Was there some sliver of hope in that fact? Some persuasion that might drop from Sartori's lips and move Gentle where hers had failed? I'm going to have to do it for us both, love, he said. You're too weak. You can't see clearly. I don't want to die, she said. You don't have any choice, he said. It's either by the father or the son. That's all. Father or son. Behind her she heard Gentle murmur two syllables. Oh, pie. Then Sartori took a second step out of the shadow into the candlelight. When he did, the obsessive scrutiny of the room fixed him in every wretched morsel. His eyes were wet with despair, his lips so dry they were dusty. His skull gleamed through his pallid skin, and his teeth, in their array, made a fatal smile. He was deaf in every detail, and if she recognized that fact, she who loved him, then so surely did gentle. He took a third step toward her and raised the knives above his head. She didn't look away but turned her face up towards him, daring him to spoil with his blades what he'd caressed with his fingers only minutes before. I would have died for you, he murmured. The blades were at the top of their gleaming arc, ready to fall. Why wouldn't you die for me? He didn't wait for an answer, even if she'd had one to give, but let the knives descend. As they came for her eyes, she looked away, but before they caught her cheek and neck, the reconciler howled behind her, and the whole room shook. She was thrown from her knees, Sartori's blades missing her by inches. The candles on the mantelpiece guttered and went out, but there were other lights to take their place. The stones of the circle were flickering like tiny bonfires flattened by a high wind, flecks of their brightness racing from them to strike the walls. At the circle's edge stood Gentle, in his hand the reason for this turmoil. He'd picked up one of the stones, arming himself and breaking the circle in the same moment. He clearly knew the gravity of his deed. There was grief on his face, so profound it seemed to have incapacitated him. Having raised the stone, he was now motionless, as if his will to undo the working had already lost momentum. She got to her feet, though the room was shaking more violently than ever. The boards felt solid enough beneath her, but they darkened to near invisibility. She could see only the nails that kept them in place. The rest, despite the light from the stones, was pitch black, and as she started towards the circle she seemed to be treading a void. There was a noise accompanying every tremor now, a mingling of tortured wood and cracking plaster, all underscored by a guttural boiling, the source of which she didn't comprehend until she reached the edge of the circle. The darkness beneath them was indeed a void the in ovo, opened by Gentle's breaking of the circle, and in it, already woken by Sartori's dabblings, the prisoners that connived and suppurated there, rising at the scent of escape. At the door, 
the Gekka Gek set up a clamour of anticipation, sensing the release of their fellows. But for all their power, they'd have few of the spoils in the coming massacre. There were forms appearing below that made them look kittenish. Entities of such elaboration, neither Jude's eyes nor wits could encompass them. The sight terrified her, but if this was the only way to halt the reconciliation, then so be it. History would repeat itself, and the maestro be twice damned. He'd seen the OV-8's ascent as clearly as she, and was frozen by the sight. Determined to prevent him from re-establishing the status quo at all costs, she reached to snatch the stone from his hand so as to pitch it through the window. But before her fingers could grasp it, he looked up at her. The anguish went from his face, and rage replaced it. Throw the stone away, she yelled. His eyes weren't on her, however. They were on a sight at her shoulder. Sartori. She threw herself aside as the knives came down, and, clutching the mantelpiece, turned back to see the brothers face to face, one armed with blades, the other with the stone. Sartori's glance had gone to Jude as she leapt, and before he could return it to his enemy, Gentle brought the stone down with a two-handed blow, striking sparks from one of the blades as he dashed it from his brother's fingers. While the advantage was his, Gentle went after the second blade, but Sartori had it out of range before the stone could connect. So Gentle swung at the empty hand, the cracking of his brother's bones audible through the din of oviates and boards and cracking walls. Sartori made a pitiful yell and raised his fractured hand in front of his brother as if to win remorse for the hurt. But as Gentle's eyes went to Sartori's broken hand, the other, whole and sharp, came at his flank. He glimpsed the blade and half turned to avoid it, but it found his arm, opening it to the bone from wrist to elbow. He dropped the stone, a rain of blood coming after, and as his palm went up to stem the flow, Sartori entered the circle, slashing back and forth as he came. Defenceless, Gentle retreated before the blade, and, arching back to avoid the cuts, lost his footing and went down beneath his attacker. One stab would have finished him there and then. But Sartori wanted intimacy. He straddled his brother's body and squatted down upon it, slashing at Gentle's arms as he attempted to ward off the coup de grace. Jude scoured the unsolid boards for the fallen knife, her gaze distracted by the malignant forms that were everywhere turning their faces to freedom. The blade, if she could find it, would be of no use against them, but it might still dispatch Sartori. He'd planned to take his own life with one of these knives. She could still turn it to such work if she could only find it. But before she could do so, she heard a sob from the circle, and glancing back, saw Gentle sprawled beneath his brother's weight, horrendously wounded, his chest sliced open, his jaw, cheeks, and temples slashed his hands and arms crisscrossed with cuts. The sob wasn't his, but Sartori's. He'd raised the knife and was uttering this last cry before he plunged the blade into his brother's heart. His grief was premature. As the knife came down, Gentle found the strength to thrash one final time, and instead of finding his heart, the blade entered his upper chest below his clavicle. Slickened, the handle slipped through Sartori's fingers. But he had no need to reclaim it. Gentle's rally was over as suddenly as it had begun. His body uncurled, its spasms ceased, and he lay still. Sartori rose from his seat on his brother's belly and looked down at the body for a time, then turned to survey the spectacle of the void. Though the oviates were close to the surface now, he didn't hurry to act or retreat, but surveyed the whole panorama at the centre of which he stood, his eyes finally coming to rest on Jude. Oh, love, he said softly, look what you've done. You've given me to my heavenly father. Then he stooped and reached out of the circle to take hold of the stone that Gentle had removed, and with the finesse of a painter laying down a final stroke, put it back in place. The status quo wasn't instantly restored. 
The forms below continued to rise, seething with frustration as they sensed that their route into the fifth had been sealed. The fire in the stone began to go out, but before their last gutterings, Sartori murmured an order to the Gekar Gek, and they sloped from their places at the door, their flat heads skimming the ground. Jude thought at first they were coming for her, but it was gentle they'd been ordered to collect. They divided around the circle and reached over its perimeter, taking hold of the body almost tenderly and lifting it out of their maestro's way. Down the stairs, he told them, and they retreated to the door with their burden, leaving the circle in Sartori's sole possession. A terrible calm had descended. The last glimpses of the inn ovo had disappeared. The light in the stones was all but gone. In the gathering darkness, she saw Sartori find his place at the center of the circle and sit. Don't do this, she murmured to him. He raised his head and made a little grunt, as though he was surprised she was still in the room. It's already done, he said. All I have to do is hold the circle till midnight. She heard a moan from below as Clem saw what the oviates had brought to the top of the stairs. Then came the thump, 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 as the body was thrown down the flight. There could only be seconds before they came back for her, seconds to coax him from the circle. She knew only one way, and if it failed, there could be no further appeal. I love you, she said. It was too dark to see him, but she felt his eyes. I know, he said without feeling, but my heavenly father will love me more. It's in his hands now. She heard the oviates moving behind her, their breaths chilly on her neck. I don't ever want to see you again, Sartori said. Please call them off, she begged him, remembering the way Clem had been apprehended by these beasts, his arms half swallowed. Leave of your volition and they won't touch you, he said. I am about my father's business. He doesn't love you. Leave. He's incapable. Leave. She got to her feet. There was nothing left to say or do. As she turned her back on the circle, the oviates pressed their cold flanks against her legs and kept her trapped between them until she reached the threshold, to be certain she made no last attempt on their summoner's life. Then she was allowed to go unescorted onto the landing. Clem was halfway up the stairs, bludgeon in hand but she instructed him to stay where he was, fearful that the Gekar Gek would claw him to shreds if he climbed another step. The door to the meditation room slammed behind her, and she glanced back to confirm what she'd already guessed, that the Oviates had followed her out and were now standing guard at the threshold. Still nervous that they'd land some last blow, she crossed to the top of the flight as though she were walking on eggs, and only picked up her speed once she was on the stairs. There was light below, but the scene it illuminated was as grim as anything above. Gentle was lying at the bottom of the stairs, his head laid on Celestine's lap. The sheet she'd worn had fallen from her shoulders, and her breasts were bare, blooded, where she'd held her son's face to her skin. Is he dead? Jude murmured to Clem. He shook his head. He's holding on. She didn't have to ask what for. The front door was open, hanging half demolished from its hinges, and through it she could hear the first stroke of midnight from a distant steeple. The circle's complete, she said. What circle? Clem asked her. She didn't reply. What did it matter now? But Celestine had looked up from her meditation on Gentle's face and the same question was in her eyes as on Clem's lips, so Jude answered them as plainly as she could. The Imagica's a circle, she said. How do you know? Clem asked. The goddesses told me. She was almost at the bottom of the stairs, and now that she was closer to mother and son, she could see that Gentle was literally holding on to life, clutching at Celestine's arm and staring up into her face. Only when Jude sank down onto the bottom stair did Gentle's eyes go to her. I never knew, he said. 
I know, she replied, thinking he was speaking of Hepeximendius's plot. I didn't want to believe it either. Gentle shook his head. I mean the circle, he said. I never knew it was a circle. It was the goddess's secret, Jude said. Now Celestine spoke, her voice as soft as the flames that lit her lips. Doesn't Hepeximendius know? Jude shook her head. So whatever fire he sends, Celestine murmured, will burn its way around the circle. Jude studied her face, knowing there was some profit in this knowledge, but too exhausted to make sense of it. Celestine looked down at Gentle's face. Child, she said. Yes, Mama. Go to him, she said. Take your spirit into the first and find your father. The effort of breathing seemed almost too much for Gentle, never mind a journey. But what his body was incapable of, maybe his spirit could achieve. He lifted his fingers towards his mother's face. She caught hold of them. What are you going to do? Gentle said. Call his fire, Celestine said. Jude looked towards Clem to see if this exchange made any more sense to him than it did to her, but he looked completely perplexed. What was the use of inviting death when it was going to come anyway, and all too quickly? Delay him, Celestine was telling Gentle. Go to him as a loving son and hold his attention for as long as you can. Flatter him. Tell him how much you want to see his face. Can you do that for me? Of course, Mama. Good. Content that her child would do as he was charged, Celestine laid Gentle's hand back upon his chest and slid her knees out from beneath his head, lowering it tenderly to the boards. She had one last instruction for him. When you go into the first, go through the dominions. He mustn't know that there's another way. Do you understand? Yes, Mama. And when you get there, child, listen for the voice. It's in the ground. You'll hear it if you listen carefully. It says, Nisi Nirvana. That's right. I remember, Gentle said, Nisi Nirvana. As if the name were a blessing and would protect him as he went on his way, he closed his eyes and took his leave. Celestine didn't indulge in sentiment but rose, pulling the sheet up around her as she crossed to the bottom of the stairs. Now I have to speak to Sartori. That's going to be difficult. Jude said, the doors locked and guarded. He's my son, Celestine replied, looking up the flight. He'll open it for me. And so saying, she ascended. Chapter 60 1 Gentle spirit went from the house, thinking not of the father that awaited him in the first dominion, but of the mother he was leaving behind. In the hours since his return from the Tabula Rasa's tower, they'd shared all too brief a time together. He'd knelt beside her bed for a few minutes while she told the story of Nisi Nirvana. He'd held on to her in the goddess's reign, ashamed of the desire he felt, but unable to deny it. And finally, moments ago, he'd lain in her arms while the blood seeped out of him. Child, lover, cadaver. There was the arc of a little life there, and they'd have to be content with it. He didn't entirely comprehend her purpose in sending him from her, but he was too confounded to do anything but obey. She had her reasons, and he had to trust them, now that the work he'd laboured to achieve had soured. That, too, he didn't entirely comprehend. It had happened too fast. One moment he'd been so remote from his body he was almost ready to forget it entirely, the next he was back in the meditation room, with Jude's grip earning his screams, and his brother mounting the stairs behind her, his knives gleaming. 
He'd known then, seeing death in his brother's face, why the mischief had torn itself to shreds in order to make him seek Sartori out. Their father was there in that face, in that despairing certainty, and had been all along, no doubt. But he'd never seen it. All he'd ever seen was his own beauty, twisted out of true, and told himself how fine it was to be heaven to his other's hell. What a mockery that was. He'd been his father's dupe, his agent, his fool, and he might never have realized it if Jude hadn't dragged him raw from the Arna and showed him in terrible particulars the destroyer in the mirror. But the recognition had come so late, and he was so ill-equipped to undo the damage he'd done. He could only hope that his mother understood better than he where the little hope left to them lay. In pursuit of it, he'd be her agent now, and go into the first to do whatever he could at her behest. He went the long way round, as she'd instructed, his path taking him back over the territories he'd travelled when he sought out the Synod, and though he longed to swoop out of the air and pass the time of a new day with the others, he knew he couldn't linger. He glimpsed them as he went, however, and saw that they'd survived the last hectic minutes in the Arna, and were back in their dominions, beaming with their triumph. On the Mount of Lipabayak, Tick Raw was howling to the heavens like a lunatic, waking every sleeper in Van Eyf and stirring the guards in the watchtowers of Partashokwa. In the Quem, Skopik was clambering up the slope of the pivot pit where he'd sat to do his part, tears of joy in his eyes as he turned them skyward. In his Orderex, Athanasius was on his knees in the street outside the Euhetemek Kesperate, bathing his hands in a spring that was leaping up at his wounded face like a dog that wanted to lick him well. And on the borders of the first, where gentle spirit slowed, Chicka Jackeen was watching the Eurasia, waiting for the blank wall to dissolve and give him a glimpse of Hepeximendios's dominion. His gaze left the sight, however, when he felt Gentle's presence. Maestro, he said. More than any of the others, Gentle wanted to share something of what was afoot with Jackeen, but he dared not. Any exchange this close to the erasure might be monitored by the god behind it, and he knew he'd not be able to converse with this man, who'd shown him such devotion without offering some word of warning, so he didn't tempt himself. Instead, he commanded his spirit on, hearing Jackeen call his name again as he went. But before the appeal could come a third time, he passed through the erasure and into the dominion beyond. In the blind moments before the first appeared, his mother's voice echoed in his head. She went into a city of iniquities, he heard her saying, where no ghost was holy and no flesh was whole. Then the erasure was behind him, and he was hovering on the perimeters of the city of God. No wonder his brother had been an architect, he thought. Here was enough inspiration for a nation of prodigies, a labor of ages, raised by a power for whom an age was the measure of a breath. Its majesty spread in every direction but the one behind, the streets wider than the Partashokun Highway, and so straight they only disappeared at their vanishing point. The buildings so monumental, the sky was barely visible between their eaves. But whatever suns or satellites hung in the heavens of this dominion, the city had no need of their illumination. Cords of light ran through the paving stones, and through the bricks and slabs of the great houses, their ubiquity ensuring that all but the most vapid shadows were banished from the streets and plazas. He moved slowly at first, expecting soon to encounter one of the city's inhabitants. But after passing over half a dozen intersections and finding no soul on the streets, he began to pick up his speed, slowing only when he glimpsed some sign of life behind the facades. He wasn't nimble enough to catch a face, nor was he so presumptuous as to enter uninvited. But he several times saw curtains moving as though some shy but curious citizen was retiring from the sill before he could return the scrutiny. Nor was this the only sign of such presences. 
Carpets left hanging over balustrades still shook, as if their beaters had just retired from their patios. Vines dropped their leaves down as fruit gatherers fled for the safety of their rooms. It seemed that however fast he travelled, and he was moving faster than any vehicle, he couldn't overtake the rumour that drove the populace into hiding. They left nothing behind. No pet, no child, no scrap of litter, no stroke of graffiti. Each was a model citizen and kept his or her life out of sight behind the drapes and the closed doors. Such emptiness in a metropolis so clearly built to teem might have seemed melancholy had it not been for the structures themselves, which were built of materials so diverse in texture and colour, and were lent such vitality by the light that ran in them, that even though they were deserted, the streets and plazas had a life of their own. The builders had banished grey and brown from their palette, and in its place had found slate, stone, paving, and tiles of every conceivable hue and nuance, mingling their colours with an audacity no architect of the fifth would have dared. Street after street presented a spectacle of glorious colour, facades of lilac and amber, colonnades of brilliant purples, squares laid out in ochre and blue, and everywhere amid the riot scarlet of eye-pricking intensity, and a white as perfect and here and there used more sparingly still flicks and snippets of black, a tile, a brick, a seam in a slab. But even such beauty could pall, and after a thousand such streets had slipped by, all as heroically built, all as lushly coloured, the sheer excess of it became sickening, and Gentle was glad of the lightning that he saw erupt from one of the nearby streets, its brilliance sufficient to bleach the colour from the facades for a flickering time. In search of its source, he redirected himself and came into a square, at the centre of which stood a solitary figure, a Nalayanak, its head thrown back as it unleashed its silent bolts into the barely glimpsed sky. Its power was many orders of magnitude greater than anything Gentle had witnessed from its like before. It, and presumably its brothers, had a piece of the god's power between the palms of its face, and its capacity for destruction was now stupendous. Sensing the approach of the wanderer, the creature left off its rehearsals and floated up from the square as it searched for this interloper. Gentle didn't know what harm it could do to him in his present condition. If the Nalayanax were now Hapeximendius's elite, who knew what authority they'd been lent? But there was no profit in retreat. If he didn't seek some direction, he might wander here forever and never find his father. The Nalayanax was naked, but there was neither sensuality nor vulnerability in that state. Its flesh was almost as bright as its fire, its form without visible means of procreation or evacuation, without hair, without nipples, without navel. It turned and turned and turned again, looking for the entity whose nearness it sensed, but perhaps the new scale of its destructive powers had made it insensitive, because it failed to find gentle until his spirit hovered a few yards away. Are you looking for me? he said. It found him now. Arcs of energy played back and forth between the palms of its head, and out of their cracklings the creature's unmelodious voice emerged. Maestro, it said. You know who I am? Of course, it said. Of course. Its head wove like that of a mesmerized snake as it drew closer to gentle. Why are you here? it said. To see my father? Ah, I came here to honour him. So do we all. I'm sure. Can you take me to him? He's everywhere, the Nalayanak said. This is his city, and he's in its every moat. So if I speak to the ground, I speak to him, do I? The Nalayanak mused on this for a few moments. Not the ground, it said. Don't speak to the ground. Then what? The walls? The sky? You? Is my father in you? The arcs in the Nalayanak's head grew more excitable. 
No, it said. I wouldn't presume. Then will you take me to where I can do him devotion? There isn't much time. It was this remark more than any other which gained the Nanayanak's compliance. It nodded its death-laden head. I'll take you, it said, and rose a little higher, turning from gentle as it did so. But as you say, we must be swift. His business cannot wait long. 2. Though Jude had been loath to let Celestine climb the stairs above, knowing as she did what lay at the top, she also knew that her presence would only spoil what little chance the woman had of gaining access to the meditation room, so she reluctantly stayed below, listening hard, as did they all, for some clue to what was transpiring in the shadows of the landing. The first sound they heard was the warning growls of the Gekar Gek, followed by Sartori's voice, telling trespassers that their lives would be forfeit if they attempted to enter. Celestine answered him, but in a voice so low, the sense of what she said was lost before it reached the bottom of the flight, and as the minutes passed, were they minutes? Perhaps only dreadful seconds waiting for another eruption of violence. Jude could resist the temptation no longer, and snuffing out the candles closest to her, started a slow ascent. She expected the angels to make some move to stop her, but they were too preoccupied with tending to Gentle's body, and she climbed unhindered by all but her caution. Celestine was still outside the door, she saw, but the oviates were no longer blocking her way. At the instruction of the man inside, they'd shrunk away and were waiting, bellies to the ground, for a cue to do mischief. Jude was now almost halfway up the flight, and she was able to catch fragments of the exchange that was underway between mother and son. It was Sartori's voice she heard first, a wasted whisper. It's over, Mama. I know, child, Celestine said. There was conciliation in her tone, not rebuke. He's going to kill everything. Yes, I know that, too. I had to hold the circle for him. It's what he wanted. And you had to do what he wanted. I understand that, child. Believe me, I do. I served him too, remember? It's no great crime. At these words of forgiveness, the door of the meditation room clicked open and slowly swung wide. Jude was too far down the staircase to see more than the rafters, lit either by a candle or the halo of oviate tissue that had attended on Sartori when he was out in the street. With the door open, his voice was much clearer. Will you come in? he asked Celestine. Do you want me to? Yes, Mama. Please. I'd like us to be together when the end comes. A familiar sentiment, Jude thought. Apparently he didn't much care what breast he laid his sobbing head on as long as he wasn't left to die alone. Celestine put up no further show of ambivalence, but accepted her child's invitation and stepped inside. The door didn't close, nor did the Gekka Gek creep back into place to block it. Celestine was quickly gone from sight, however. Jude was sorely tempted to continue her ascent and watch what unfolded inside, but she was afraid that any further advance would be sensed by the oviates, so she gingerly sat down on the stairs, halfway between the maestro at the top and the body at the bottom. There she waited, listening to the silence of the house, of the street, of the world. In her mind, she shaped a prayer. Goddess, she thought, this is your sister Judith. There's a fire coming, goddess. It's almost upon me, and I'm afraid. From above, she heard Sartori speak, his voice now so low she could catch none of his words even with the door open but she heard the tears that they became, and the sound broke her concentration. The thread of her prayer was lost. No matter, she'd said enough to summarize her feelings. The fire's almost upon me, goddess. I am afraid.
What was there left to say? 3. The speed at which Gentle and the Nalayanak travelled didn't diminish the scale of the city they were passing through. Quite the opposite. As the minutes passed and the streets continued to flicker by, thousand upon thousand, their buildings all raised from the same ripely coloured stone, all built to obscure the sky, all laid to the horizon, the magnitude of this labour began to seem not epic, but insane. However alluring its colours were, however satisfying its geometrics and exquisite its details, the city was the work of a collective madness, a compulsive vision that had refused to be placated until it had covered every inch of the dominion with monuments to its own relentlessness. Nor was there any sign of any life on any street, leading Gentle to a suspicion that he finally voiced, not as a statement, but as a question. Who lives here? he said. Hapaxamendios. And who else? It's his city, the Nalayanak said. Are there no citizens? It's his city. The answer was plain enough. The place was deserted. The shaking of vines and drapes he'd seen when he'd first arrived had either been caused by his approach or, more likely, been a game of illusion the empty buildings had devised to while away the centuries. But at last, after travelling through innumerable streets that were indistinguishable from each other, there were finally subtle signs of change in the structures ahead. Their luscious colours were steadily deepening. The stone so drenched it must soon surely ooze and run and there was a new elaboration in the façades and a perfection in their proportions that made Gentle think that he and the Nalayanak were approaching the first cause, the district of which the streets they'd passed through had been imitations, diluted by repetition. Confirming his suspicion that the journey was nearing its end, Gentle's guide spoke. He knew you'd come, it said. He sent some of my brothers to the perimeter to look for you. Are there many of you? Many, the Nalayanak said. Minus one. It looked in Gentle's direction. But you know this, of course. You killed him. He would have killed me if I hadn't. And wouldn't that have been a proud boast for our tribe, it said, to have killed the Son of God? It made a laugh from its lightning, though there was more humour in a death rattle. Aren't you afraid? Gentle asked it. Why should I be afraid? Talking this way when my father may hear you. He needs my service, came the reply, and I do not need to live. It paused, then said, Though I would miss burning the dominions. Now it was Gentle's turn to ask why. Because it's what I was born to do. I've lived too long waiting for this. How long? Many thousands of years, maestro. Many, many thousands. It silenced Gentle to think that he was travelling beside an entity whose span was so much vaster than his own, and anticipated this imminent destruction as its life's reward. How far off was that prize, he wondered. His sense of time was impoverished without the tick of breath and heartbeat to aid it, and he had no clue as to whether he'd vacated his body in Gamut Street two minutes before, or five, or ten. It was in truth academic. With the dominions reconciled, Hapeximendios could choose his moment, and Gentle's only comfort was the continued presence of his guide, who would be, he suspected, gone from his side at the first call to arms. As the street ahead grew denser, the Nalayanak's speed and height dropped until they were hovering inches above the ground, the buildings around them grotesquely elaborate now, every fraction of their brick and stonework etched and carved and filigreed. There was no beauty in these intricacies, only obsession. Their surfeit was more morbid than lively, like the ceaseless, witless motion of maggots. And the same decadence had overcome the colours, the delicacy and profusion of which he'd so admired in the suburbs. Their nuances were gone. Every colour now competed with scarlet, the mingled show not brightening the air but bruising it, 
nor was there light here in the same abundance as there had been at the outskirts of the city. Though seams of brightness still flickered in the stone, the elaboration that surrounded them devoured their glow and left these depths dismal. I can go no farther than this reconciler, the Nalayanak said. From here you go alone. Shall I tell my father who found me? Gentle said, hoping that the offer might coax a few more tidbits from the creature before he came into her Peximendius's presence. I have no name, the Nalayanak replied. I am my brother, and my brother is me. I see. That's a pity. But you offered me a kindness, reconciler. Let me offer you one. Yes. Name me a place to destroy in your name, and I'll make it my business to do so. A city, a country, whatever. Why would I want that? Gentle said. Because you're your father's son, came the reply, and what your father wants, so will you. Despite all his caution, Gentle couldn't help but give the destroyer a sour look. No, it said. No. Then we're both without gifts to give, it said, and turning its back, rose and went from Gentle without another word. He didn't call after it for directions. There was only one way to go now, and that was on, into the heart of the metropolis, choked though it was by gourd and elaboration. He had the power to go at the speed of thought, of course, but he wished to do nothing that might alarm the unbeheld, so took his spirit into the garish gloom like a pedestrian, wandering between edifices so fraught with ornament they could not be far from collapse. As the splendours of the suburbs had given way to decadence, so decadence had in its turn given way to pathology a state that drove his sensibilities beyond distaste or antipathy to the borders of panic. That mere excess might squeeze such anguish out of him was revelation in itself. When had he become so rarefied, he, the crass copyist, he, the Sybarite, who'd never said enough, much less too much? What had he become? A phantom aesthete driven to terror by the sight of his father's city? Of the architect himself there was no sign, and rather than advance into complete darkness, Gentle stopped and simply said, Father? Though his voice had very little authority here, it was loud in such utter silence, and must surely have gone to every threshold within the radius of a dozen streets. But if Herpeximendius was in residence behind any of these doors, he made no reply. Gentle tried again. Father, I want to see you. As he spoke, he peered down the shadowy street ahead, looking for some sign, however vestigial of the unbeheld's whereabouts. There was no murmur, no motion. But his study was rewarded by the slow comprehension that his father, for all his apparent absence was in fact here in front of him, and to his left, and to his right, and above his head, and beneath his feet. What were those gleaming folds at the windows if they weren't skin? What were those arches if they weren't bone? What was this scarlet pavement and this light-shot stone if it wasn't flesh? There was pith and marrow here. There was tooth and lash and nail. The Nalayanak hadn't been speaking of spirit when it had said that Herpeximendius was everywhere in this metropolis. This was the city of God, and God was the city. Twice in his life he'd had presentiments of this revelation. The first time when he'd entered his Orderex, which had been commonly called a city god itself, and had been, he now understood, his brother's unwitting attempt to recreate his father's masterwork. The second, when he'd undertaken the business of similitudes and had realised, as the net of his ambition encompassed London, that there was no part of it from sewer to dome that was not somehow analogous to his anatomy. Here was that theory proved. The knowledge didn't strengthen him, but instead fueled the dread he felt, thinking of his father's immensity. He'd crossed a continent and more to get here 
and there'd been no part of it that was not made as these streets were made, his father's substance replicated in unimaginable quantities to become the raw materials for the masons and carpenters and hod-carriers of his will. And yet, for all its magnitude, what was his city? A trap of corporeality, and its architect, its prisoner. Oh, father, he said, and perhaps because the formality had gone from his voice and there was sorrow in it, he was finally granted a reply. You've done well for me, the voice said. Gentle remembered its monotony well. Here was the same barely discernible modulation he'd first heard as he'd stood in the shadow of the pivot. You've succeeded where all the others failed, Hapeximendius said. They went astray or let themselves be crucified. But you, reconciler, you held to your course. For your sake, father. And that service has earned you a place here, the god said. In my city. In my heart. Thank you, Gentle replied, fearful that this gift was going to mark the end of the exchange. If so, he'd have failed as his mother's agent. Tell him you want to see his face, she'd said. Distract him. Flatter him. Ah, yes, flattery. I want to learn from you now, father, he said. I want to be able to carry your wisdom back into the fifth with me. You've done all you need to do, reconciler, Hapeximendius said. You won't need to go back into the fifth for your sake or mine. You'll stay with me and watch my work. What work is that? You know what work, came the god's reply. I heard you speak with the Nalayanak. Why are you pretending ignorance? The inflections in his voice were too subtle to be interpreted. Was there genuine inquiry in the question, or a fury at his son's deceit? I didn't wish to presume, father, Gentle said, cursing himself for this gaff. I thought you'd want to tell me yourself. Why would I tell you what you already know? the god said, unwilling to be persuaded from this argument until he had a convincing answer. You already have every knowledge you need. Not everyone, Gentle said, seeing now how he might divert the flow. What do you lack? Apexamendius said. I'll tell you everything. Your face, father. My face? What about my face? That's what I lack, the sight of your face. You've seen my city the unbeheld replied. That's my face. There's no other? Really, father? None? Aren't you content with that? Hapeximendius said. Isn't it perfect enough? Doesn't it shine? Too much, father. It's too glorious. How can a thing be too glorious? Part of me's human, father and that part's weak. I look at this city and I'm a gog. It's a masterwork. Yes, it is. Genius! Yes, it is. But, Father, grant me a simpler sight. Show me a glimpse of the face that made my face so that I can know the part of me that's you. He heard something very like a sigh in the air around him. It may seem ridiculous to you, Gentle said, but I've followed this course because I wanted to see one face, one loving face. There was enough truth in this to lend his words real passion. There was indeed a face he'd hoped to find at the end of his journey. Is it too much to ask? he said. There was a flutter of movement in the dingy arena ahead, and Gentle stared into the murk in the expectation of some colossal door opening. But instead, Apexamendius said, Turn your back, reconciler.
You want me to leave? No, only avert your eyes. Here was a paradox, to be told to look away when sight was requested. But there was something other than an unveiling afoot. For the first time since entering the Dominion, he heard sounds other than a voice. A delicate rustling, a muted patter, creaks and whirrings stealing on his ear. And all around him tiny motions in the solid street as the monoliths softened and inclined towards the mystery he'd turned his back upon. A step gaped and oozed marrow. A wall opened where stone met stone and a scarlet deeper than any he'd seen, a scarlet turned almost black, ran in rills as the slabs yielded up their geometry, lending themselves to the unbeheld's purpose. Teeth came down from an unknitted balcony above, and loops of gut unraveled from the sills, dragging down curtains of tissue as they came. As the deconstruction escalated, he dared the look he'd been forbidden, glancing back to see the entire street in gross or petty motion, forms fracturing, forms congealing, forms drooping and rising. There was nothing recognisable in the turmoil, and Gentle was about to turn away when one of the pliant walls tumbled in the flux, and for a heartbeat, no more, he glimpsed a figure behind it. The moment was long enough to know the face he saw and have it in his mind's eye when he looked away. There was no face its equal in the Imagica. For all the sorrow on it, for all its wounds, it was exquisite. Pi was alive and waiting there in his father's midst, a prisoner of the prisoner. It was all Gentle could do not to turn there and then and pitch his spirit into the tumult, demanding that his father give the mischief up. This was his teacher, he'd say, his renewer, his perfect friend but he fought the desire, knowing such an attempt would end in calamity, and instead turned away again, doting on the glimpse he'd had while the street behind him continued to convulse. Though the mischief's body had been marked by the hurts it had suffered, it was more whole than gentle had dared hope. Perhaps it had drawn strength from the land on which Hapeximendius's city was built, the dominion its people had worked their fates upon before God had come to raise this metropolis. But how should he persuade his father to give the mischief up? With pleas? With further flattery? As he chewed on the problem, the ructions around him began to subside, and he heard Hapeximendius speak behind him. Reconciler? Yes, father? You wanted to see my face. Yes, father. Turn and look. He did so. The street in front of him had not lost all semblance of a thoroughfare. The buildings still stood, their doors and windows visible. But their architect had claimed from their substance sufficient pieces of the body he'd once owned to recreate it for Gentle's edification. The father was human, of course, and had perhaps been no larger than his son in his first incarnation. But he'd remade himself three times Gentle's height, and more. A teetering giant that was as much borne up by the street he'd racked for matter as of it. For all his scale, however, his form was ineptly made, as if he'd forgotten what it was like to be whole. His head was enormous the shards of a thousand skulls claimed from the buildings to construct it, but so mismatched that the mind it was meant to shield was visible between the pieces, pulsing and flickering. One of his arms was vast, yet ended in a hand scarcely larger than gentles, while the other was wizened but finished with fingers that had three dozen joints. His torso was another mass of misalliances, his innards cavorting in a cage of half a thousand ribs, his huge heart beating against a breastbone too weak to contain it and already fractured, and below, at his groin, the strangest deformation. A sex he'd failed to conjure into a single organ, but which hung in rags, raw and useless. Now, 
the god said. Do you see? The impassivity had gone from his voice, its monotony replaced by an assembly of voices, as many larynxes, none of them whole, laboured to produce each word. Do you see, he said again, the resemblance? Gentle stared at the abomination before him, and, for all its patchworks and disunions, knew that he did. It wasn't in the limbs, this likeness, or in the torso, or in the sex. But it was there. When the vast head was raised, he saw his face in the ruin that clung to his father's skull. A reflection of a reflection of a reflection, perhaps, and all in cracked mirrors. But, oh, it was there. The sight distressed him beyond measure, not because he saw the kinship, but because their roles seemed suddenly reversed. Despite its size, it was a child he saw, its head fetal, its limbs untutored. It was eons old, but unable to slough off the fact of flesh, while he, for all his naivetes, had made his peace with that disposal. Have you seen enough, reconciler? Apexamendius said. Not quite. What then? Gentle knew he had to speak now before the likeness was undone again and the walls were resealed. I want what's in you, father. In me? Your prisoner, father. I want your prisoner. I have no prisoner. I'm your son, Gentle said. The flesh of your flesh. Why do you lie to me? The unwieldy head shuddered. The heart beat hard against the broken bone. Is there something you don't want me to know? Gentle said, starting towards the wretched body. You told me I could know everything. The hands, great and small, twitched and jittered. Everything, you said, because I've done you perfect service. But there's something you don't want me to know. There's nothing. Then let me see the mystiff. Let me see Pi O Pa. At this, the god's body shook, and so did the walls around it. There were eruptions of light from beneath the flawed mosaic of his skull, little raging thoughts that cremated the air between the folds of his brain. The sight was a reminder to Gentle that, however frail this figure looked, it was the tiniest part of Hapeximendius's true scale. He was a city the size of a world, and if the power that had raised that city and sustained the bright blood in its stone was ever allowed to turn to destruction, it would beggar the null iron axe. Gentle's advance, which had so far been steady, was now halted. Though he was a spirit here and had thought no barrier could be raised against him, there was one before him now, thickening the air. Despite it, and the dread he felt when reminded of his father's powers, he didn't retreat. He knew that if he did so, the exchange would be over and Hapeximendius would be about his final business, his prisoner unreleased. Where's the pure, obedient son I had? the god said. Still here, Gentle replied, still wanting to serve you if you'll deal with me honorably. A series of more livid bursts erupted in the distended skull. This time, however, they broke from its dome and rose into the dark air above the god's head. There were images in these energies, fragments of Hapeximendius's thoughts shaped from fire. One of them was Pi. You've no business with the mischief, Apexamendius said. It belongs to me. No, father, to me. I married it, father. The lightning was quieted momentarily, and the god's pulpy eyes narrowed. It made me remember my purpose, Gentle said. It made me remember to be a reconciler. I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't have served you if it weren't for Pi O Pa. Maybe it loved you once, the many throats replied, but now I want you to forget it.
put it out of your head forever. Why? In reply came the parent's eternal answer to a child who asks too many questions. Because I tell you to, the god said. But gentle wouldn't be hushed so readily. He pressed on. What does it know, father? Nothing. Does it know where Nisi Nirvana comes from? Is that what it knows? The fire in the unbeheld skull seethed at this. Who told you that? He raged. There was no purpose served by lying, gentle thought. My mother, he said. Every motion in the god's bloated body ceased, even to its cage-battering heart. Only the lightning went on, and the next word came not from the mingled throats, but from the fire itself. Three syllables, spoken in a lethal voice. Sell. Est. Ein. Yes, father. She's dead, the lightning said. No, father. I was in her arms a few minutes ago. He lifted his hand, translucent though it was. She held these fingers. She kissed them. And she told me, I don't want to hear, to remind you. Where is she? Of Nisi Nirvana. Where is she? Where? Where? He had been motionless, but now rose up in his fury, lifting his wretched limbs above his head as if to bathe them in his own lightning. Where is she? he yelled, throats and fire making the demand together. I want to see her. I want to see her. Four. On the stairs below the meditation room, Jude stood up. The Gek Ar Gek had begun a guttural complaint that was in its way more distressing than any sound she'd ever heard from them. They were afraid. She saw them sloping away from their places beside the door like dogs in fear of a beating, their spines depressed, their heads flattened. She glanced at the company below, the angel still kneeling beside their wounded maestro. Monday and Hoi Polloi leaving off their vigil at the step and coming back into the candlelight as though its little ring could preserve them from whatever power was agitating the air. Oh, Mama, she heard Sartori whisper. Yes, child. He's looking for us, Mama. I know. You can feel it. Yes, child, I can. Will you hold me, Mama? Will you hold me? Where? Where? The god was howling, and in the arcs above his skull, shreds of his mind's sight appeared. Here was a river, serpentine, and a city, drabber than his metropolis, but all the finer for that, and a certain street, and a certain house. Gentle saw the eye Monday had scrawled on the front door, its pupil beaten out by the Oviate's attack. He saw his own body with Clem beside it, and the stairs, and Jude on the stairs climbing. And then the room at the top, and the circle in the room, with his brother sitting inside it, and his mother kneeling at the perimeter. Sell est ein, the god said. Sell. Est. Ein. It wasn't Sartori's voice that uttered these syllables, but it was his lips that moved to shape them. Jude was at the top of the stairs now, and she could see his face clearly. It was still wet with tears, but there was no expression upon it whatsoever. She'd never seen features so devoid of feeling. He was a vessel filling up with another soul. Child, Celestine said. Get away from him, Jude murmured. Celestine started to rise. You sound sick, child, she said. The voice came again, this time a furious denial. I am not. 
a child. You wanted me to comfort you, Celestine said. Let me do that. Sartori's eyes looked up, but it wasn't his sight alone that fixed on her. Keep away, he said. I want to hold you, Celestine said, and instead of retreating she stepped over the boundary of the circle. On the landing the Gekar Gek were in terror now, their sly retreat become a dance of panic. They beat their heads against the wall as if to hammer out their brains rather than hear the voice issuing from Sartori, this desperate, monstrous voice that said over and over, Keep away! Keep away! But Celestine wouldn't be denied. She knelt down again in front of Sartori. When she spoke, however, it wasn't to the child, it was to the father, to the god who'd taken her into this city of iniquities. Let me touch you, love, she said. Let me touch you the way you touched me. No! Apexamendius howled, but his child's limbs refused to rise and ward off the embrace. The denial came again and again, but Celestine ignored it, her arms encircling them both, flesh and occupying spirit in one embrace. This time, when the god unleashed his rejection, it was no longer a word but a sound as pitiful as it was terrifying. In the first, Gentle saw the lightning above his father's head congeal into a single blinding flame and go from him like a meteor. In the second, Chickajackeen saw the blaze brighten the erasure and fell to his knees on the flinty ground. A signal fire was coming, he thought, to announce the moment of victory. In his Orderex, the goddesses knew better. As the fire broke from the erasure and entered the second dominion, the waters around the temple grew quiescent, so as not to draw death down upon them. Every child was hushed. Every pool and rivulet stilled. But the fire's malice wasn't meant for them, and the meteor passed over the city, leaving it unharmed, outblazing the comet as it went. With the fire out of sight, Gentle turned back to his father. What have you done? he demanded. The god's attention lingered in the fifth for a little time, but as Gentle's demand came again, he withdrew his mind from his target, and his eyes regained their animation. I've sent a fire for the whore, he said. It was no longer the lightning that spoke, but his many throats. Why? Because she tainted you. She made you want love. Is that so bad? You can't build cities with love, the god said. You can't make great works. It's weakness. And what about Nisi Nirvana? Gentle said. Is that a weakness too? He dropped to his knees and laid his phantom palms on the ground. They had no power here, or else he'd have started digging. Nor could his spirit pierce the ground. The same barrier that sealed him from his father's belly kept him from looking into his dominion's underworld. But he could ask the questions. Who spoke the words, father? he asked. Who said Nisi Nirvana? Forget you ever heard those words, Apexamendius replied. The whore is dead. It's over. In his frustration, Gentle made fists of his hands and beat on the solid ground. There's nothing there but me, the many throats went on. My flesh is everywhere. My flesh is the world, and the world is my flesh. On the Mount of Lipabayak, Tick Raw had given up his triumphal jig and was sitting at the edge of his circle, waiting for the curious to emerge from their houses and come up to question him, when the fire appeared in the fourth. Like Chickajackeen, he assumed it was some star of annunciation sent to mark the victory, and he rose again to hail it. 
he wasn't alone. There were several people below who'd spotted the blaze over the Joker Leilau and were applauding the spectacle as it approached. When it passed overhead, it brought a brief noon to Van Aef before going on its way. It lit Partashokwa just as brightly, then flew out of the Dominion through a fog that had just appeared beyond the city, marking the first passing place between the Dominion of green-gold skies and that of blue. Two similar fogs had formed in Clerkenwell, one to the southeast of Gamut Street and the other to the northwest, both making doorways in the newly reconciled Dominion. It was the latter that became blinding now as the fire sped through it from the fourth. The sight was not unwitnessed. Several revenants were in the vicinity, and though they had no clue as to what this signified, they sensed some calamity and retreated before the radiance, returning to the house to raise the alarm. But they were too sluggish. Before they were halfway back to Gamut Street, the fog divided, and the unbeheld's fire appeared in the benighted streets of Clerkenwell. Monday saw it first, as he forsook the little comfort of the candlelight and returned to the step. The remnants of Sartori's hordes were raising a cacophony in the darkness outside, but even as he crossed the threshold to ward them off, the darkness became light. From her place on the top stair, Jude saw Celestine lay her lips against her son's, and then, with astonishing strength, lift his dead weight up and pitch him out of the circle. Either the impact or the coming fire stirred him, and he began to rise, turning back towards his mother as he did so. He was too late to reclaim his place. The fire had come. The window burst like a glittering cloud, and the blaze filled the room. Jude was flung off her feet, but clutched the banister long enough to see Sartori cover his face against the holocaust, as the woman in the circle opened her arms to accept it. Celestine was instantly consumed, but the fire seemed unappeased and would have spread to burn the house to its foundations had its momentum not been so great. It sped on through the room, demolishing the wall as it went. On, on, towards the second fog that Clerkenwell boasted tonight. What the fuck was that? Monday said in the hallway below. God, Jude replied. Coming and going. In the first, Hapeximendius raised his misbegotten head. Even though he didn't need the assembly of sight that gleamed in his skull to see what was happening in his dominion, he had eyes everywhere. Some memory of the body that had once been his sole residence made him turn now as best he could and look behind him. What is this? he said. Gentle couldn't see the fire yet, but he could feel whispers of its approach. What is this? Apexamendius said again. Without waiting for a reply, he began feverishly to unknit his semblance, something Gentle had both feared and hoped he'd do. Feared because the body from which the fire had been issued would doubtless be its destination, and if it was too quickly undone, the fire would have no target. And hoped, because only in that undoing would he have a chance to locate Pi. The barrier around his father's form softened as the god was distracted by the intricacies of this dismantling, and though Gentle had yet to get a second glimpse of Pi, he turned his thought to entering the body. But for all his perplexity, Hapeximendius was not about to be breached so readily. As Gentle approached, a will too powerful to be denied seized hold of him. What is this? the god demanded a third time. Hoping he might yet gain a few precious seconds' reprieve, Gentle answered with the truth. The Imagica's a circle, he said. A circle? This is your fire, father. This is your fire coming around again. Apexamendius didn't respond with words. He understood instantly the significance of what he'd been told and let his hold on gentle slip again, in order to turn all his will to the business of unknitting himself. 
the ungainly body began to unravel, and, in its midst, Gentle once again glimpsed Pi. This time the mystiff saw him. Its frail limbs thrashed to clear a way through the turmoil between them. But before Gentle could finally wrest himself from his father's custody, the ground beneath Pi Opa grew unsolid. The mystiff reached up to take hold of some support in the body above, but it was decaying too fast. The ground gaped like a grave, and, with one last despairing look in Gentle's direction, the mystiff sank from sight. Gentle raised his head in a howl, but the sound he made was drowned out by that of his father, who, as if in imitation of his child, had also thrown back his head. But his was a din of fury rather than sorrow, as he wrenched and thrashed in his attempts to speed his unmasking. Beyond him now the fire. As it came, Gentle thought he saw his mother's face in the blaze, shaped from ashes, her eyes and mouth wide as she returned to meet the god who'd raped, rejected, and finally murdered her. A glimpse, no more, and then the fire was upon its maker, its judgment absolute. Gentle's spirit was gone from the conflagration at a thought, but his father, the world his flesh, the flesh his world could not escape it. His fetal head broke, and the fire consumed the shards as they flew, its blaze cremating his heart and innards and spreading through his mismatched limbs, burning them away to every last fingertip and toe. The consequence for his city was both instantly felt and calamitous. Every street from one end of the Dominion to the other shook as the message of collapse went from the place where its first cause had fallen. Gentle had nothing to fear from this dissolution, but the sight of it appalled him nevertheless. This was his father, and it gave him neither pleasure nor satisfaction to see the body whose child he was now reel and bleed. The imperious towers began to topple their ornament dropping in rococo rains, their arches forsaking the illusion of stone and falling as flesh. The streets heaved and turned to meat. The houses threw down their bony roofs. Despite the collapse around him, Gentle remained close to the place where his father had been consumed in the hope that he might yet find Pi O Pa in the maelstrom. But it seemed Hapeximendius's last voluntary act had been to deny the lovers their reunion. He'd opened the ground and buried the mystiff in the pit of his decay, sealing it with his will to prevent Gentle from ever finding Pi again. There was nothing left for the reconciler to do but leave the city to its decease, which in due course he did, not taking the route across the dominions but going back the way the fire had come. As he flew, the sheer enormity of what was underway became apparent. If every living body that had passed a span on earth had been left to putrefy here in the first, the sum of their flesh would not begin to approach that of this city. Nor would this carrion rot into the ground and its decomposition feed a new generation of life. It was the ground. It was the life. With its passing, there would only be putrescence here. Decay, laid on decay, laid on decay. A dominion of filth, polluted until the end of time. Ahead now, the fog that divided the city's outskirts from the fifth. Gentle passed through it, returning gratefully to the modest streets of Clerkenwell. They were drab, of course, after the brilliance of the metropolis he'd left but he knew the air had the sweetness of summer leaves upon it, even if he couldn't smell that sweetness, and the welcome sound of an engine from Holborn or Gray's Inn Road could be heard, as some fleet fellow, knowing the worst was past, got about his business. It was unlikely to be legal work at such an hour, but Gentle wished the driver well, even in his crime. The Dominion had been saved for thieves as well as saints. He didn't linger at the passing place, but went as fast as his weary thoughts would drive him, back to number 28, and the wounded body that was still clinging to continuance at the bottom of the stairs. 
At the top, Jude hadn't waited for the smoke to clear before venturing into the meditation room. Despite a warning shout from Clem, she'd gone up into the murk to find Sartori, hoping that he'd survived. His creatures hadn't. Their corpses were twitching close to the threshold, not struck by the blast, she thought, but laid low by their summoner's decline. She found that summoner easily enough. He was lying close to where Celestine had pitched him, his body arrested in the act of turning towards the circle. It had been his undoing. The fire that had carried his mother to oblivion had seared every part of him. The ashes of his clothes had been fused with his blistered back, his hair singed from his scalp, his face cooked beyond tenderness. But like his brother, lying in ribbons below, he refused to give up life. His fingers clutched the boards. His lips still worked, bearing teeth as bright as a death's head smile. There was even power in his sinews. When his blood-filled eyes saw Jude, he managed to push himself up until his body rolled over onto its charred spine, and he used his agonies to fuel the hand that clutched at her, dragging her down beside him. My mother. She's gone. There was bafflement on his face. Why, he said shudders convulsing him as he spoke. She seemed to want it. Why? So that she'd be there when the fire took her Peximendius, Jude replied. He shook his head, not comprehending the significance of this. How could that be? he murmured. The Imagic is a circle, she said. He studied her face, attempting to puzzle this out. The fire went back to the one who sent it. Now the sense of what she was telling him dawned. Even in his agony, here was a greater pain. He's gone, he said. She wanted to say, I hope so, but she kept that sentiment to herself and simply nodded. And my mother, too. Sartori went on. The trembling quieted. So did his voice, which was already frail. I'm alone, he said. The anguish in these last few words was bottomless, and she longed to have some way of comforting him. She was afraid to touch him for fear of causing him still greater discomfort, but perhaps there was more hurt in her not doing so. With the greatest delicacy, she laid her hand over his. You're not alone, she said. I'm here. He didn't acknowledge her solace, perhaps didn't even hear it. His thoughts were elsewhere. I should never have touched him, he said softly. A man shouldn't lay hands on his own brother. As he squeezed out these words, there was a moan from the bottom of the stairs, followed by a yelp of pure joy from Clem, and then Monday's ecstatic whoops. Boss, oh boss, oh boss! Do you hear that? Jude said to Sartori. Yes. I don't think you killed him after all. A strange tick appeared around his mouth, which after a moment she realized was the shreds of a smile. She took it to be pleasure at gentle survival, but its source was more bitter. That won't save me now, he said. His hand, which was laid on his stomach, began to knead the muscles there, its clutches so violent that his body began to spasm. Blood bubbled up between his lips, and he moved his hand to his mouth as if to conceal it. There he seemed to spit his blood into his palm. Then he removed his hand and offered its grisly contents to her. Take it, he said, uncurling his fist. She felt something drop into her hand. She didn't glance at his gift, however, but kept her eyes fixed on his face as he looked away from her, back towards the circle. 
She realized even before his gaze had found its resting place that he was looking away from her for the final time, and she started to call him back. She said his name. She called him love. She said she'd never wanted to desert him, and never would again, if he'd only stay. But her words were wasted. As his eyes found the circle, the life went from them, his last sight not of her, but of the place where he'd been made. In her palm, bloody from his belly and throat, lay the blue egg. After a time, she got up and went out onto the landing. The place at the bottom of the stairs where Gentle's body had lain was empty. Clem was standing in the candlelight with both tears and a broad smile on his face. He looked up at Jude as she started down the stairs. Sartori, he said. He's dead. What about Celestine? Gone, she said. But it's over, isn't it? Hoi Polloi said. We're going to live. Are we? Yes, we are, said Clem. Gentle saw Hapexamendius destroyed. Where is Gentle? He went outside, Clem said. He's got enough life in him. For another life? For another twenty, the lucky bugger, came Tay's reply. Reaching the bottom of the stairs, she put her arms around Gentle's protectors, then went out onto the step. Gentle was standing in the middle of the street, wrapped in one of Celestine's sheets. Monday was at his side, and he was leaning on the boy as he stared up at the tree that grew outside number 28. Apexamendius's fire had charred much of its foliage, leaving the branches naked and blackened but there was a breeze stirring the leaves that had survived, and after such a long, motionless time, even these shreds of wind were welcome. Final, simple proof that the Amagica had survived its perils and was once again drawing breath. She hesitated to join him, thinking perhaps he'd prefer to have these moments of meditation uninterrupted. But his gaze came her way after half a minute or so, and though there was only starlight and the last guttering flames in the fretwork above to see him by, the smile was as luminous as ever, and as inviting. She left the step, but, as she approached, saw that his smile was slender, and the wounds he'd sustained deeper than cuts. I failed, he said. The Imagica's whole, she replied. That isn't failure. He looked away from her down the street. The darkness was full of agitation. The ghosts are still here, he said. I swore to them I'd find a way out, and I failed. That was why I went with Pye in the first place, to find Taylor a way out. Maybe there isn't one, came a third voice. Clem had appeared on the doorstep, but it was Tay who spoke. I promised you an answer, Gentle said. And you found one. The Imagica's a circle, and there's no way out of it. We just go round and round. Well, that's not so bad, Gentle. We have what we have. Gentle lifted his hand from Monday's shoulder and turned away from the tree and from Jude and from the angels on the step. As he hobbled out into the middle of the street, his head bowed, he murmured a reply to Tay too quiet for any but an angel's ear. It's not enough, he said. Chapter 61 1. For the living occupants of Gamut Street, the days that followed the events of that midsummer were as strange in their way as anything that had gone before. The world that returned to life around them seemed to be totally ignorant of the fact that its existence had hung in the balance, and if it now sensed the least change in its condition, it concealed its suspicion very well. The monsoons and heat waves that had preceded the reconciliation were replaced the next morning with the drizzles and tepid sunshine of an English summer. 
its moderation the model for public behaviour in subsequent weeks. The eruptions of irrationality which had turned every junction and street corner into a little battleground summarily ceased. The night walkers Mundy and Jude had seen watching for revelation no longer strayed out to peer quizzically at the stars. In any other city than London, perhaps the mysteries now present in its streets would have been discovered and celebrated. If such fogs as lingered in Clerkenwell had appeared instead in Rome, the Vatican would have been pronouncing on them within a week. Had they appeared in Mexico City, the poor would have been through them in a shorter time still, desperate for a better life in the world beyond. But England, oh England! It had never had much of a taste for the mystical, and with all but the weakest of its evocators and fate workers murdered by the tabula rasa, there was nobody to begin the labour of freeing minds locked up in dogmas and utilities. The fogs were not entirely ignored, however. The animal life of the city knew something was afoot and came to Clerkenwell to sniff it out. The runaway dogs who'd gathered in the vicinity of Gamut Street when the revenants had come, only to be frightened off by Sartori's horde, now returned, their noses twitching after some piquant scent or other. Cats came too, yowling in the trees at dusk, curious but casual. There were also visitations by bees and birds, who twice in the three days following midsummer gathered in the same stupefying numbers as Monday and Jude had witnessed at the retreat. In all these cases, the packs, swarms, and flocks disappeared after a time, having discovered the source of the perfumes and poles that had directed them to the district, and gone into the fourth to have a life under different skies. But if no two-legged traffic passed into the fourth, there was certainly some in the opposite direction. A little over a week after the reconciliation, Tick Roar arrived on the doorstep of number 28, and, having introduced himself to Clement Monday, asked to see the maestro. He came into a house that was a good deal more comfortable than his quarters in Van Aef, furnished as it was from a score of recent burglaries by Monday and Clem but the atmosphere of domesticity was cosmetic. Though the bodies of the Gekka Gek had been removed and buried, along with their summoner beneath the long grass in Shiverick Square, though the front door had been mended and the bloodstains mopped up, though the meditation room had been scoured and the stones of the circle individually wrapped in linen and locked away, the house was charged with all that had happened here. The deaths, the love scenes, the reunions and revelations. You're living in the middle of a history lesson, Tick Raw said when he sat himself down beside the bed in which Gentle lay. The reconciler was healing, but even with his extraordinary powers of recuperation it would be a lengthy business. He slept twenty hours or more out of every twenty-four, and barely ventured from his mattress when he was awake. You look as though you've seen some wars, my friend, Tick Raw said. More than I'd like, Gentle replied wearily. I sniff something oviate. Gek our gek, Gentle said. Don't worry, they're gone. Did they break through during the ceremony? No. It's more complicated than that. Ask Clem. He'll tell you the whole story. No offence to your friends, Tick Raw said, fetching a jar of pickled sausage from his pocket but I'd prefer to hear it from you. I've thought about it too much as it is, Gentle said. I don't want to be reminded. But we won the day, Tick Raw said. Doesn't that merit a little celebration? Celebrate with Clem, Tick. I need to sleep. As you like, as you like, Tick Raw said, retreating to the door. Oh, I wonder... Do you mind if I stay here for a few days? There's a number of parties in Van Aef who want the grand tour of the fifth, and I've volunteered to show them the sights. But as I don't yet know them myself... Be my guest, Gentle said, and forgive me if I don't brim with bonhomie. No apology required, Tick Raw said. 
I'll leave you to sleep. That evening, Tick did as Gentle had suggested and plied both Clem and Monday with questions until he had the full story. So when do I meet the mesmeric Judith? he asked when the tale was told. I don't know if you ever will, Clem said. She didn't come back to the house after we buried Sartori. Where is she? Wherever she is, Monday said dolefully. Hoy Poloi's with her. Just my fucking luck. Well, now listen, Tick Raw said. I've always had a way with the ladies. I'll make you a deal. If you show me this city, inside out, I'll show you a few ladies the same way. Monday's palm went from his pocket, where it had been stroking the consequence of Hoy Poloi's absence, and seized hold of Tick Raw's hand before it was even extended. You're a gentleman and a squalor, Monday said. You got yourself a tour, mate. What about gentle? Tick Raw said to Clem. Is he languishing for want of female company? No, he's just tired. He'll get well. Will he? said Tick Raw. I'm not so sure. He's got the look of a man who'd be happier dead than alive. Don't say that. Very well, I didn't say it. But he has, Clement, and we all know it. The vigour and noise Tick Raw brought into the house only served to emphasise the truth of that observation. As the days passed and turned to weeks, there was little or no improvement in Gentle's mood. He was, as Tick Raw had said, languishing and Clem began to feel the way he had during Tay's final decline. A loved one was slipping away, and he could do nothing to prevent it. There weren't even those moments of levity that they had been with Tay when good times had been remembered and the pain superseded. Gentle wanted no false comforts, no laughter, no sympathy. He simply wanted to lie in his bed and steadily become as bland as the sheets he lay upon. Sometimes, in his sleep, the angels would hear him speaking in tongues, the way Tay had heard him talk before. But it was nonsense that he muttered, reports from a mind that was rambling without map or destination. Tick Raw stayed in the house a month, leaving with Monday at dawn and returning late, having had another day seeing the sights and acquiring the appetites of this new dominion. His sense of wonder was boundless his capacity for pleasure prodigal. He found he had a taste for eel pie and elgar, for Speaker's Corner at Sunday noon and the Ripper's haunts at midnight, for dog races, for jazz, for waistcoats made in Savile Row and women hired behind King's Cross Station. As for Monday, it was clear from the face he wore whenever he returned that the hurt of Hoy Poloi's desertion was being kissed away. When Tick Raw finally announced that it was time to return to the fourth, the boy was crestfallen. Don't worry, Tick told him. I'll be back, and I won't be alone. Before he departed, he presented himself at Gentle's bedside with a proposal. Come to the fourth with me, he said. It's time you saw Patashokwa. Gentle shook his head. But you haven't seen the Mero T.E.T., Tick protested. I know what you're trying to do, Tick, Gentle said. And I thank you for it, really I do. But I don't want to see the fourth again. Well, what do you want to see? The answer was simple. Nothing. Oh, now stop this, Gentle. Tick Raw said. It's getting damn boring. You're behaving as though we lost everything. We didn't. I did. She'll come back. You'll see. Who will? Judith. Gentle almost laughed at this. It's not Judith I've lost, he said. Tick Raw realized his error then, and came as near to dumbfounded as he ever got. All he could manage was, ah. 
For the first time since Tick Raw had appeared at his bedside the month before, Gentle actually looked at his guest. Tick, he said, I'm going to tell you something I've told nobody else. What's that? When I was in my father's city, he paused, as though the will to tell was going from him already, then began again. When I was in my father's city, I saw Pi Opa. Alive? For a time. Oh, Jeezu, how did it die? The ground opened up beneath it. That's terrible. Terrible. Do you see now why it doesn't feel like a victory? Yes, I see. But gentle. No more persuasions, Tick. There are such changes in the air. Maybe there are miracles in the first the way there are in his Isordorex. It's not out of the question. Gentle studied his tormentor, eyes narrowed. The Yerhetemex were in the first long before Hapeximendios, remember? Tick went on. And they worked wonders there. Maybe those times have returned. The land doesn't forget. Men forget. Maestros forget. But the land? Never. He stood up. Come with me to a passing place, he said. Let's look for ourselves. Where's the harm? I'll carry you on my back if your legs don't work. That won't be necessary, Gentle said, and throwing off the sheets, got out of bed. Though the month of August had yet to begin, the early months of summer had been marked by such excesses that the season had burned itself out prematurely and when Gentle, accompanied by Tick and Clem, stepped out into Gamut Street, he met the first chills of autumn on the step. Clem had found the fog that let on to the First Dominion within forty-eight hours of the reconciliation, but had not entered it. After all that he'd heard about the state of the unbeheld city, he'd had no wish to see its horrors. He led the maestros to the place readily enough, however. It was little more than half a mile from the house, hidden in a cloister behind an empty office building. A bank of grey fog, no more than twice the height of a man which rolled upon itself in the shadowed corner of the empty yard. Let me go first, Clem said to Gentle. We're still your guardians. You've done more than enough, Gentle said. Stay here. This won't take long. Clem didn't contradict the instruction, but stepped aside to let the maestros enter the fog. Gentle had passed between dominions many times now, and was used to the brief disorientation that always accompanied such passage. But nothing, not even the abattoir nightmares that had haunted him after the reconciliation, could have prepared him for what was waiting on the other side. Tick Raw, ever a man of instant responses, vomited as the stench of putrescence came to meet them through the fog, and though he stumbled after Gentle, determined not to leave his friend to face the first alone, he covered his eyes after a single glance. The Dominion was decayed from horizon to horizon, everywhere rot and more rot, suppurating lakes of it and festering hills. Overhead, in skies Gentle had barely seen as he passed through his father's city, clouds the colour of old bruises half hid two yellowish moons, their light falling on a filth so atrocious the hungriest kite in the quem would have starved rather than feed here. This was the city of God, Tick, Gentle said. This was my father. This was the unbeheld. In a sudden fury he tore at Tick's hands, which were clamped to the man's face. Look, damn you, look! I want to hear you tell me about the wonders, Tick. Go on, tell me. Tell me! Tick didn't go back to the house when he and Gentle emerged from the passing place, but with some murmured words of apology headed off into the dusk, saying he needed to be on his home turf for a while 
and that he'd come back when he'd regained his composure. Sure enough, three days later he reappeared at number 28, still a little queasy, still a little shame-faced, to find that Gentle had not returned to his bed, but was up and about. The reconciler's mood was brisk, rather than blithe. His bed, he explained to Tick, was not the refuge it had previously been. As soon as he closed his eyes, he saw the slaughterhouse of the first in every atrocious detail, and could now only sleep when he'd driven himself to such exhaustion that there was no time between his head striking the pillow and oblivion for his mind to dwell on what he'd witnessed. Luckily, Tick had brought distractions in the form of a party of eight tourists. He preferred excursionists from Van Eyff, who were relying upon him to introduce them to the rights and rarities of the Fifth Dominion. Before the tour began, however, they were eager to pay their respects to the great reconciler, and did so with a succession of painfully overworked speeches which they read aloud before presenting Gentle with the gifts they'd brought. Smoked meats, perfumes, a small picture of Patashokwa rendered in Zazi wings, a pamphlet of erotic poems by Pluthro Quexus's sister. The group was the first of many Tick brought in the next few weeks, freely admitting to Gentle that he was turning a handsome profit from his new role. Have a holy day in the city of Sartori, was his pitch and the more satisfied customers who returned to Van Eyff with tales of eel pies and Jack the Ripper, the more who signed on to take the excursion. He knew the boom time couldn't last, of course. In a short while, the professional tour operators in Patashokwa would start trading, and he'd be unable to compete with their slick packages, except in one particular regard. Only he could guarantee an audience, however brief, with the maestro Sartori himself. The time was coming, Gentle realized, when the fifth would have to face the fact that it was reconciled, whether it liked it or not. The first few sightseers from Van Eyff and Patashokwa might be ignored, but when their families came, and their families' families, creatures in shapes, size, and assemblies that demanded attention, the people of this dominion would be able to overlook them no longer. It would not be long before Gamut Street became a sacred highway, with travellers passing down it in not one but both directions. When it did, living in the house would become untenable. He, Clem and Monday, would have to vacate number 28 and leave it to become a shrine. When that day arrived, and it would be soon, he would be forced to make a momentous decision. Should he seek out some sanctuary here in Britain, or leave the island for a country where none of his lives had ever taken him? Of one thing he was certain, he would not return to the Fourth, or any dominion beyond it. Though it was true that he'd never seen Patashokwa, there had only ever been one soul he'd wanted to see it with, and that soul was gone. 2. Times were no less strange or demanding for Jude. She'd decided to leave the company in Gamut Street on the spur of the moment, expecting that she'd return there in due course. But the longer she stayed away, the harder it became to return. She hadn't realized until Sartori was gone how much she'd mourn. Whatever the source of the feelings she had for him, she felt no regrets. All she felt was loss. Night after night, she'd wake up in the little flat she and Hoy Polloy had rented together. The old place was too full of memories. Shaken to tears by the same terrible dream. She was climbing those damn stairs in Gamut Street, trying to reach Sartori as he lay burning at the top, but for all her toil, never managing to advance a single step. And always the same words on her lips when Hoy Polloy woke her. Stay with me. Stay with me. Though he'd gone forever, and she would have to make her peace with that eventually, he'd left a living keepsake. And as the autumn months came, it began to make its presence felt in no uncertain fashion, its kicking keeping her awake when the nightmares didn't. She didn't like the way she looked in the mirror, 
her stomach a glossy dome, her breasts swelling and tender. But Hoy Polloi was there to lend comfort and companionship whenever it was needed. She was all Jude could have asked for during those months, loyal, practical, and eager to learn. Though the customs of the Fifth were a mystery to her at first, she soon became familiar with its eccentricities and even fond of them. This was not, however, a situation that could continue indefinitely. If they stayed in the Fifth and Jude had the child there, what could she promise it? A rearing and an education in a dominion that might come to appreciate the miracles in its midst some distant day, but would in the meantime ignore or reject whatever extraordinary qualities the child was blessed with. By the middle of October she'd made up her mind. She'd leave the fifth with or without Hoy Polloi and find some country in the Imagica where the child, whether it was a prophetic, a melancholic, or simple priapic, would be allowed to flourish. In order to take that journey, of course, she would have to return to Gamut Street or its environs, and though that was not a particularly attractive prospect, it was better to do so soon, she reasoned, before many more sleepless nights took their toll and she felt too weak. She shared her plans with Hoy Polloi, who declared herself happy to go wherever Jude wished to lead. They made swift preparations and four days later left the flat for the last time with a small collection of valuables to pawn when they got to the fourth. The evening was cold, and the moon, when it rose, had a misty halo. By its light, the thoroughfares around Gamut Street were iridescent with the first etchings of frost. At Jude's request, they went first to Shiverick Square, so that she could pay her last respects to Sartori. Both his grave and those of the Oviates had been well disguised by Monday and Clem, and it took her quite a while to find the place where he was buried. But find it she did, and spent twenty minutes there, while Hoy Polloi waited at the railings. Though there were revenants in the nearby streets, she knew he would never join their ranks. He'd not been born, but made, the stuff of his life stolen. The only existence he had after his decease was in her memory and in the child. She didn't weep for that fact, or even for his absence. She'd done all she could, weeping and begging him to stay. But she did tell the earth that she'd loved what it was heaped upon, and charged it to give Sartori comfort in his dreamless sleep. Then she quit the graveside, and together she and Hoi Polloi went looking for the passing place into the fourth. It would be day there, bright day, and she'd call herself by another name. Number 28 was noisy that night. The cause, a celebration in honour of Irish, who'd that afternoon been released from prison, having served a three-month sentence for petty theft, and had arrived on the doorstep with Carol, Benedict, and several cases of stolen whisky to toast his release. The house was by now a trove of treasures, all gifts to the maestro from Tick Raw's excursionists, and there was no end to the drunken fooling these artefacts, many of them total enigmas, inspired. Gentle was feeling as facetious as Irish, if not more so. After so many weeks of abstinence, the substantial amounts of whiskey he'd imbibed had his head spinning, and he resisted Clem's attempts to engage him in serious conversation despite the latter's insistence that the matter was urgent. Only after some persuading did he follow Clem to a quieter place in the house, where his angels told him that Judith was in the vicinity. He was somewhat sobered by the news. Is she coming here? he asked. I don't think so, Clem said, his tongue passing back and forth over his lips as though her taste was upon them. But she's close. Gentle didn't need further prompting. With Monday in tow, he went out into the street. There were no living creatures in sight, only the revenants, listless as ever, their joylessness made all the more apparent by the sound of merrymaking that emanated from the house. I don't see her, Gentle said to Clem, who had followed them out as far as the step. Are you sure she's here? It was Tay who replied. You think I wouldn't know when Judy was near? Of course I'm certain. Which direction? 
Monday wanted to know. Now Clem again, cautioning. Perhaps she doesn't want to see us. Well, I want to see her, Gentle replied. At least a drink for old time's sake. Which direction, Tay? The angels pointed, and Gentle headed off down the street with Monday, bottle in hand, close on his heels. The fog that let on to the fourth looked inviting, a slow wave of pale mist that turned and turned on itself but never broke. Before she and Hoy Polloy stepped into it, Jude took a few moments to look up. The plough was overhead. She wouldn't be seeing it again. Then she said, That's enough goodbyes, and together they took a step into the mist. As they did so, Jude heard the sound of running feet in the alleyway behind them and gentle calling her name. She'd been aware that their presence might be detected and had schooled them both in how best to respond. Neither woman turned. They simply picked up their pace and headed on through the mist. It thickened as they went, but after a dozen steps daylight began to filter through from the other side and the fog's clammy cold gave way to balm. Again, Gentle called after her, but there was a commotion up ahead, and it all but drowned out his call. Back in the fifth, Gentle came to a halt at the edge of the fog. He'd sworn to himself that he'd never leave the Dominion again, but the drink swilling in his system had weakened his resolve. His feet itched to go after her into the fog. Well, boss, Monday said, are we going, or aren't we? Do you care either way? Yes, as it happens. You'd still like to get your hands on Hoy Polloi, huh? I dream about her, boss. Cross-eyed girls every night. Ah, well, Gentle said. If we're chasing dreams, then I think that's good reason to go. Yeah? In fact, it's the only reason. He grabbed hold of Monday's bottle and took a healthy swig from it. Let's do it, he said, and together they plunged into the fog, running over ground that softened and brightened as they went, paving stones becoming sand, night becoming day. They caught sight of the women briefly, grey silhouettes against the peacock sky ahead, then lost them again as they gave chase. The gleam of day grew, however, and so did the sound of voices, which rose to the din of an excited crowd as they emerged from the passing place. There were buyers, sellers, and thieves on every side, and, disappearing into the throng, the women. They followed with renewed fervour, but the tide of people conspired to keep them from their quarry and after half an hour of fruitless pursuit, which finally brought them back to the fog and the commercial hubbub which surrounded it, they had to admit that they'd been outmaneuvered. Gentle was tetchy now, his head no longer buzzing but aching. They're away, he said. Let's give up on it. Shit! People come, people go. You can't afford to get attached to anyone. It's too late. Monday said dolefully. I am. Gentle squinted at the fog, his lips pursed. It was a cold October on the other side. I tell you what, he said after a little time, we'll wander over to Van Eyf and see if we can find Tick Raw. Maybe he can help us. Monday beamed. You're a hero, boss. Lead the way. Gentle went on tiptoe, attempting to orient himself. Trouble is, I haven't a bloody clue where Van Eyf is, he said. He collared the nearest passerby and asked him how to get to the mount. The fellow pointed over the heads of the crowd, leaving the boss and his boy to burrow their way to the edge of the market, where they had a view not of Van Eyf, but of the walled city that stood between them and the mount of Lipabayak. The grin reappeared on Monday's face broader than ever, and on his lips the name he'd so often breathed like an enchantment. Parta Shokwa? Yes. We painted it on the wall together. Do you remember? I remember. What's it like inside? Gentle was peering at the bottle in his hand, 
wondering if the peculiar exhilaration he felt was going to pass with the headache that accompanied it. Boss? What? I said, what's it like inside? I don't know. I've never been. Well, shouldn't we? Gentle thrust the bottle at Monday and sighed, a lazy, easy sigh that ended in a smile. Yes, my friend, he said. I think maybe we should. 3. Thus began the last pilgrimage of the maestro Sartori, called John Fury Zacharias, or Gentle, the reconciler of dominions, across the Imagica. He hadn't intended it to be a pilgrimage at all, but having promised Monday that they would find the woman of his dreams, he couldn't bring himself to desert the boy and return to the fifth. They began their search, of course, in Partashokwa, which was more prosperous than ever these days, with its proximity to the newly reconciled dominion creating businesses every day. After almost a year of wondering what the city would be like, Gentle was inevitably somewhat disappointed once he got inside its walls. But Monday's enthusiasm was a sight in itself, and a poignant reminder of his own astonishment when he and Pye had first entered the fourth. Unable to trace the women in the city, they went on to Van Eyre, hoping to find Tick. He was off travelling, they were told, but one sharp-sighted individual claimed to have seen two women who fitted the description of Jude and Hoy Polloi hitching a ride at the edge of the highway. An hour later, Gentle and Monday were doing the same thing, and the pursuit that was to take them across the dominions began in earnest. For the maestro, the journey was very different from those that had preceded it. The first time he'd made this trek, he'd travelled in ignorance of himself, failing to comprehend the significance of the people he'd met and the places he'd seen. The second time, he'd been a phantom, flying at the speed of thought between members of the Synod, his business too urgent to allow him to appreciate the myriad wonders he was passing through. But now, finally, he had both the time and the comprehension to make sense of his pilgrimage. And, having begun the journey reluctantly, he soon had as much taste for it as his companion. Word of the changes in his Orderex had spread even to the tiniest villages and the demise of the Autarch's empire was everywhere cause for jubilation. Rumours of the Imagica's healing had also spread, and when Monday told people where he and his quiet companion came from, which he was wont to do at the vaguest queue, they were plied with drinks and grilled for news of the paradisiacal fifth. Many of their questioners, knowing that the door into that mystery finally stood open, were planning to visit the fifth, and wanted to know what gifts they should take with them into a dominion that was already so full of marvels. When this question was put, Gentle, who usually let Monday do the talking during these interviews, invariably spoke up. Take your family histories, he'd say. Take your poems. Take your jokes. Take your lullabies. Make them understand in the fifth what glories there are here. People tended to look at him askance when he answered in this fashion, and told him that their jokes and their family histories didn't seem particularly glorious. Gentle would simply say, They're you, and you're the best gift the fifth could be given. You know, we could have made a fortune if we brought a few maps of England with us, Monday remarked one day. Do we care about fortunes? Gentle said. You might not, boss, Monday replied. Personally, I'm much in favour. He was right, Gentle thought. They could have sold a thousand maps already and they were only just entering the third. Maps which would have been copied, and the copies copied, each transcriber inevitably adding their own felicities to the design. The thought of such proliferation led Gentle back to his own hand, which had seldom worked for any purpose other than profit, and which, for all its labour, had never produced anything of lasting value. But unlike the paintings he'd forged, maps weren't cursed by the notion of a definitive original. They grew in the copying, as their inaccuracies were corrected, 
their empty spaces filled, their legends redevised. And even when all the corrections had been made to the finest detail, they could still never be cursed with the word finished, because their subject continued to change. Rivers widened and meandered or dried up altogether. Islands rose and sank again. Even mountains moved. By their very nature, maps were always works in progress. And gentle, his resolve strengthened by thinking of them that way, decided after many months of delay to turn his hand to making one. Occasionally, along the road, they'd meet an individual who, in ignorance of his audience, would boast some association with the fifth's most celebrated son, the maestro Sartori, and would proceed to tell Gentle and Monday about the great man. The accounts varied, especially when it came to talk of his companion. Some said he'd had a beautiful woman at his side, some his brother, called Pi. Others still, these the least numerous, told of a mystiff. At first it was all Monday could do not to blurt the truth, but Gentle had insisted from the outset that he wanted to travel incognito, and having been sworn to secrecy, the boy was as good as his word. He kept his silence while wild tales of the maestro's doings were told. Marriages celebrated on the ceiling. Copses springing up overnight where he'd slept. Women made pregnant, drinking from his cup. The fact that he'd become a figment of the popular imagination amused Gentle at first, but after a time it began to weigh on him. He felt like a ghost among these living versions of himself invisible among the listeners who'd gathered to hear tales of his exploits, the details of which were embroidered and embellished with every telling. There was some comfort in the fact that he was not the only character around whom such parables occurred. There were other fables alive in the air between the ears and tongues of the populace, which the pilgrims were usually told when they asked after Jude and Hoi Polloi. Tales of miraculous women, a whole new nomadic tribe had appeared in the Dominion since the fall of Isordorex. Women of power were abroad, rising to the occasion of their liberation, and rites they'd only practised at the hearth and cot were now performed in the open air for all to see. But unlike the stories of the maestro Sartori, most of which were pure invention, Gentle and Monday saw ample evidence that the stories concerning these women were rooted in truth. In the province, around Mai K, for instance, which had been a dust bowl during Gentle's first pilgrimage, they found fields green with the first crop in six seasons, courtesy of a woman who'd sniffed out the course of an underground river and coaxed it to the surface with sways and supplications. In the temples of Limbi, a sibyl had carved from a solid slab, using only her finger and her spittle, a representation of the city as she prophesied it would be in a year's time, her prophecy so mesmeric that her audience had gone out of the temple that very hour and had torn down the trash that had disfigured their city. In the Quem, where Gentle took Monday in the hope of finding Scopeek, they found instead that the once shallow pit where the pivot had stood was now a lake, its waters crystalline, but its bottom hidden by the congregation of life that was forming in it. Birds, mostly, which rose in sudden excited flocks, fully feathered and ready for the sky. Here they had a chance to meet the miracle worker, for the woman who'd made these waters, literally, her acolyte said, it was the pissing of a single night, had taken up residence in the blackened husk of the Quem Palace. In the hope of gleaning some clue to Jude and Hoipoloi's whereabouts, Gentle ventured into the shadows to find the lake maker, and though she refused to show herself, she answered his inquiry. No, she hadn't seen a pair of travellers such as he described, but yes, she could tell him where they'd gone. There were only two directions for wandering women these days, she explained, out of his orderex and into it. He thanked her for this information and asked her if there was anything he could do for her in return. 
She told him that there was nothing she wanted from him personally, but she'd be very glad of the company of his boy for an hour or two. Somewhat chagrined, Gentle went out and asked Monday if he was willing to chance the woman's embrace for a while. He said he was, and left the maestro to find himself a seat by the bird-breeding lake while he ventured into its maker's boudoir. It was the first time in Gentle's life that any woman in search of sexual attentions had passed him over for another. If ever he'd needed proof that his day was done, it was here. When, after two hours, Monday reappeared, with a flushed face and ringing ears, it was to find Gentle sitting at the lakeside, long ago tired of working on his map, surrounded by several small cans of pebbles. What are these? the boy said. I've been counting my romances, Gentle replied. Each one of them is a hundred women. There were seven cans. Is that them all? Monday said. It's all that I remember. Monday squatted down beside the stones. I bet you'd like to love them all over again, he said. Gentle thought about this for a little time, and finally said, No, I don't think so. I've done my best work. It's time to leave it to the younger men. He tossed the stone he had in hand out into the middle of the teeming lake. Before you ask, he said, that was Jude. There were no diversions after that, nor any need to pursue rumours of women hither and thither. They knew where Jude and Hoy Polloy had gone. Having left the lake, they were on the Lenten Way within a matter of hours. Unlike so much else, the way hadn't changed. It was as busy and as wide as ever, an arrow driving its straight way into the hot heart of his order X. Chapter 62 1. In the fifth, winter came. Not suddenly, but certainly. Halloween was the last time people chanced the night air without coats, hats and gloves and it saw the first substantial visitation of Londoners to Gamut Street. Revellers who'd taken the spirit of All Hallows' Eve to heart and come to see if there was any truth in the bizarre rumours they'd heard about the neighbourhood. Some retreated after a very short time, but the braver among them stayed to explore, a few lingering outside number 28, where they puzzled over the designs on the door and peered up at the carbonised tree that shaded the house from the stars. After that evening the cold's nip became a bite, and the bite a gnaw, until by late November the temperatures were low enough to keep even the most ardent tomcat at the fire. But the flow of visitors in both directions didn't cease. Night after night ordinary citizens appeared in Gamut Street to brush shoulders with the excursionists who were coming in the opposite direction. Some of the former became such regular visitors that Clem began to recognise them and was able to watch their investigations grow less tentative as they realised that the sensations they felt were not the first signs of lunacy. There were wonders to be found here, and one by one these men and women must have discovered the source, because they invariably disappeared. Others, perhaps too afraid to venture into the passing places alone, came with trusted friends showing them the street as though it were a secret vice, talking in whispers, then laughing out loud when they found their loved ones could see the apparitions too. Word was spreading. But that fact was the only pleasure those bitter days and nights provided. Though Tick Raw spent more and more time in the house and was lively company, Clem missed Gentle badly. He hadn't been altogether surprised at his abrupt departure. He'd known, even if Gentle hadn't, that sooner or later the maestro would leave the Dominion. But now his truest company was the man with whom he shared his skull, and, as the first anniversary of Tay's death approached, the mood of both grew steadily darker. The presence of so many living souls on the street only served to make the revenants who'd occupied it through the summer months feel further disenfranchised, and their distress was contagious.
Though Tay had been happy to stay with Clem through the preparations for the great work, their time as angels was over, and Tay felt the same need as those ghosts who roamed outside the house to be gone. As December came, Clem began to wonder how many more weeks he could keep his post, when it seemed every hour the despair of the ghost in him grew. After much debate with himself, he decided that Christmas would mark the last day of his service in Gamut Street. After that, he'd leave Number 28 to be tramped around by Tick's excursionists and go back to the house where a year before he and Tay had celebrated the return of the unvanquished son. 2. Jude and Hoy Polloy had taken their time crossing the Dominions, but with so many roads to choose between, and so many incidental joys along the way, going quickly seemed almost criminal. They had no reason to hurry. There was nothing behind them to drive them on, and nothing in front summoning them. At least, so Jude pretended. Time and time again, when the issue of their ultimate destination cropped up in conversation, she avoided talking about the place she knew in her heart of hearts they would eventually reach. But if the name of that city wasn't on her lips, it was on the lips of almost every other woman they met. And when Hoy Polloy mentioned that it was her birthplace, questions from fellow travellers would invariably flow thick and fast. Was it true that the harbour was now filled at every tide with fish that had swum up from the depths of the ocean, ancient creatures that knew the secret of the origins of women and swam up the rivered streets at night to worship the goddesses on the hill? Was it true that the women there could have children without any need of men whatsoever, and that some could even dream babies into being? And were there fountains in that city that made the old young and trees on which every fruit was new to the world, and so on, and so forth. Though Jude was willing, if pressed, to supply descriptions of what she'd seen in his Ordorex, her accounts of how the palace had been refashioned by water, and of streams that defied gravity, were not particularly remarkable in the face of what rumour was claiming about his Ordorex. After a few conversations in which she was urged to describe marvels she had no knowledge of, as though the questioners were willing her to invent prodigies rather than disappoint them, she told Hoy Polloy she'd not be drawn into any further debates on the subject. But her imagination refused to ignore the tales it heard, however preposterous, and with every mile they travelled along the Lenten Way, the idea of the city awaiting them at the end of their journey grew more intimidating. She fretted that perhaps the blessings bestowed on her there would be valueless after all the time she'd spent away from the place, or that the goddesses knew that she'd told Sartori, in all truth, that she loved him, and that Joker Leilau's condemnation of her would carry the day if she ever went back into their temple. Once they were on the Lenten Way, however, such fears became academic. They were not going to turn back now, especially as both of them were becoming steadily more exhausted. The city called them out of the fogs that lay between dominions, and they would go into it together and face whatever judgments, prodigies, and deep-sea fish were waiting there. Oh, but it was changed. A warmer season was on the second than when Jude had last been here, and with so much water running in the streets, the air was tropical. But more breathtaking than the humidity was the growth it had engendered. Seeds and spores had been carried up from the seams and caverns beneath the city in vast numbers, and under the influence of the goddesses' fates had matured with preternatural speed. Ancient forms of vegetation, most long believed extinct, had greened the rubble, turning the Kesperates into luxuriant jungle. In the space of half a year, Isordorex had come to resemble a lost city, sacred to women and children, its desolation salved by flora. The smell of ripeness was everywhere, its source, the fruits that glistened on vine and bough and bush, the abundance of which had in turn attracted animals that would never have dared Isordorex under its previous regime. And running through this cornucopia, feeding the seeds it had raised from the underworld, the eternal waters, still flowing up the hillsides in their riotous way, but no longer carrying their fleets of prayers. 
either the requests of those who lived here had been answered, or else their baptisms had made them their own healers and restorers. Jude and Hoi Polloi didn't go up to the palace the day they arrived, nor the day after, nor the day after that. Instead, they searched for the peccable house and there made themselves comfortable, though the tulips on the dining room table had been replaced by a throng of blossoms that had erupted through the floor and the roof had become an aviary. After so long a journey, in which they had not known from night to night where they were going to lay their heads, these were minor inconveniences, and they were grateful to be at rest, lulled to sleep by cooings and chatterings in beds that were more like bowers. When they woke, there was plenty to eat. Fruit that could be picked off the trees, water that ran clear and cold in the street outside, and in some of the larger streams, fish which formed the staple diet of the clans that lived in the vicinity. There were men as well as women among these extended families, some of whom must have been members of the mobs and armies that had run so brutally riot on the night the autark fell. But either gratitude at having survived the revolution, or the calming influence of the growth and plenitude around them had persuaded them to better purpose. Hands that had maimed and murdered were now employed rebuilding a few of the houses, raising their walls not in defiance of the jungle or the waters that fed it, but in league with both. This time the architects were women, who'd come down from their baptisms inspired to use the wreckage of the old city to create a new one, and everywhere Jude saw echoes of the serene and elegant aesthetic that marked the goddess's handiwork. There was no great sense of urgency attending these constructions, nor, she thought, any sign of a grand design being adhered to. The age of empire was over, and all dogmas, edicts, and conformities had gone with it. People solved the problems of putting a roof over their heads in their own way, knowing that the trees were both shady and bountiful in the meantime. The houses that resulted were as different as the faces of the women who supervised their construction. The Sartori she'd met in Gamut Street would have approved, Jude thought. Hadn't he touched her cheek during their penultimate encounter and told her he'd dreamed of a city built in her image? If that image was woman, then here was that city, rising from the ruins. So by day they had the murmuring canopy, the bubbling rivers, the heat, the laughter. And by night, slumbers beneath a feathered roof and dreams that were kind and uninterrupted. Such was the case, at least for a week. But on the eighth night, Jude was woken by Hoy Polloi, who called her to the window. Look! She looked. The stars were bright above the city and ran silver in the river below. But there were other forms in the water, she realized, more solid, but no less silver. The talk they'd heard on the road was true. Climbing the river were creatures that no fishing boat, however deep it trawled, would ever have found in its nets. Some had a trace of dolphin in them, or squid, or manta ray. But their common trait was a hint of humanity, buried as deep in their past, or future, as their homes were in ocean. There were limbs on some of them, and these few seemed to leap the slope rather than swim it. Others were as sinuous as eels, but had heads that carried a mammalian cast, their eyes luminous, their mouths fine enough to make words. The sight of their ascent was exhilarating, and Jude stayed at the window until the entire shoal had disappeared up the street. She had no doubt of their destination, nor indeed of her own, after this. We're as rested as we're ever going to be, she said to Hoy Polloi. So it's time to go up the hill? Yes, I think it is. They left the peccable house at dawn in order to make much of the ascent before the comet climbed too high and the humidity sapped their strength. It had never been an easy journey, but even in the cool early morning it became a back-breaking trudge, especially for Jude, who felt as though she were carrying a lead weight in her womb rather than a living soul. She had to call a halt to the climb several times, and sit in the shade to catch her breath. But on the fourth such occasion she rose to find her gasps becoming steadily shallower, and a pain in her belly so acute she could barely hold on to consciousness. 
Her agitation and Hoi Polloi's yelps drew helping hands, and she was being lowered onto a knoll of flowering grasses when her waters broke. A little less than an hour later, not more than half a mile from where the gate of the twin saints, Crees and Evendown, had stood, in a grove busy with tiny turquoise birds, she gave birth to the Autark Sartori's first and only child. 3. Though Jude and Hoi Polloi's pursuers had left the lake maker in the Quem with clear directions, they still reached his orderex six weeks later than the women. This was in part because Monday's sexual appetite was significantly depleted after his liaison in the Quem Palace, and he set a far less hectic pace than he had hitherto, but more particularly because Gentle's enthusiasm for cartography grew by leaps and bounds. Barely an hour would go by without his remembering some province he'd passed through, or some signpost he'd seen, and whenever he did so the journey was interrupted while he brought out his handmade album of charts and religiously set down the details, rattling off the names of uplands, lowlands, forests, plains, highways, and cities like a litany while he worked. He wouldn't be hurried, even if the chance of a ride was missed or a good drenching gained in the process. This was, he told Monday, the true great work of his life, and he only regretted that he'd come to it so late. These interruptions notwithstanding, the city got closer day by day, mile by mile, until one morning when they raised their heads from their pillows beneath a hawthorn bush, the mists cleared to show them a vast green mountain in the distance. What is that place? Monday wondered. Astonished, Gentle said, Is Orderex. Where's the palace? Where's the streets? All I can see is trees and rainbows. Gentle was as confounded as the boy. It used to be grey and black and bloody, he said. Well, it's fucking green now. It got greener the closer they came the scent of its vegetation so sweetening the air that Monday soon lost his scowl of disappointment and remarked that perhaps this wouldn't be so bad after all. If his orderex had turned into a wild wood, then maybe all the women had become savages, dressed in berry juice and smiles. He could suffer that a while. What they found on the lower slopes, of course, were scenes more extraordinary than Monday's most heated imaginings. So much of what the inhabitants of the new Azorderex took for granted, the anarchic waters, the primeval trees, left both man and boy agog. They gave up voicing their awe after a time and simply climbed through the lavish thicket, steadily sloughing off the weight of baggage they'd accrued on their journey and leaving it scattered in the grass. Gentle had intended to go to the Euhetemek Casperati in the hope of locating Athanasius but with the city so transformed it was a slow and difficult trek, so that it was more luck than wit that brought them after an hour or more to the gate. The streets beyond it were as overgrown as those they'd come through, the terraces resembling some orchard that had been left to riot, its fallen fruit the rubble that lay between the trees. At Monday's suggestion they split up to search for the maestro, Gentle telling the boy that if he saw Jesus somewhere in the trees, then he'd discovered Athanasius. But they both came back to the gate, having failed to find him, obliging Gentle to ask some children who'd come to play swinging games on the gate if any of them had seen the man who'd lived here. One of the number, a girl of six or so, with her hair so plaited with vines she looked as though she was sprouting them, had an answer. He went away, she said. Do you know where? Nope, she said again, speaking on behalf of her little tribe. Does anybody know? Nope. Which exchange brought the subject of Athanasius to a swift halt. Where now? Monday asked, as the children returned to their games. We follow the water, Gentle replied. They began to ascend again while the comet, which had long since passed its zenith, made the contrary motion. They were both weary now, and the temptation to lie down in some tranquil spot grew with every stride they took. But Gentle insisted they go on, 
reminding Monday that Hoy Polloy's bosom would be a far more comfortable place to lay his head than any hummock, and her kisses more invigorating than a dip in any pool. His talk was persuasive, and the boy found an energy gentle envied, bounding on to clear the way for the maestro until they reached the mounds of dark rubble that marked the walls of the palace. Rising from them, the columns from which had once hung an enormous pair of gates were turned to playthings by the waters, which climbed the right pillar in rivulets, and threw themselves across the gap in a drizzling arch that squarely struck the top of the left. It was a most beguiling spectacle, and one that claimed Gentle's attention completely, leaving Monday to head between the columns alone. After a short time his shout came back to fetch Gentle, and it was blissful. Boss! Boss! Come here! Gentle followed where Monday's cries led, through the warm rain beneath the arch and into the palace itself. He found Monday wading across a courtyard, fragrant with the lilies that trembled on its flood, towards a figure standing beneath the colonnade on the other side. It was Hoy Polloi. Her hair was plastered to her scalp as though she'd just swum the pool, and the bosom upon which Monday was so eager to lay his head was bare. So you're here at last, she said, looking past Monday towards Gentle. Her eager bow lost his footing halfway across, and lilies flew as he hauled himself to his feet. You knew we were coming? he said to the girl. Of course, she replied. Not you, but the maestro. We knew the maestro was coming. But it's me you're glad to see, right? Monday spluttered. I mean, you are glad. She opened her arms to him. What do you think? she said. He whooped his whoop and splashed on towards her, peeling off his soaked shirt as he went. Gentle followed in his wake. By the time he reached the other side, Monday was stripped down to his underwear. How did you know we were coming here? Gentle asked the girl. There are prophetics everywhere, she said. Come on, I'll take you up. Can't he go on his own? Monday protested. We'll have plenty of time later, Hoy Polloi said, taking his hand. But first I have to take him up to the chambers. The trees within the ring of the demolished walls dwarfed those outside, inspired to unprecedented growth by the almost palpable sanctity of this place. There were women and children in their branches, and among their gargantuan roots. But Gentle saw no men here, and supposed that if Hoi Polloi hadn't been escorting them, they'd have been asked to leave. How such a request would have been enforced he could only guess, but he didn't doubt that the presences which charged the air and earth here had their ways. He knew what those presences were. The promised goddesses whose existence he'd first heard mooted in Beatrix while sitting in Mother Splendid's kitchen. The journey was circuitous. There were several places where the rivers ran too hard and deep to be forded, and Hoi Polloi had to lead them to bridges or stepping stones, then double back along the opposite bank to pick up the track again. But the farther they went, the more sentient the air became, and though Gentle had countless questions to ask, he kept them to himself rather than display his naivete. There were tidbits from Hoi Polloi once in a while, so casually dropped they were enigmas in themselves. The fires are so comical, she said at one point, as they passed a pile of twisted metalwork that had been one of the Autark's war machines, and at another place where a deep blue pool housed fish the size of men, said, Apparently they have their own city. But it's so deep in the ocean, I don't suppose I'll ever see it. The children will, though. That's what's wonderful. Finally she brought them to a door that was curtained with running water, and, turning to Gentle, said, They're waiting for you. Monday went to step through the curtain at Gentle's side, but Hoy Polloi restrained him with a kiss on his neck. This is just for the maestro, she said. Come along. We'll go swimming. Boss? Go ahead, Gentle told him. No harm's going to come to me here. I'll see you later then, Monday said, content to have Hoi Polloi tug him away. 
Before they disappeared into the thicket, Gentle turned to the door, dividing the cool curtain with his fingers and stepping into the chamber beyond. After the riot of life outside, both its scale and its austerity came as a shock. It was the first structure he'd seen in the city that preserved something of his brother's lunatic ambition. Its vastness was uninvaded by all but a few shoots and tendrils, and the only waters that ran here were at the door behind him, and those falling from an arch at the other end. The goddesses had not left the chamber entirely unmarked, however. The walls of what had been built as a windowless hall were now pierced on all sides, so that for all its immensity the place was a honeycomb, penetrated by the soft light of evening. There was only one item of furniture, a chair, close to the distant arch, and seated upon it, with a baby on her lap, was Judith. As Gentle entered, she looked up from the child's face and smiled at him. I was beginning to think you'd lost your way, she said. Her voice was light, almost literally, he thought. When she spoke, the beams that came through the walls flickered. I didn't know you were waiting, he said. It's been no great hardship, she said. Won't you come closer? As he crossed the chamber towards her, she said, I didn't expect you to follow us at first, but then I thought, He will, he will, because he'll want to see the child. To be honest, I didn't think about the child. Well, she thought about you, Jude said, without rebuke. The baby in her lap could not be more than a few weeks old, but, like the trees and flowers here, was burgeoning. She sat on Jude's lap rather than lay, one small, strong hand clutching her mother's long hair. Though Jude's breasts were bare and comfortable, the child had no interest in nourishment or sleep. Her grey eyes were fixed on Gentle, studying him with an intense and quizzical stare. "'How's Clem?' Jude asked when Gentle stood before her. "'He was fine when I last saw him.' but I left rather suddenly, as you know. I feel rather guilty about that. But once I'd started... I know. There was no turning back. It was the same for me. Gentle went down on his haunches in front of Jude and offered his hand, palm up, to the child. She grasped it instantly. What's her name? he said. I hope you won't mind. What? I called her Huzzah. Gentle smiled up at Jude. You did. Then back to the baby, called by her scrutiny. Huzzah, he said, leaning his face towards her. Huzzah, I'm gentle. She knows who you are, Jude said, without a trace of doubt. She knew about this room before it even existed, and she knew you'd come here sooner or later. Gentle didn't inquire as to how the child had shared her knowledge. It was just one more mystery to add to the catalogue in this extraordinary place. And the goddesses, he said? What about them? They don't mind that she's Sartori's child? Not at all, Jude said, her voice daintier at the mention of Sartori. The whole city. The whole city's here to prove how good can come from bad. She's better than good, Jude, Gentle said. She smiled, and so did the child. Yes, she is. Huzar was reaching for Gentle's face, ready to topple from Jude's lap in pursuit of her object. I think she sees her father, Jude said, lifting the child back into the crook of her arm and standing up. Gentle also stood, watching Jude carry Huzar to a litter of playthings on the ground. The child pointed and gurgled. Do you miss him? he said. I did in the fifth, Jude replied, her back still turned while she picked up Huzar's chosen toy. But I don't hear. Not since Huzar. I never felt quite real till she appeared. I was a figment of the other Judith. She stood up again, turning to Gentle. You know, I still can't really remember all those missing years. 
I get snatches of them once in a while, but nothing solid. I suppose I was living in a dream. But she's woken me, gentle. Jude kissed the baby's cheek. She's made me real. I was only a copy until her. We both were. He knew it, and I knew it. But we made something new. She sighed. I don't miss him, she said. But I wish he could have seen her. Just once. Just so he could have known what it was to be real, too. She started to cross back to the chair, but the child reached out for gentle again, letting out a little cry to emphasize her wishes. My, my, Jude said, you are popular. She sat down again and put the toy she'd picked up in front of Hazar. It was a small blue stone. Here, darling, she cooed. Look, what's this? What's this? Gurgling with pleasure, the child claimed the plaything from her mother's finger with a dexterity far beyond her tender age. The gurgles became chuckles as she laid it to her lips as if to kiss it. She likes to laugh, Gentle said. She does, thank God. Oh, now listen to me. Still thanking God. Old habits. That one'll die, Jude said firmly. The child was putting the toy to her mouth. No, sweetie, don't do that, Jude said. Then to Gentle, do you think the erasure'll decay eventually? I have a friend here called Lottie. She says it will. It'll decay, and then we'll have to live with the stench from the first every time the wind comes that way. Maybe a wall could be built. By whom? Nobody wants to go near the place. Not even the goddesses? They've got their work here, and in the fifth. They want to free the waters there, too. That should be quite a sight. Yes, it should. Maybe I'll go back for that. Hazar's laughter had subsided during this exchange, and she was once again studying Gentle, reaching up towards him from her mother's lap. This time her tiny hand was not open but clutching the blue stone. I think she wants you to have it, Jude said. He smiled at the child and said, Thank you, but you should keep it. Her gaze became more intent at this, and he was certain she understood every word he was saying. Her hand still proffered its gift, determined he should take it. Go on, Jude said. As much at the behest of the eyes as at Jude's words, Gentle reached down and gingerly took the stone from Hazar's hand. There was some considerable strength in her. The stone was heavy, heavy and cool. Now our peace is really made, Jude said. I didn't know we'd been at war, Gentle replied. That's the worst kind, isn't it? Jude said. But it's over now. It's over forever. There was a subtle modulation in the plush of the water-curtained arch behind her, and she glanced around. Her expression had been grave, but when she looked back at Gentle, she had a smile on her face. I have to go, she said as she stood. The child was chuckling and clutching the air. Will I see you again? Gentle said. Jude shook her head slowly, looking at him almost indulgently. What for? she murmured. We've said all we have to say. We've forgiven each other. It's finished. Will I be allowed to stay in the city? Of course, she said with a little laugh. But why would you want to? Because I've come to the end of the pilgrimage. Have you? she said, turning from him to pad towards the arch. I thought you had one dominion left. I've seen it. I know what's there. There was a pause. Then Jude said, Did Celestine ever tell you her story? She did, didn't she? The one about Nisi Nirvana. Yes, she told it to me, too, the night before the reconciliation. Did you understand it? Not really. Ah. Why? It's just that I didn't either, and I thought maybe... She shrugged. I don't know what I thought. She was at the archway now, and the child was peering over her shoulder at somebody who'd appeared behind the veil of water. The visitor was not, gentle thought, quite human. 
Hoi Polloi mentioned our other guests, did she? Jude said, seeing his astonishment. They came up out of the ocean to woo us, she smiled. Beautiful, some of them. There's going to be such children. The smile faltered just a little. Don't be sad, gentle, she said. We had our time. Then she turned from him and took the child through the curtain. He heard Hazar laugh to see the face that awaited them on the other side, and saw its owner put his silvery arms around mother and child. Then the light in his eyes brightened, running in the curtain, and when it dimmed, the family had gone. Gentle waited in the empty chamber for several minutes, knowing Jude wasn't going to come back, not even certain that he wanted her to, but unable to depart until he had fixed in his memory all that had passed between them. Only then did he return to the door and step out into the evening air. There was a different kind of enchantment in the wild wood now. Soft blue mists drooped from the canopy and crept up from the pools. The mellifluous songs of dusk birds had replaced those of noon, and the busy drone of pollinators had given way to breath-wing moths. He looked for Monday but failed to find him and although there was nobody to prevent his loitering in this idyll, he felt ill at ease. This was not his place now. By day it was too full of life, and by night, he guessed, too full of love. It was a new experience for him to feel so utterly immaterial, even on the road hanging back from the fires while nonsense tales were told. He'd always known that if he'd simply opened his mouth and identified himself, he would have been fated, encircled, adored not so here. Here he was nothing, nothing and nobody. There were new growths, new mysteries, new marriages. Perhaps his feet understood that better than his head, because before he'd properly confessed his redundancy to himself, they were already carrying him away, out under the water-clad arches and down the slope of the city. He didn't head towards the delta, but towards the desert and though he'd not seen the purpose in this journey when Jude had hinted at it, he didn't now deny his feet their passage. When he'd last emerged from the gate that led out into the desert, he'd been carrying pie, and there'd been a throng of refugees around them. Now he was alone, and though he had no other weight to carry besides his own, he knew the trek ahead of him would exhaust what little sum of will was left to him. He wasn't much concerned at this. If he perished on the way, it scarcely mattered. Whatever Jude had said, his pilgrimage was at an end. As he reached the crossroads where he'd encountered Flocus Dardo, he heard a shout behind him and turned to see a bare-chested Monday galloping towards him through the dwindling light, mounted on a mule, or a striped variation thereof. What were you doing going without me? he demanded when he reached Gentle's side. I looked for you, but you weren't around. I thought you'd gone off to start a family with Hoy Polloi. Nah, said Monday. She's got funny ideas, that girl. She said she wanted to introduce me to some fish. I said I wasn't too keen on fish cause the bones get stuck in your throat. Well, that's right, isn't it? People choke on fish regular. Anyhow, she looks at me like I just farted and says maybe I should go with you after all. And I said, I didn't even know you was leaving. So she finds me this ugly little fuck, he slapped the hybrid's flank, and points me in this direction. He glanced back at the city. I think we're well out of there, he said, dropping his voice. There was too much water if you ask me. Do you see it at the gate? A great fucking fountain. No, I didn't. That must be recent. See? The whole place is going to drown. Let's get the fuck out of here. Hop on. What's the beast called? Tolland, Monday said with a grin. Which way are we headed? Gentle pointed towards the horizon. I don't see nothing. Then that must be the right direction. Four. Ever the pragmatist, Monday hadn't left the city without supplies. He'd made a sack of his shirt and filled it to bursting with succulent fruits, 
and it was these that sustained them as they travelled. They didn't halt when night came, but kept up their steady pace, taking turns to walk beside the beast so as not to exhaust it and giving it at least as much of the fruit as they ate themselves, plus the piths, cores, and skins of their own portions. Monday slept much of the time that he rode, but Gentle, despite his fatigue, remained wide awake, too vexed by the problem of how he was going to set this wasteland down in his book of maps to indulge himself in slumber. The stone Hussar had given him was constantly in his hand, coaxing so much sweat from his paws that several times a little pool gathered in the cup of his palm. Discovering this, he would put the stone away, only to find a few minutes later that he'd taken it out of his pocket without even realising that he'd done so, and his fingers were once again making play with it. Now and then he'd cast a backward glance towards his Ordorex, and it made quite a sight, the benighted flanks of the city glittering in countless places, as though the waters in its streets had become perfect mirrors for the stars. Nor was Isordrex the only source of such splendour. The land between the gates of the city and the track that they were following also gleamed here and there, catching its own fragments of the sky's display. But all such enchantments were gone by the first sign of dawn. The city had long since disappeared into the distance behind them, and the thunderheads in front were lowering. Gentle recognised the baleful colour of this sky from the glimpse he and Tick Raw had snatched of the first. Though the erasure still sealed Hapeximendius's pestilence from the second, its taint was too persuasive to be obliterated, and the bruisy heavens loomed vaster as they travelled, lying along the entire horizon and climbing to their zenith. There was some good news, however. They weren't alone. As the wretched remains of the Dertha's tents appeared on the horizon, so too did a congregation of god-spotters, thirty or so, watching the erasure. One of them saw Gentle and Monday approaching, and word of their arrival passed through the small crowd until it reached one who instantly pelted in the traveller's direction. Maestro! Maestro! he yelled as he came. It was Chicka Jackeen, of course and he was in a fair ecstasy to see Gentle, though after the initial flood of greetings the talk became grim. What did we do wrong, maestro? he wanted to know. This isn't the way it was meant to be, is it? Gentle did his weary best to explain, astonishing and appalling Chicka Jackeen by turns. So Hapeximendius is dead? Yes, he is. And everything in the first is his body and it's rotting to high heaven. What happens when the erasure decays? Who knows? I'm afraid there's enough rot to stink out the dominion. So what's your plan? Chickajackeen wanted to know. I don't have one. The other looked confounded at this. But you came all the way here, he said. You must have had some notion or other. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Gentle replied but the truth is this was the only place left for me to go. He stared at the erasure. Hapeximendius was my father, Lucius. Perhaps in my heart of hearts I believe I should be in the first with him. If you don't mind me saying so, boss, Monday broke in. Yes? That's a bloody stupid idea. If you're going to go in, so am I, Chickajackeen said. I want to see for myself. A dead god's something to tell your children about, eh? Children? Well, said Jackeen, it's either that or write my memoirs, and I haven't got the patience for that. You? Gentle said. You waited two hundred years for me, and you say you haven't got patience? Not any more, came the reply. I want a life, maestro. I don't blame you. But not before I've seen the first. They reached the erasure by now, and while Chickajackeen went among his colleagues to tell them what he and the Reconciler were going to do, Monday once again piped up with his opinion on the venture. Don't do it, boss, he said. You've got nothing to prove. I know you were pissed off that day they didn't throw a party in his order, X, but fuck em, I say. Or rather, don't. Let em have their fish. 
Gentle laid his hands on Monday's shoulders. Don't worry, he said. This isn't a suicide mission. So what's the big hurry? You're dead beat, boss. Have a sleep. Eat something. Get strong. There's all of tomorrow not touched yet. I'm fine, Gentle said. I've got my talisman. What's that? Gentle opened his palm and showed Monday the blue stone. A fucking egg? An egg, eh? Gentle said, tossing the stone in his hand. Maybe it is. He threw it up into the air a second time, and it rose, far higher than his muscle had propelled it, way up above their heads. At the summit of its ascent it seemed to hover for a beat, and then returned into his hand at leisure, defying the claim of gravity. As it descended it brought the faintest drizzle down with it, cooling their upturned faces. Monday cooed with pleasure. Rain out of nowhere, he said. I remember that. Gentle left him bathing the grime from his face and went to join Chicka Jackeen, who had finished explaining his intentions to his colleagues. They all hung back, watching the maestros with uneasy stares. They think we're going to die, Chicka Jackeen explained. They may very well be right, Gentle said quietly. Are you certain you want to come with me? I was never more certain of anything. With that, they started towards the ambiguous ground that lay between the solidity of the second and the erasure's vacancy. As they went, one of Jackeen's friends began to call after him in distress at his departure. The cry was taken up by several others, their shouts too mingled to be interpreted. Jackeen halted for a moment and glanced back towards the company he was leaving. Gentle made no attempt to urge him on. He ignored the shouts and picked up his speed, the erasure thickening around him and the smell of the devastation that lay on the other side growing stronger with every step he took. He was prepared for it, however. Instead of holding his breath, he drew the stench of his father's rot deep into his lungs, defying its pungency. There was another shout from behind him, but this time it wasn't one of Jackeen's friends, it was the maestro himself, his voice coloured more by wonder than alarm. Its tone piqued Gentle's curiosity, and he glanced back over his shoulder to seek Jackeen out. But the nullity had come between them. Unwilling to be delayed, Gentle forged on, a purpose in his stride he didn't comprehend. His enfeebled legs had found strength from somewhere. His heart was urgent in his chest. Ahead, the blinding murk was stirring, the first vague forms of the first's terrain emerging, and from behind, Jackeen again. Maestro! Maestro! Where are you? Without slowing his stride, Gentle returned the call. Here! Wait for me! Jackeen gasped. Wait! He emerged from the void to lay his hand on Gentle's shoulder. What is it? Gentle said, looking around at Jackeen, who, as if in bliss, had dropped the toll of years and was once again a young man, sweaty with awe at the way of fates. The waters, he said. What about them? They followed you, maestro. They followed you. And as he spoke, they came. Oh, how they came! They ran to Gentle's feet in glittering rills that broke against his ankles and his shins and leapt like silver snakes towards his hands, or rather, towards the stone he held in his hands. And seeing their elation and their zeal, he heard Huzar's laughter and felt again her tiny fingers brushing his arm as she passed the blue egg on to him. He didn't doubt for a moment that she'd known what would come of the gift. So, most likely, had Jude. He'd become their agent at the last, just as he'd become his mother's, and the thought of that sweet service brought an echo of the child's laughter to his lips. From above, the egg was calling down a drizzle to swell the waters swirling underfoot, and in the space of seconds the patter became a roar, and a deluge descended, violent enough to sluice the murk of the erasure out of the air. After a few moments, light began to break around the maestros, the first light this terrain had seen since Hepexamendius had drawn the void over his dominion. By it, 
Gentle saw that Jackine's exhilaration was rapidly turning to panic. We're going to drown, he yelled, fighting to stay on his feet as the water deepened. Gentle didn't retreat. He knew where his duty lay. As the surf broke against their backs, the tide threatening to drag them under, he raised Huzar's gift to his lips and kissed it, just as she had done. Then he mustered all his strengths and threw the stone out over the landscape that was being uncovered before them. The egg went from his hand with a momentum that was not his sinew's work, but its own ambition, and instantly the waters went in pursuit of it dividing around the maestros and taking their tides off into the wasteland of the first. It would take the waters weeks, perhaps even months, to cover the Dominion from end to end, and most of that work would go unwitnessed. But in the next few hours, standing at their vantage point where the City of God had once begun, the maestros were granted a glimpse of their labour. The clouds above the first, which had been as inert as the landscape beneath, now began to churn and roil and shed their anguish in stupendous storms, which in turn swelled the rivers that were driving their cleansing way across the rot. Apeximendius's remains were not despised. With the purpose of the goddesses fueling their every drop, the waters turned the slaughterhouse over and over and over scouring the matter of its poisons and sweeping it up into mounds, which the exhilarated air festooned with vapours. The first ground that appeared from this tumult was close to the feet of the maestros and rapidly became a ragged peninsula that stretched fully a mile into the Dominion. The waters broke against it constantly, bringing with every wave another freight of Hepeximendius's clay to increase its flanks. Gentle was patient for a time and stayed at the border. But he could not resist the invitation forever, and finally, ignoring Jackine's words of caution, he set off down the spine of land, to better see the spectacle visible from the far end. The waters were still draining from the new earth, and here and there lightning still ran on the slopes, but the ground was solid enough, and there were seedlings everywhere carried, he presumed, from his Isordorex. If so, there would be abundant life here in a little while. By the time he reached the end of the peninsula, the clouds overhead were beginning to clear somewhat, lighter for their furies. Farther off, of course, the process he'd been privileged to witness was just beginning, as the storms spread in all directions from their point of origin. By their blazes, he glimpsed the snaking rivers, going about their work with undiminished ambition. Here on the promontory, however, there was a more benign light. The first dominion had a sun, it seemed, and though it wasn't yet warm, Gentle didn't wait for balmier weather to begin his last labours, but took his album and his pen from his jacket and sat down on the marshy headland to work. He still had the map of the desert between the gates of Isordorex and the Erasure to set down, and though these pages would doubtless be the barest in the album, they had to be drawn all the more carefully for that fact. He wanted their very spareness to have a beauty of its own. After perhaps an hour of concentrated work, he heard Jackine behind him, first a footfall, then a question. Speaking in tongues, maestro? Gentle hadn't even been aware of the inventory he was rattling off until his attention was drawn to it. A seamless list of names that must have been incomprehensible to anyone other than himself the stopping places of his pilgrimage, as familiar to his tongue as his many names. Are you sketching the new world? Jackine asked him, hesitating to come too close to the artist while he worked. No, no, said Gentle. I'm finishing a map. He paused, then corrected himself. No, not finishing. Starting. May I look? If you like. Jackine went down on his haunches behind Gentle and peered over his shoulder. The pages that depicted the desert were as complete as Gentle could make them. He was now attempting to delineate the peninsula he was sitting on, and something of the scene in front of him. It would be little more than a line or two, but it was a beginning. I wonder, would you fetch Monday for me? Is there something you need? 
Yes, I want him to take these maps back into the fifth with him and give them to Clem. Who's Clem? An angel. Ah, would you bring him here? Now? If you would, Gentle said. I'm almost done. Ever dutiful, Jackine stood up and started back towards the second, leaving Gentle to work on. There was very little left to do. He finished making his crude rendering of the promontory. Then he added a line of dots along it to mark his path, and at the headland placed a small cross at the spot where he was sitting. That done, he went back through the album to be certain that the pages were in proper order. It occurred to him as he did so that he'd fashioned a self-portrait. Like its maker, the map was flawed, but he hoped redeemable. A rudimentary thing that might see finer versions in the fullness of time, be made and remade and made again, perhaps forever. He was about to set the album down beside the pen when he heard a hint of coherence in the surf that was beating against the slope below. Unable to quite make sense of the sound, he ventured to the edge. The ground was too newly made to be solid and threatened to crumble away beneath his weight but he peered over as far as he could, and what he saw and what he heard were enough to make him retreat from the edge, kneel down in the dirt, and with trembling hands start scribbling a message to accompany the maps. It was necessarily brief. He could hear the words clearly now, rising from the surge of waves. They distracted him with promises. Nisi Nirvana, they said. Nisi Nirvana. By the time he'd finished his note, laid down the album and the pen beside it, and returned to the edge of the promontory, the sun of this dominion was emerging from the storm clouds overhead to shed its light on the waves below. The beams placated them for a time, soothing their frenzy and piercing them, so that Gentle had a glimpse of the ground they were moving over. It was not, it seemed, an earth at all, but another sky, and in it, was a sphere so majestic that to his eyes all the bodies in the heavens of the Imagica, all stars, all moons, all noonday suns, could not in their sum have touched its glory. Here was the door that his father's city had been built to seal, the door through which his mother's name in fable had been whispered. It had been closed for millenniums, but now it stood open and through it a music of voices was rising, going on its way to every wandering spirit in Imagica and calling them home to rapture. In its midst was a voice gentle new, and before he'd even glimpsed its source his mind had shaped the face that called him, and his body felt the arms that would wrap him around and bear him up. Then they were there, those arms, that face rising from the door to claim him, and he needed to imagine them no longer. Are you finished? he was asked. Yes, he replied. I'm finished. Good, said Pai Opa, smiling. Then we can begin. The congregation Chicka Jackeen had left at the perimeter of the first had steadily begun to venture along the peninsula as their courage and curiosity grew. Monday was of course among them, and Jackeen was just about to call the boy and summon him to the reconciler's side when Monday let out a cry of his own, pointing back along the promontory. Jackeen turned and fixed his eyes, as did they all, on the two figures standing on the headland embracing. Later there would be much discussion between these witnesses as to what they'd actually seen. All agreed that one of the pair was the maestro Sartori. As to the other, opinions differed widely. Some said they saw a woman, others a man, still others a cloud with a piece of sun burning in it. But whatever these ambiguities, what followed was not in doubt. Having embraced, the two figures advanced to the limit of the promontory, where they stepped out into the air and were gone. Two weeks later, on the penultimate day of a cheerless December, Clem was sitting in front of the fire in the dining room of number 28, a spot from which he'd seldom risen since Christmas, when he heard a hectic beating on the front door. He was not wearing a watch, 
What did time matter now? But he assumed it was long after midnight. Anyone calling at such an hour was likely to be either desperate or dangerous, but in his present bleak mood he scarcely cared what harm might await him in the street outside. There was nothing left for him here, in this house, in this life. Gentle had gone, Judy had gone, and so, most recently, had Tay. It was five days since he'd heard his lover whisper his name. Clem, I have to go. Go, he replied. Where to? Somebody opened the door, came Tay's reply. The dead are being called home. I have to go. They wept together for a while, tears pouring from Clem's eyes while the sound of Tay's anguish racked him from within. But there was no help for it. The call had come, and though Tay was grief-stricken at the thought of parting from Clem, his existence between conditions had become unbearable, and beneath the sorrow of parting was the joyful knowledge of imminent release. Their strange union was over. It was time for the living and the dead to part. Clem hadn't known what loss really was until Tay left. The pain of losing his lover's physical body had been acute enough, but losing the spirit that had so miraculously returned to him was immeasurably worse. It was not possible, he thought, to be emptier than this and still be a living being. Several times during those dark days he'd wondered if he should simply kill himself and hope he would be able to follow his lover through whatever door now stood open. That he didn't was more a consequence of the responsibility he felt than from lack of courage. He was the only witness to the miracles of Gamut Street left in this dominion. If he departed, who would there be to tell the tale? But such imperatives seemed frail things at an hour like this, and as he rose from the fire and crossed to the front door he allowed himself the thought that if these midnight callers came with death in their hands, perhaps he would not refuse it. Without asking who was on the other side, he slid back the bolts and opened the door. To his surprise, he discovered Monday standing in the driving sleet. Beside him stood a shivering stranger, his thinning curls flattened to his skull. This is Chicka Jackeen, Monday said, as he hauled his sodden guest over the threshold. Jackie, this is Clem, eighth wonder of the world. Well, am I too wet to get a hug? Clem opened his arms to Monday, who embraced him with fervour. I thought you and Gentle had gone forever, Clem said. Well, one of us has, came the reply. I guessed as much, Clem said. Tay went after him, and the revenants too. When was this? Christmas Day. Jackine's teeth were chattering, and Clem ushered him through to the fire which he had been fueling with sticks of furniture. He threw on a couple of chair legs and invited Jackine to sit by the blaze to thaw out. The man thanked him and did so. Monday, however, was made of sterner stuff. Availing himself of the whiskey that sat beside the hearth, he put several mouthfuls into his system, then set about clearing the room, explaining as he dragged the table into the corner that they needed some working space. With the floor cleared, he opened his jacket and pulled Gentle's gazetteer from beneath his arm dropping it in front of Clem. What's this? It's a map of the Imagica, Monday said. Gentles were. Yep. Monday went down on his haunches and flipped the album open, taking out the loose leaves and handing the cover back up to Clem. He wrote a message in it, Monday said. While Clem read the few words Gentle had scribbled on the cover, Monday began to arrange the sheets side by side on the floor, carefully aligning them so that the maps became an unbroken flow. As he worked, he talked, his enthusiasm as unalloyed as ever. You know what he wants us to do, don't you? He wants us to draw this map on every fucking wall we can find. On the pavements, on our foreheads, anywhere and everywhere. That's quite a task, said Clem. I'm here to help you, Chicka Jackeen said, in whatever capacity I can. He got up from the fire and came to stand beside Clem, where he could admire the pattern that was emerging on the floor in front of them. 
That's not the only thing you've come to do, is it? Monday said. Be honest. Well, no, said Jackine. I'd also like to find myself a wife. But that will have to wait. Damn right, said Monday. This is our business now. He stood up and stepped out of the circle which the pages of Gentle's album had formed. Here was the Imagica, or rather the tiny part of it which the Reconciler had seen. Partashokwa and Vanayef, Beatrix and the mountains of the Jokalelau, Mai Kay, the Cradle, Limbi and the Quem, the Lenten Way, the Delta and Isorderex and then the crossroads outside the city and the desert beyond, with a single track leading to the borders of the Second Dominion. On the other side of that border the pages were practically empty. The wanderer had sketched the peninsula he'd sat on, but beyond it he'd simply written, This is a new world. And this, said Jackeen, stooping to indicate the cross at the end of the promontory, is where the maestro's pilgrimage ended. Is that where he's buried? Clem said. Oh, no, Jackine said. He's gone to places that'll make this life seem like a dream. He's left the circle, you see. No, I don't, said Clem. If he's left the circle, then where's he gone? Where have they all gone? Into it, Jackine said. Clem began to smile. May I? said Jackine, rising and claiming from Clem's fingers the sheet which carried Gentle's last message. My friends, he'd written. Pi is here. I am found. Will you show these pages to the world so that every wanderer may find their way home? I think our duty is plain, gentlemen. Jackine said. He stooped again to lay the final page in the middle of the circle, marking the place of spirits to which the reconciler had gone. And when we've done that duty, we have here the map that will show us where we must go. We'll follow him. There's nothing more certain. We'll all of us follow him by and by. End of Imagica by Clive Barker Narrated by Stephen Crossley in the studios of American Foundation for the Blind, Incorporated for the Library of Congress, June 1992, for special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, Harper Collins Publishers, 10 East 53rd Street, New York, New York, 10022. End of book.